Century of Conflict, 1821 to 1913. Incidents in the lives of William Neal and William Alfred Neal, early settlers in South Texas. Edited by John C. Rayburn and Virginia Camp Rayburn, with the assistance of Ethel Neal Fry. Published by the Texian Press in 1966, Waco, Texas. Dedicated to the descendants of William Neal, many of whom continue to live along the legendary Rio Grande. Audiobook narrated by Gilbert Hernandez, a.k.a. Professor Giggs. Narrator's Note This, my friends, is a labor of love. Very few people know who William Neal or William Alfred Neal are, let alone people who actually read their work, Century of Conflict. However, the type of people that would be interested in what they had to say, the stories that they wrote down to pass on to future generations, the people that would be interested, the people that would be in the market, the people who would like to learn about their perspectives, could potentially be a much larger scope than those who are in the know of who the Neals are. William Neal saw Brownsville rise from the ground as a civilization. William Alfred Neal, he saw it develop at, at the beginning of the 20th century. The stories and episodes that they wrote down, they capture the most important bits of action, adventure, romance, the occasional comedy, all these wonderful tales that happened right here in South Texas. It's almost as if uh, you were to ask your great-grandfather, tell me a story when you were my age. Tell me a story when you were 20 years old. It's almost as if William Neal and William Alfred Neal are directly speaking to you. It's a very conversational uh, style of writing. That being said, there are certain instances in the book, not very many, but they exist, where the Neals do refer to certain demographics of people in ways that would be terribly inappropriate in 2021. I will be reading Century of Conflict in its entirety without omitting or censoring any of these slurs or racist language. To censor them would be to take away from some of the historical context and to omit them would be to deny that their prejudices ever existed in the first place. The whole work must be read in order to appreciate early Brownsville history for its good as well as its evil and everything in between. <laughs> if Elijah Wood read the audiobook for Huckleberry Finn and not get canceled, I'm sure I could read Century of Conflict just fine. We're all mature adults here who appreciate history or want to appreciate history. The contents of Century of Conflict do not reflect the values or views of myself or the Professor Giggs channel, except that the Neils and I share this profound love for Brownsville history. I'm doing this to share my favorite book of Brownsville history to the world at no cost in a way that's accessible to anyone with an internet connection from anywhere in the world. This has been a fantastic labor of love. I enjoyed every bit of recording it. It's over six hours of content, but I want to say it was probably 12 hours of mistakes and re-recording and trying out different intonations. <laughs> it was fun. Oh, not to mention the other several hours of uh, putting in all the annotations. Yes, there will be annotations according to the different footnotes dispersed throughout the book. I must apologize. The only thing that is not included in this video, in this audiobook, are the maps. You'll read footnotes in this video that will ask you to refer to a certain map in order to get a full understanding of what is going on. The maps are included in the physical copy of the book, but they are extremely hard to make out. 
it would make more sense to have the full size copy of those maps. Because an ordinary reader of Century of Conflict cannot understand what is going on by looking at the maps, I have decided that it wouldn't make much sense to include them in this video. Uh, however, these maps are available elsewhere and uh, their names are included nevertheless so you could get a, an understanding for you to do further research on your own. On the subject of further research, hopefully by you listening to Century of Conflict, maybe it'll inspire you to perhaps buy historical Brownsville books, to have conversations with our community's oldest members, to visit the historical museums uh, in Brownsville, in Port Isabel, in, in Edinburgh. All of those have little bits and pieces of the beautiful roots of our, of our city's past. I could go on and on about Brownsville history, but here is my little gift to the internet. My little gift to those interested in Brownsville history or would like to become interested in Brownsville history. Enjoy Century of Conflict. Introduction. William Neal realized that a time would come when the narratives of the era through which he passed would be garbled and misinterpreted, if not completely forgotten. In an effort to preserve the record of these romantic and at times dangerous days, he had kept a diary but it was later destroyed in a bandit raid on his home known as the Baston Ranch, located at a small upriver village called Santa Maria, sometimes called Neilville. Once more, he set down the stories, revealing his own personality and his sparkling humor, but always reciting with accuracy and honesty the events and characterizations as he remembered them. Arriving in Mexico first in 1821, he remained in the New World for several years, then returned to his native England and married. Not long after this, he and his young wife journeyed through the United States, until by 1834 they had landed and settled in Matamoros. From that date until 1897, he lived alternately in Matamoros and in Brownsville. The geographical location of these two cities, at the border between Mexico and the United States, close to both the Gulf of Mexico and the mouth of the Rio Grande, was conducive to the precipitation of many exciting international episodes. Piracy, political intrigue, revolution, four wars, namely the Mexican War for Independence, the Texas War of Independence, the Mexican War from 1846 to 1848, and the U.S. Civil War, Personal tragedy, banditry, smuggling, pioneering, and cattle rustling were crowded into his field of view. William Alfred Neal, reared by his grandfather, absorbed much of the vast store of fabulous stories that his grandfather could relate. His father, William Peter Neal, was killed in the Cortina Affair of September 28, 1859, thus it became his lot to take up his pen to continue recounting of significant episodes as he encountered them. The younger man copied his grandfather's writings when the typewriter became available to him. Sometimes he copied verbatim. Often he included parenthetical notes or bits were tacked onto the ends to expand the stories as he had heard them told orally over and over again. Because of this, it is impossible to isolate the older man's work. His style seems to be indicated by a vigorous, detailed description, denoting a keen observation not always apparent in the later accounts that are positively the younger man's composition. Here then is the best of this legacy, where historians have covered the period adequately. The Neil version has been omitted. However, in almost every instance, a fresh vitality was apparent because of the actual presence at the event and the personal acquaintance with the major characters involved. Together, they knew every person of importance in the border area from 1834 to 1943. Accuracy of their detail cannot be overemphasized. Documentary evidence supports the honesty with which the writers clung to the facts. 
In some instances, they will say that they comment only on what they saw. If information was acquired from others, this fact is noted. There is no evidence of sarcasm or ostentation. There are statements such as, the one that two men were the worst gamblers this side of hell, leave the reader completely credulous. Of humor, there is plenty, but it is never at the expense of anyone. The old gentleman pictured going down the street with his beard full of burned cotton, vowing it was his entire cotton crop, is laughing with the reader. Both men spoke fluent border Spanish and were equally at home on both sides of the Rio Grande. They were truly a part of two cultures, and as a result, achieved a rapport that permitted the exchange of information that would have been impossible to obtain without this cosmopolitan background. Although William Neal is said to be the first settler to move across the river from Matamoros to Brownsville at the conclusion of the Mexican War in 1848, he continued to maintain a home in Matamoros for many years. The house which Neal built originally in Brownsville stood on 14th Street between East Washington and East Adams Streets. It was in continuous use by members of the Neal family until 1950, when it was presented as a gift to the Brownsville Art League and moved to its present location south of the United States Customs House, where it now serves as a home for the League. As a result of the work of the younger member of this team, the papers are in the form of typescript and are in the possession of Mrs. Ethel Neal Fry, a daughter of William Alfred Neal and great-granddaughter of William Neal. Mrs. Fry has spent most of her life in the Brownsville area. Because of her deep affection for the region and her appreciation for the efforts of her forebears to recapture its history, she, with her sister, Mrs. William Elsie Neal Krebs of Brownsville, and her brother, Mr. Frederick Neal of San Antonio, the surviving children of William A. Neal, decided in 1960 that these papers should be made available to other interested persons. In order that these accounts might be placed in historical perspective, the editors have written for each an introduction, and footnotes have been added where it was felt that explanations and documentation would help to clarify parts of the text. Footnotes were also used to correct obvious mistakes that were found in some of the episodes. Throughout, punctuation has been adjusted to give emphasis and clarity. Some sentences have been revised, and misspelled words have been corrected without comment. Always, when changes were necessary, an honest attempt has been made to retain the meaning and flavor of the original manuscript. Otherwise, the Neil men tell the stories in their own words. Because the original papers of the older Neil are not intact, their value is somewhat lessened. However, it is felt the work of the two is an undeniable contribution to the saga of an era. For general background reading, and in some instances aid in specific cases, the works of Chatfield and of Pierce should be mentioned. Lieutenant W.H. Chatfield, a young U.S. Army officer stationed at Fort Brown, published in 1893 The Twin Cities of the Border. This work was prepared when many of those who had lived through the most hectic days of border history were still alive. A Brief History of the Lower Rio Grande Valley by Frank Cushman Pierce was also found to be valuable. The editors have made two trips to Washington, D.C. on successive summers to check material in the National Archives and in the manuscript collection of the Library of Congress. The search was rewarding with the preponderance of material being found in the archives. Many federal agencies have been concerned in the events that transpired in Brownsville when it has been the locale for international involvements. Therefore, the files of the State Department, particularly the consular reports from Matamoros, those of the Justice Department, the War Department, especially the Adjutant General's Office, the Customs Records, and the files of the Treasury Department were examined. Libraries at the University of Texas, the Texas State Library Archives Division, and the court records in Brownsville and in Corpus Christi, Texas, were also investigated. Especially valuable were the files of the Ranchero newspaper from 1859 to 1870, which have recently been given La Retama Public Library in Corpus Christi by the estate of Mrs. Sarita Kennedy East, a granddaughter of Mifflin Kennedy.
Acknowledgements. In the preparation of this work, the editors have received assistance from many persons and organizations, known and unknown. To all of these, we acknowledge our indebtedness. Not all can be named individually, but among the many are the following. We would first like to express our appreciation to T.W. Celaya for his assistance at various stages of this project. Most publications would be impossible without the aid of many libraries and librarians. We are deeply indebted to many individuals in this category, especially the following. The staff at the National Archives in Washington, D.C., the Library of Congress, James Day of the Texas State Library Archives Division, Dr. Yarena Friend of the Barker History Center, University of Texas, Ned Morris of the Texas A&I Library, and the librarians at Texas Southmost College in Brownsville and La Retama Public Library in Corpus Christi, Texas. Appreciation is also expressed to the staff of the Still Picture Branch of the National Archives. We want to thank Dr. Edwin Bogush and George Willages of the Biology Department of Texas A&I College Kingsville for help in securing information regarding certain grasses of South Texas. We are grateful to Dan Kilgore of Corpus Christi, Texas, and Robert C. Wells, formerly of Kingsville, Texas, who generously loaned us valuable items from their personal collections. E.A. Rogers of Kingsville contributed his interest and his help in the reproduction of some of the illustrations and maps. Thanks are also due to Harold McGowan for his cooperation and consideration. A debt of gratitude is certainly owed to Mrs. Lula George and her staff in the district clerk's office in Brownsville and to the staff of the county clerk's office in Brownsville. Also to Jesse W. Sloss, city secretary of the city of Brownsville. The cooperation of the staff in the Nosis County Clerk's Office and the District Clerk's Office in Corpus Christi is appreciated. Especially do we thank Mrs. Edward Deswazen for aid in proofreading the entire work. Dr. F. M. Kirkaville and Dr. Peter Ortiz of the Modern Language Department at Texas A&I gave assistance in translating certain Spanish phrases and words. Also, a special debt is acknowledged to the Research Committee of Texas A&I College for financial aid for the reproduction of materials from the archives in Washington and in Austin. Last, but certainly not least, we are indebted to our daughter Nancy, who has tried to be patient, understanding, and uncomplaining throughout delayed schedules while this book has been in preparation. Signed, Virginia Kemp Rayburn and John C. Rayburn, Kingsville, Texas, 1966. Chapter 1. Younger Day's Struggle of a Soldier of Fortune, William Neal I was just a lad between 13 and 14 years of age when I ran away from home. I was unable to get along with my stepmother, who, probably because of her health, was unable to control her temper. Still, I will say, God bless her. For about three days, I wandered around the vicinity of my native city, Bexhill, Sussex. Not finding any employment, I made my way to Portsmouth, England, with the hope of locating a job as a cabin boy on some outgoing vessel. While on my way to the great naval station of the British Empire, I met another lad named Hugh Grant, who was going the same way. Hugh was of Scottish blood and full of grit, and on our way to the port, we became friendly and shared our resources and became steadfast friends. When we arrived at Portsmouth, we saw a man standing in full sailor uniform in front of a sailor's restaurant. We reached the eating junk and stopped to look in to see how the water laid. The man we had seen standing in front of the junk came up and addressed us and asked for whom we were looking. I told him that we were not looking for anyone in particular, but that we were looking for jobs, cabin boy preferred. He stated that we were too young to go on long trips, but invited us to go along with him to headquarters to see whether we could be enlisted. After a short walk, we arrived at the place designated, walked in, and waited for further developments. Our turn finally came, and the man who brought us in addressed the chief 
informing him of our desires. The chief looked at us lively, and after a little hesitation and conversation with the man who brought us, he came to the conclusion of taking us in. He told us to step up and be registered. When both of us stood in front of him, he asked my chum his name. When my turn came, I gave him my name, William Neal. No sooner had I told him my name than he asked me if I was related to William Neal, the chief naval baker at the naval station. I answered that the man was my father. To this he declared that he knew my father well and that they were good friends. We were then told that we would both have jobs from that day forward. He gave us each a sort of a ticket, which bore our names, and he told the man who had conducted us there to take us to the eating junk, and to see that we were given good bedding and sound grub. We loitered around Portsmouth for nearly a month, facing the requirements of reporting to the main office every morning, and of beginning to experience what a sailor's life was like. Finally, the morning came when we received the orders to get our grips ready and report to the office that very same evening. This news made us feel good. We were delighted because we were going to see the world. We reported ready for duty that evening and were taken to the wharf, where we met quite a large bunch of sailors who were being taken aboard a large three-masted sailing vessel. We saw our man among the crowd and asked him our destination. In reply, he put his finger to his mouth, shh, telling us that we were not allowed to make inquiries, for we were paid to obey orders. He assured us not to fear because he would take good care of us. This announcement surely made us happy. We got on board the vessel during late hours of the evening and were shown to our bunking quarters. After indulging in our first supper on board, we were told that we had better go to bed early because we had to get up early in the morning for duty. We did as we were told, but we were not yet asleep when we felt the vessel listing and on the move. When morning came, we awoke and went on deck. Our vessel was under full sail and lapping the sea as we sailed along. It was a grand sight, one that I will never forget. Both my chum and I were delighted with our luck. After finishing our job, the captain of the vessel, a man named Eddington, gave us orders to remain on deck only three hours while we were off duty, which command we obeyed strictly. We had been out at sea about eight or ten days when we heard the cry, Land Ahoy! We soon sailed into our port, which I found out was in the Azores Islands. Upon entering the port, I saw a large sailing vessel anchored in the bay flying the British flag. Our vessel anchored close to the one we had observed, and shortly a small boat, manned by British seamen, approached us. A man rigged in full uniform came aboard from it, shook hands with our captain in greeting, and the two went into the main cabin for a talk. Later, they emerged, smiling broadly. That very same night, we heard a great consternation on board. A lot of hammering accompanied by snoring carpenter saws. We finally went to sleep. On the following morning, we soon saw what all the fuss was about. We discovered that the vessel we were sailing was being fitted out for a man of war with an equipment of 64 guns together with the necessary ammunition. We even saw how our vessel had her portholes covered by painted canvas. During the daytime, all was as silent as silence could be procured. But when night came, all was a buzz with getting things ready. It took just exactly five days to change a peaceful-looking vessel into a full-dressed man-of-war. When all the guns and other equipment were in the proper places, the captain called us all aboard and made a speech upon the destiny of the ship, requesting all those who wished to go with the vessel to Mexico to step forward. Upon seeing our old friend who had secured us our job step forward, we took our places alongside of him and he smiled. All those who volunteered to go on the expedition remained in line, and the captain addressed them, giving them the details of what they might expect to encounter, 
and stating again that those who were lukewarm about going to fight for Mexico still had the privilege of retiring. No one retired. The captain began taking our names, and when he reached my chum and me, he asked us personally if we wished to return home. He reminded us that when the ship reached Mexico, she would have a great deal of fighting. We shook our heads, for we had made our minds to go with our old friend, who proved to be to us like a father. He was always giving us lessons in making sailors' knots and in hoisting sails. We were not cabin boys, but actually Mexican sailors. All those men who did not have the courage to enlist were returned to England on the same ship that brought the guns and ammunition. When everything was in proper shape, we hoisted anchor and sailed for the port of Veracruz. After we had been out at sea a couple of days, the captain appointed both of us to be what the sailors call powder flunkies, whose duties were to carry the powder bags to the gunners. We were some twenty-odd days out on the bounding billows, when we heard the lookout on the foremast yell, Land ahoy! We all shouted back the same answer. Within a couple of hours, we were about six miles from the port and saw a small sailboat coming towards us. The captain called us to quarters. When the sailboat reached us, a delegation of Mexican officers came on board to take charge of the vessel. We stood off for a couple of days before the captain ordered the anchor hoisted. We soon saw what this meant. Just as soon as we got to the proper distance, the captain gave order to commence firing. We poured shot after shot into both the city and into the famous old castle of San Juan de Ulua. The fight lasted a couple of days when the city hoisted the white flag in surrender. A few days later, the old castle of San Juan de Ulua hoisted the white flag and the war was brought to an end. When Hugh and I were going around the old castle, we met a second lieutenant by the name of Pedro de Ampudia, who first challenged us, but after satisfying himself that we were sailors on board the Mexican man of war Independencia, he gracefully accompanied us all around the old castle. It was this chance meeting that was to start the friendship, which in after years proved to be true friendship. Some twenty-odd years after, I again had the good luck of meeting Pedro de Ampudia in Matamoros, Mexico. Not with the grade of lieutenant, but of division commander. Upon meeting, we recognized each other and became steadfast friends until the very last. We became such intimate friends that he became the godfather when my son, William Pedro Neal, was baptized into the Roman Catholic faith. After serving in the Mexican Navy for a period of six months, we begged to be discharged from the service. With the aid of the British consul, this was easily accomplished. During the few months that we remained in Veracruz, we were often in company with Lieutenant Ampudia. Both Hugh and I got good jobs at the English Real del Monte Mining Company, where we spent three years. We quit with the full intention of going home to England. We had in our pockets quite a large sum of money, and we took stage lines going over land in order to reach New Orleans. But somehow or other, after a tedious drive, we reached Matamoros, Mexico, and concluded to stop a few days in order to get a rest. This was in 1826. I finally made my mind to go and see the old folks at home. And I started on my journey for New Orleans, leaving my friend, Hugh Grant, in Matamoros. It happened that upon reaching New Orleans that a sailing vessel was ready to sail for England. I got on board and was soon on my way home. I was just 18 years old when I returned to England, but I found that my mother had departed this life, and my father had married again. I left home once more, never to return. At the age of 20, I married Una Rutland, a native of Kent. After we were married, we went to London, where I went to a place called by the natives Longacre. There, I learned the trade of painter. We next went to Pottsville, Pennsylvania, and soon 
tired of the place. My wife urged me to come to Mexico because she claimed that I was well acquainted with the natives. I left Pottsville, and on my way, a boy was born to us while we were in Louisville, Kentucky. I went to New Orleans and got a steak and went back to Louisville, Kentucky. There, I got my wife, and we made our way to Mexico. After a hard trip, we landed at the Boca del Rio on May 2nd, 1834. Upon arriving in Matamoros, I both painted and put on a stage line between the city and Boca del Rio. Chapter 2 History of Doña Loreta Lojero Introduction The Mier Expedition, in 1842, was one of the least successful filibustering efforts by Texans against Mexico. As a result of Mexico's attempts to reconquer Texas in 1842, several hundred frontiersmen marched on Laredo in the late fall of that year, capturing the town without difficulty. After a short time, almost half of the men returned home, but the remainder, dissatisfied with the amount of plunder obtained to that point, fell under the influence of some aggressive leaders who led the rabble down the Rio Grande where they captured the small village of Mier on December 23rd. The Texans were later defeated, however, by General Pedro Ampudia in a battle that lasted from December 25th into the afternoon of the next day. The men were marched down the river to Matamoros to wait orders from Mexico City. After some delay, they started for the capital, and when they reached Salado, Ewan Cameron led a break for freedom. They became scattered, then lost, and as a result, 176 were recaptured. Santa Ana, the head of the Mexican nation, ordered all those retaken shot, but later he reduced the number to be executed to 10%. To determine those to be shot, 176 beans, including 17 black ones, were put in a container, and the men who drew these 17 black beans were executed. Despite the fact that the story of the Mier expedition is well known, there is no mention of Doña Loreta Lojero and her role as a benefactor of the captured Texans in the usual accounts. This incident is included because the elder Mr. Neal lived in Matamoros during these years and was an eyewitness to these events. Therefore, his account of the treatment of the Texans while detained in that city, and of Doña Loreto Lojero, has special interest and is believed to be worth mentioning. Between the years 1836 and 1845, there were several bands of filibustering and minor gangsters known as cowboys who invaded Mexico for the sole purpose of getting rich quick. While conditions were in such a state, a young Scotchman by the name of Ewan Cameron became infatuated with the idea of forming a new nation between the Nueces River and the Panuco River in Mexico from the land that was donated by the King of Spain to Don José Escandón. He claimed that since Texas had taken possession of one part, that the part still remaining in Mexico should not be separated from the other. He really intended to form another republic like Texas. With this idea in his head, he commenced to gather men of his own caliber to undertake the expedition. The young Scotchman went from pillar to post to enlist men to undertake the job. Finally, he gathered some 250 men who joined him in the enterprise. The ball commenced to roll. Between getting arms, ammunition, and clothing, together with the necessary provisions and other articles, a great deal of time passed. On the last days of December 1842, Cameron crossed the Rio Grande at Salineo Crossing, and after a brush with the customs officials and a few soldiers stationed there, he captured the city of Mier. When General Pedro de Ampudia was in command of the 4th Military Division, with headquarters in the city of Matamoros, Tamaulipas, news reached him that there were a lot of Americans around the Salineño Ranch opposite the vicinity of Mier. At the first reception of the news, General Ampudia paid very little attention to what he had heard. One day, however, while General Ampudia was promenading around the military plaza, 
which is situated just one block from his residence, in conversation with some of his citizen friends, one of his trusted subordinate officers approached him and handed him a letter. This letter contained the news that a large number of Americans had taken Mir, and furthermore, that they were trying to bolster their forces by making all sorts of inducements. General Ampudia immediately excused himself from his friends, and in less than an hour was on his way to the scene of trouble. After traveling four days through mud and slush, General Ampudia arrived with his troops at Mir. A very short fight ended with General Ampudia's capture of the entire American filibustering expedition. All were brought to the city of Matamoros, Mexico, and put in a military jail that was situated opposite his headquarters on the same grounds where the opera house is now built. While the prisoners were being held closely guarded, General Ampudia would allow only Americans to visit their countrymen, and then only under the supervision of an officer. The officers of the Mexican army often repeated that the American boys were a nice set of fellows and that they were always in good spirits and joyful, taking things cool as if nothing was pending against them. Even the Mexican officers seemed to like Captain Cameron, on account of his frankness in explaining the object of his expedition. While the Americans were in jail and awaiting orders from Mexico City, Mr. William Neal, the writer's grandfather, visited the men and found them with no funds, even for tobacco. Finding the destitute condition that these poor men were in, he asked General Ampudia's permission to donate a few pesos to the men who were born in Kentucky, where his, Ampudia's godson, was born. General Ampudia granted Mr. Neal his request. Mr. Neal, accompanied by Captain Ruellas, visited the men in jail, and upon entering, he called out for the men that were born in Kentucky to step to the front. At first, the crowd became shaky and hesitated, but all at a sudden, upon seeing Captain Cameron come forward, stating that he was not born in Kentucky, but that he would take his medicine, all of the men stepped to the front. Mr. Neal furnished them all with the limit allowed, one peso each, for which he received their thanks with cheers. At last, the order came to convey the prisoners to the city of Mexico for trial. The good people of the city became overcome with fear that while the prisoners were being conveyed, that the military would apply la ley fuga, fugitive law, and kill them all, claiming that they attempted to escape. It was during this state of affairs that an Indian girl named Doña Loreta Lojero came forward and barefooted, trod the city of Matamoros from door to door, soliciting money for the purpose of hiring a lawyer to defend the Americans. Day after day, she pleaded with the envoy that brought the order, but there was no heed in recompense for her tears. Exerting all her power, the little Indian girl raised $5,000. Let me stop and tell the reader of this remembrance that every time that the late Mr. William Neal related this sad scene, tears would flow from his eyes when referring to the hardship that Doña Loreta went through in pleading justice in behalf of the Americans. Never did Doña Loreta give up hope of having the Americans released. When they were ordered to Mexico, Doña Loreta went along with them, and when she reached Mexico City, she went around begging for money in order to hire legal talent to defend the Americans. She even sold her jewelry. Doña Loreta was of Indian extraction and stood in height about 5 feet 4 inches and weighed about 120 pounds. She was of robust structure. She had jet black eyes and her hair reaching below her waist which she generally combed into two plates held on top of her head with a high-back comb ornamented with fancy figures. Her face was what the natives classified as a perlada, almost white. What made her so attractive was her figure and her large jet black eyes. Her mother was a full tamaulipeca, and her father was a Spaniard. Two sources, one being my grandfather, William Neal, and the other being a Mexican gentleman who died in 1880 in Matamoros, 
Pedro Grimas, both knew Doña Loreta and stated that Doña Loreta was a beautiful girl who attracted a great deal of attention while living in Matamoros and that she had many admirers, among the many being an Englishman who wanted to marry her, but that she refused to entertain his idea. Even General Pedro Ampudia, it is said, tried his luck, but failed. Ampudia never married, and it is stated that it was all due to the refusal of Doña Loreta to say, I do. Chapter 3, Palomo the Indian. Introduction. During the Spanish colonial period, the Indians living on both sides of the lower Rio Grande were called Coahuiltecan for the Mexican state of Coahuila. It has been estimated that there were over 200 separate bands of these natives, using different names, but belonging to the same linguistic stock. They were inland tribes, occupying a vast semi-arid region bordered on the north by the Guadalupe and San Antonio rivers, and extending beyond the Rio Grande to the southern limits of the modern Mexican states of Tamaulipas, Nuevo León, and Coahuila. Of all the Indians in Texas, the Coahuiltecans had the fewest usable natural resources, and consequently lived the harshest, most difficult life. In the 1840s, there were small isolated bands of Coahuiltecan Indians scattered along the river. But in addition, the early white settlers encountered representatives of other tribes, principally the Lipan Apaches. Originally ranging over much of western Texas, the majority of the Lipans had been driven east and south during the early 18th century by their enemies, the Comanches. As a result of warfare and contact with the white Europeans, the Lipans found along the lower Rio Grande had declined rapidly, and by the middle of the 19th century, they were no longer the fierce, aggressive, mobile warriors of earlier days. This selection on the Indians of South Texas is significant because it contains some personal observations on the life, customs, and habits of these people as witnessed by the senior Mr. Neal, one of the first settlers not of Spanish background north of the Rio Grande. As there has been a good deal written about the Indians and also the Indian wars of the past, and as I differ a little as to the expressed opinions, I will relate all I know about the several Indian tribes that once roamed over the prairies of South and West Texas. The Indian tribes that once inhabited what is now known as Southwest Texas were composed, in most cases, of small communities of a lot of measly half-breed Indians who lived mostly by stealing. Towards the last of their existence, they made war against each other, and in doing so, brought on a final disbandment amongst them. What really brought on their collapse after they had been murdering each other was the tide of civilization, which eventually crowded them to other areas more suitable for their mode of living. The Lipan Indians had their villages and hunting grounds on what is now known as the northwest part of Star County, a few miles from what is now known as the Zapata County Line. Those in Zapata County were the Carrizal Indians, who were very warlike braves, but were not so numerous as the Lipans. The Zacatal Indians lived or inhabited what is still known as the Zacatal Ranch, which afterwards became the property of Judge Edward Doherty. I will now proceed with my narrative regarding the Indians as they were when I first came over to what is now known as the Texas Lower Rio Grande by relating what I actually saw. The manner and methods by which the Indians lived and obtained a living are quite interesting, as well as serving a lesson to those that are in hope of seeing them embrace the right way and become good Christians. The Indians' disposition and ways are crowned beyond a doubt by cunning in providing the necessities. The Indian, speaking in general, under no circumstances worried about work that was wanted at the fireside of his home or about giving a helping hand to supplying wood or any other necessity to run the house. He divided the year into two equal parts, summer and winter. During the winter months, he passed his time in resting, or else in deep meditation on what the chances were to steal in order to get money. Never for one moment did he make a move to help his squaw even to sweep around his wigwam. He hated to break the 11th commandment, 
Thou shalt not work. That is, around the house. His squaw had to cook, wash, mend all the clothes, cut and chop the wood, and supply his lordship with mezcal. This was a liquor made and distilled from the palm tree, mixed with a liquor called by the Mexican Indians leche quilla, which was nothing but a low grade of opium that naturally produced sleep and came in handy. During the summer months, after having delineated the plans he had fostered in his mind during the winter months, he stepped out to accomplish what he had in sight. While in his transit through the summer, he began to work to supply his home by furnishing them with dried beef, coffee, and salt. He knew that Mr. So-and-so had a good lot of fat cattle grazing on the prairie, near where his settlement was. So he got to work and killed a cow or steer and brought the meat home, where it was cut into slices of about an inch thick and left to dry in the wigwam. When it became partly dry and had been salted, it was laid in layers on the hide. After being well salted, the hide was smeared with salted tallow, and a bale was made which was airtight, to be opened at the beginning of the following winter. I didn't want to be caught near the place when they opened the bale. Why, it was something horrible to smell. It was strong enough to knock a mule down a mile off. The old hide from the previous packing was then offered for sale. With the money acquired, and what he got from a few bushels of corn on a patch of land, he bought sugar, together with the necessary salt, to fill his wants, until the next year brought him to the front again. The tobacco that all the Indians of this district used was all cultivated by them. The tobacco grew here all right, but the only thing against it was that it went empty during the curing of it. But the old Indians raised it and cured it in light ovens made mostly out of dirt called cocederos. I tried to smoke their tobacco once in my pipe, but it almost knocked me down when I gave it the first whiff, so I never tried it again. Another thing that I wish to tell you is the manner that these Indians used to prepare for battle or for going on a general thieving raid. I had the pleasure of witnessing the preparation of the Palomal Indians, who were settled on the north side of the river a few miles above its mouth. The brave first stripped himself of all his wearing apparel. After this, his squaw painted his naked body with a sort of paint made from the pear of the prickly pear bush, and a sort of clay which, when dry, was very hard to get off. She painted all over his body with all kinds of zigzag figures. Then he put on a front cover, called by the Indians Topolco. The Mexicans now call the same mantle Tapalo. The next thing that his squaw did was to adjust a hawk's feather which she fixed in a sort of sling, then fastened it around his head to the forehead, where it was tied in such a manner that it would not slide. Next, his horse was groomed by his squaw, so it was fit for a king to ride. Then there was one more thing to be done. When everything was ready and her brave was on his horse, the last thing the squaw did was to grease his forearms with a very light tallow grease mixed with oil. Then came the yell, and all were off for the spoils. One thing that attracted my attention was the way they handled their horses. They used one rein with a nose muzzle. I watched them closely and could see that the horse obeyed the rider's body. When he inclined his body to the right, the horse went to the right. The same was true with the left movement. I noticed something amongst the Palomal Indians that I never saw amongst the other tribes, and it was this that previous to mounting their horses, the braves all got into bunches and commenced to whisper in a sort of murmuring way which was very pleasing to the ear. They went around the chief's wigwam twice, in their final wind-up when all of a sudden, they all with one yell and a whoop mounted their ponies and off they went. The Campaqua Indians lived on a small tract of land known as the Campaquas that is situated on the land of the late Don Florencio Sainz called... Luca Ranch. The Campaqua Indians were a decent class of people, most of them being well educated, having got their schooling in Matamoros, Mexico. With the exception of about 200 of them who lived on the Mexican side of the Rio Grande, all were residents of the state of Texas. But as time rolled by, through sickness and other causes, many died. 
Now that I have written about the Indians that once roamed the prairies in this section of the state of Texas, I will continue by relating the experience I had amongst the Lipans under the leadership of the famous Palomo Blanco. On my ranch, called Buena Vista, now known as Santa Maria, I kept a general store, where I sold groceries and dry goods, including hats and shoes. Amongst my many customers, I had a good many Indians who were quite fair in their dealings. Amongst my Indian customers was the famous Palomo Blanco, who was then chief of the Lipan Indians. It was the custom of old Palomo to come every three months and buy the necessary provisions and such other articles in the dry goods department that his wives wanted. His purchases were profitable to me. One thing I will say about the chief is that I never saw in my life such black, piercing eyes to compare with his. Why, I really think they would make an eagle ashamed of himself. Naturally, to a good customer like old Palomo, I would furnish the whole gang with board and lodging, and would often invite him to participate in having dinner with us. Amongst his wives, he had a sort of stumpty woman who was gifted with a good lot of gab, and I noticed that the chief paid more attention to her than to the rest of his women. To me, she appeared to have some white man's blood flowing through her veins, because she had a fair reddish color on her face that was very pleasing to the eye. Her name was Lala. On one occasion, while they were having dinner with us, I happened to sit between Palomo and Lala. While chatting and having a good talk at the table, I managed to ask him how he got such a beautiful girl for a wife. He gave a sort of a grunt and said that the great spirits willed it so. And so it was done. During one of their stays, I managed to engage in conversation little Lala. And upon my asking her who her father was, she candidly replied that she personally did not know, but that some of the older squaws of the tribe had informed her that her father was a German and her mother was a Lipan Indian, both of whom were now dead. She said that one of Paloma's wives had raised her, and when she had reached the age of womanhood, she became the wife of her chief, who she knew loved her very much. I could say one thing. And that is that old Palomo was surely a good customer of mine. Whenever he told me that he would pay me the balance due me in so many moons, he was on the spot at the time indicated. On one of my trips up the Rio Grande in search of some mules that were stolen from me, I had got as far as Roma, Texas, where I stopped to make an inquiry. While at Roma, I was advised by one of the natives to go to the Salineño Ranch, which is a short distance from Roma and perhaps would find amongst the many horse and cattle thieves that frequented the place, one who might give me a clue of the whereabouts of my missing mules. I took the advice, and in less than an hour's time, I was quietly sitting in front of my Salineño ranch boarding house, taking things as they came and easy. That very same evening, while chatting in the yard of the hotel, we got into the subject of Indian warfare, and to my great astonishment, one of the boarders, mentioned the name of an old Indian chief, El Palomo, who had an Americana as a wife. This naturally touched my heart. After he had related to me what his father had told him about Palomo, I asked him what became of Palomo. He informed me that he was killed in a combat with the Mexican troops near Presidio del Norte. During one of the times that there was wild excitement all along the river ranches as far as Reynosa, Mexico, the Indians were going to make raids on other ranches that were situated on the Texas side of the Rio Grande. It came to light that a war talk had taken place between the Sacatal and Campacua Indians, and that a battle was pending between them. After a month had passed and the war talk was still in its full rage, people began to get tired of hearing so much talk and no battle. Some of the older heads called upon the antagonistic tribes to see whether they could settle their differences in some sort of a peaceful way. These kind offers were rejected, for both chiefs were going to fight it out to the last ditch. Both claimed that some of their ponies were stolen, some of their girls were enticed from them, and that nothing but blood could satisfy such an act. While this wind war was going along, I was always on the alert, especially of a night. I had loaded a couple of muskets and placed them within reach, and stood guard watching for an enemy 
to appear. On one of these nights, while on duty, I saw something that looked as if there was someone coming towards the front gate. So I got ready, when all at a sudden, a voice said, Father, don't shoot, it's me! You can imagine how I felt. It was my own son. If I remember correctly, it was during the latter part of the year 1846 that the last Indian raid took place in what is now called the southern section of Cameron County. On the tract of land situated in Cameron County known as La Feria, there is an old landmark known as El Colimal Ranch. The name of La Feria is derived from the fairs that were accustomed to be held at the Colimal Ranch. From what I was told by some of the old Mexican settlers, these fairs were held during the month of September, and everybody attended. Indians as well as Mexicans attended and participated in all the games, trading of horses, and selling of hides and horsehair, orongos, and other such trinkets which the Indian squaws made, including specially beaded moccasins. All had a good time while the fair lasted. During one of these festivities, a good many of the chiefs of the several tribes, together with their harems and their bodyguards, attended the fair, and seemed to appreciate the attention paid to them, and in fact, all enjoyed themselves to the very limit. As the old adage says, there is always a calm before a storm. But it seems to me that in this instance, that the storm came first, and the calm afterwards. Among the most noted chiefs that attended were Palomo Blanco, chief of the Lipans, Guillermo Cano, chief of the Campacuas, Zamora, chief of the Carizal, and Juan Oso, who was a sort of chief, although none of his tribe respected him. Among the women that attended to the household of Palomo Blanco were two young squaws who were very pleasing to the eye. It so happened that one of the Campacua Indian boys became infatuated with one of these girls, and after a great deal of love-making and promises, he persuaded the girl to fly the coop with him. She accepted his offer, and away they went. Horse, girl, and all were not missed until the day that old Paloma Blanco was to leave. Naturally, things right there began to stir. Nobody could give the whereabouts of the missing girl. Old Palomo and his attendants all started upriver towards their homes. While on the road, the other Indian girl during the night beat it and naturally started down the river and did not stop until she reached the Campacua settlement where she met her companion. It did not take her long to hitch up with one of the younger chaps who belonged to the Palomal tribe who settled in the vicinity of what is now known as the Ranchito. Both girls were happy, but Palomo Blanco was not. Somehow or other, old Palomo found out where the girls were, and he all at once summoned his head men, and after a consultation, all waited for the first full moon. At last, the hour came, and old Palomo started out with all his men in full spirits. The first enemy that he met were the Sacatal Indians, who immediately joined the Lipans. They then started towards the Campacua camps, but when they arrived, they found the camp deserted. Old Cano was the old lizard, El Lagartijo, as he was nicknamed by his tribe. He landed himself together with his Indian followers on the opposite bank of the Rio Grande, where he placed himself under the protection of a small detachment of Mexican troops that were stationed at a ranch now called El Soriseño, then El Ebano. Old Palomo, upon seeing that he was outwitted by his old chum, did not stop right there, but kept on until he got to the Ranchito Indian settlement, where he met with little opposition. After shooting and yelling for about a couple of hours, the battle was over, resulting in a loss of about 30 braves on both sides. Old Palomo cleaned the place out. He even took the dogs that the Ranchito people had, and finally put on the finishing touch by carrying away some of the young girls captive. On his way back, he sent word to old Cano that he would someday get even with him, but that day never came. This is about the only raid of importance that took place in this section. There were a lot of squabbles amongst the miners' tribes that infested both sides of the Rio Grande, which generally originated by someone stealing a squaw or a horse from the other, and which would end in a dispute, a good mezcal drunk, a few cuts, 
and a good lot of yelling and curses and promises of further vengeance. The Indian tribes that were spread all along both sides of the Rio Grande, especially in what is now called Southern Texas, were all very small tribes. The following are some of the tribes that I have reference to. The Comanches, Lipans, Campaquas, Palomales, Zacatales, Ranchitos, Esquitales, Arroyos, Las Tazas, and Carrizales. All with the exception of the Lipan and Comanches were small tribes, some of them consisting of about 50 souls. The Lipan and Comanches were quite large tribes. I think that I should safely put their figures at about 900 each. These last two named tribes occupied the lands in what is now known as Zapata and the upper end of Star County. Of the last two mentioned, the Lipan were of a better class of Indians. I make this expression because the Lipan, being close to the border where quite large towns were situated on the river, such as Camargo, Mier, and Guerrero, came in contact with civilized people, which naturally must have placed the mantle of peace over their savage feelings, while the Comanches, who were composed of renegades, cutthroats, and vagabonds, naturally were nothing but a lot of bloodthirsty fiends. Chapter 4, Point Isabel Introduction Now known as Port Isabel, this city was originally called El Fronton, or El Fronton de Santa Isabel, and was located about three miles from the present Port Isabel Lighthouse. Prosperous citizens from south of the Rio Grande knew of this location and frequently visited it as a summer resort as early as the late 1700s. Port Isabel is located on a point of land overlooking the Laguna Madre, the shallow body of water that separates the South Texas Gulf Coast from Padre Island. This island is a thin, finger-like, sandy strip of land that extends from Corpus Christi south approximately 110 miles. Just east of Port Isabel, Padre Island ends. And about three miles south, Brazos Island, shorter in length, reaches toward the mouth of the river. A pass or channel separates the two islands, and at the same time serves as an entry from the open gulf into the Laguna Madre. Over the years, shifting sands and silt have changed the depth of the water in the pass, with the result that by the 1850s, it was impossible for ships drawing more than eight feet of water to enter the pass, cross the Laguna Madre, and reach the mainland. It was during the Mexican War from 1846 to 1848 that El Fronton came to be called Point Isabel. The village was used by General Taylor as a base of operations and port of entry for supplies, and people spoke of the location as The Point. It was described in 1853 by W. H. Emery as follows. Three miles within the lagoon or bay, and standing upon the first firm ground, a bluff of alluvial soil about six or ten feet high, is Point Isabel. Here is the custom house, where the goods intended for the river, as high as Roma, are entered, the principal buildings being those erected by the Army of Occupation in 1846. When gold was discovered in California, many 49ers came down the east coast of the United States by water and started their western overland trip from this spot, traveling across North Mexico to the west coast. The United States Civil War period witnessed another high spot in the history of the Brazos Island Point Isabel region. Because of its strategic position in relation to the mouth of the Rio Grande and the international boundary, both the Confederate and Union forces exerted considerable energy at various times in securing and holding the port. The elder Mr. Neal went to El Fronton in the early 1840s for the purpose of establishing a stage line to Matamoros. From that time until his death in 1897, he maintained an active interest in the area, and the following selection reflects some of his observations on the place, its people, and its early history. To commence writing up a history of Point Isabel, the writer, as well as the reader, must be well versed with the tales of the Arabian Nights entertainments, especially to that part which refers to the exploits of the celebrated caliph, Harun al-Rashid, to enable him to gather the enchantments in the story of the celebrated port. In the beginning of the 1840s, when I was paying the fronton a good many visits in connection with my stage lines, 
I would very often visit some of the old fishermen that frequented the place for the purpose of chatting and killing time. And at the same time, I was trying to get all the information about the place. Amongst one of the oldest settlers there was one who claimed that his grandfather was the first one that settled on the locality where the old fronton now is situated. This news got me quite interested in him. So I commenced to pump him in order to drag out of him all that he really knew. He commenced his story by relating what his grandfather had told him, that once upon a time, a great pirate by the name of Don Juan Lafitte would come to the fronton on visits to unload his ships on Padre Island and then go among the sand hills and there bury big boxes containing money. Then he would take a trip to El Refugio, or Matamoros. In a few days, he would return to his ships, and after loading them with a lot of provisions, he would sail away, and perhaps would not return for at least a couple of years. I asked him whether he ever got any money that the great pirate buried among the sand hills. He said, the great pirate must have had some sort of magic blessing on it, because it all disappeared. He claimed that he himself, with another companion, had searched all over that part of Padre Island where it was thought that Lafitte buried the money, but he had never been successful in finding anything, much less money. The old man then commenced to relate that his ancestors had said that they often saw a bright light as if floating around the sand hills and that all of a sudden it would go out and then a blue light would appear and go around the sand hills in just the same routine that the bright light took. That it would then disappear, and that all at a sudden, a white horse would appear. And he would also go around the sand hills, and then he would stand still, looking towards the fronton, nay, three times, kick up a lot of sand, and disappear. Naturally, I listened to his story. And after he had finished his fairy tale, I asked him whether he had ever seen any of the lights and horse. He said he had not, but that his grandfather said that he saw them several times. I left him together with his story, and went to bed and had a good sleep. The next evening, I went to call on another old chap, where I had supper with him and his family, after which we took a couple of chairs and commenced to chat. During the conversation, I brought up the subject of the great pirate and asked him whether he ever heard of him. To my great astonishment, he repeated the same story that I had heard the night previous from the oldest man in the fronton. Word after word, he related the story. I presume that the whole community must have rehearsed the story so that they all agreed. Even a good many years afterwards, when I talked to an old woman who had been at the point for a long time, I happened to refer to Jean Lafitte, and to my astonishment, she repeated the same story without any variations whatsoever. What surprised me was that the same tale was repeated at the Boca del Rio. This very same story has even crept its way among the American folks that lived at the point, but they somehow leave the white horse out when relating the exploits of Lafitte. You can sit amongst the gang that frequent the fish houses at the point, and all you can hear during their conversation is something of a mysterious nature. In other words, some fairy tale is introduced during their confab. But with all their ignorance, they were very interested whenever the subject of Don Juan Lafitte was being told. It was grand. It was very delightful and pleasant of an evening to sit down, facing the cool, fresh south wind, and here's some of the old stock relate some of their cuentos, or stories, which in all cases wind up by resuscitating the memory of the old pirate, Jean Lafitte. As I heretofore stated, I paid a visit to Point Isabel, or in other words, the Mexican Gulf Coast, in the early 40s for the purpose of selecting a suitable spot to build my stables and a small hotel in connection with my stage lines that I was compelled to put on between Matamoros and the Fronton, or Point Isabel. I was compelled to establish this stage route for the following reasons. First, that my Boca del Rio stage business was getting on the rocky side of my prosperity. And secondly, 
because I had received a letter from headquarters of the steamship company, Vanderbilt Line, that they contemplated discontinuing their line of vessels to the Boca del Rio, or Baghdad, because there was too much delay in clearing their vessels, especially during the winter and spring months, giving as further reasons that the lightering facilities were inadequate, jeopardizing the life of the passengers, and that there was too much expense attached to the enterprise. I naturally got busy. After a few letters had passed between your humble servant, William Neal, and the steamship company, I finally got the keystone letter from the company, stating, or rather hinting, that if the Mexican government would make a port of entry at the Venadito Island, or Brazo Santiago, where undoubtedly there are better facilities, that they would give the pending matter further consideration. I took the hint and started to work. I called upon the collector of customs of Matamoros, Mexico, and laid my case before him, and explained to him what a loss it would be to him if the ships were pulled off. He immediately put himself in communication with the higher-ups in Mexico City, and to my great astonishment, all that we asked for was duly granted, and what is more, with no graft attached to it. On my first visit to the fronton, I spent about three days in roving about the place, hunting, as I have heretofore stated, for a convenient place to build my stables, etc. I at last bought a place that suited me very much, and I anchored myself there for a good many years. That spot is where Mr. H. E. Woodhouse's wharf is situated. I sold the property to Mr. H. E. Woodhouse a good many years afterward. When I saw El Fronton for the first time, I think that it was in March of either 1842 or 1843. There were hardly any human beings on the place. With the exception of a few dilapidated straw huts that were strewn along the bay shore, there was nothing else that would attract your attention. It was nothing but a lifeless, sleeping village whose inhabitants earned a living by either fishing or gathering salt among the numerous salt flats that are situated along the Laguna Madre shore. Salt seemed to be the chief industry that the natives indulged in, because it found a ready market. The inhabitants of the place were a lot of easygoing people who did not care a shock whether the sun arose or not. During one of my first visits to La Burrita Ranch in search of salt, it happened that one of the natives of the ranch, on being questioned by me as to where he got the salt, claimed that he got it at the fronton. I asked him then who was the owner of the fronton so that I could get some of the salt that I needed. He told me that I would have to write to a padre who lived at Soto de la Marina, and that the usual price that he asked for the salt was dos tlacos la burrada. That meant four cents, for as much as a jackass will carry. Well do I remember the first day when I reached the point. I called upon several inmates of the village, trying to get some of the information that I required. But to save my soul, I could not convey to the natives what I wanted. All they seemed to know was about fish and salt. The rest of the world seemed to be in complete darkness to them. All their answers to my questions were, Quien sabe, lo quiero, and muchas gracias. What made Old Point Isabel, and what resuscitated it from a drowsy village, was the arrival in 1846 of the U.S. Army of Occupation under the command of General Zach Taylor, who reached the point for the purpose of waiting for shiploads of reinforcements and supplies. It was during this interim that the old point became known to the outside world. A host of camp followers came like a cloud of locusts looking for a fresh field to land on. They came in by the hundreds every day to the extent that it was a hard job to obtain board and lodging at any price. This influx of people made the old Point Isabel, the fronton, a lively place. The fronton, afterwards renamed Point Isabel, now called Old Point Isabel, is situated about three miles from the Point Isabel Lighthouse. When General Zach Taylor reached the main crossing at the Arroyo Colorado, he sent a few men to the point, and with the main army of occupation, proceeded to the Rio Grande, where he pitched camp right opposite Matamoros and commenced to build a fort, which was afterwards named Fort Brown, for Major Jacob Brown, its able commander who was killed. General Taylor remained a short time 
around what is now known as Brownsville. And as he was running short of provisions, he placed Major Jacob Brown with the 7th U.S. Infantry in command. And then he proceeded with the rest of his army to Point Isabel. Most of General Taylor's army was camped about halfway between the lighthouse and Old Point Isabel, about 100 yards from where I had my stables, and was scattered along the front of the Laguna Bay towards the point. A line of breastworks was erected near the old Catholic church, where most of the heavy artillery was parked. Right back of the town of Old Point Isabel, several forts, called redoubts, were erected. And on the hill where the lighthouse was later built, a small fort was erected, which served more for a lookout than for a defense position. The wagon trains, which were very plentiful, were all put in barricade position for miles around both the old and new Point Isabel. In fact, I really believe that he had a little too much in that line of ordnance. While the U.S. Army of Occupation was still at Point Isabel, you could see many seagoing vessels anchored in the roadstead in front of Brazo Santiago. Vessels at the time could come right in without any trouble or fear of being wrecked on the bar. At the time that I have referenced to in 1846, there were at least three miles between Padre Island and Brazo de Santiago, that is, at the mouth of the Laguna Madre. I have seen fully ten large ships swing at anchor in the bay. I will endeavor to tell the cause of the decline of Old Point Isabel. The first blow came when the Army of Occupation marched out from Point Isabel on the morning of May 8, 1846. As the U.S. Army marched out, they were soon replaced by a string of camp followers, consisting of soldiers of fortune, hunting a spot to squat in under squatters' rights, and a lot of tin horn gamblers. A few of those that remained at the point, after a few months of waiting, were compelled to leave for their homes. Among those that remained at the point, some were from the best families of both Corpus Christi, Texas, and New Orleans, Louisiana. Those that followed the U.S. Army through into Mexico shared better luck than those that went only as far as Matamoros, Mexico. For example, those that went with the Army as far as Buena Vista made money while on the way, so that when the U.S. Army came out of Mexico, they had something. But those that remained in Matamoros, waiting for opportunities, made nothing. When the U.S. Army came out of Mexico, a good many of the soldiers who had left their wives and children at Point Isabel joined their families and remained at the point, until death called them as her own. Brownsville, at the time I am writing about, did not exist. It was only a sort of stopping place where one had to wait to be ferried over the river. When Brownsville, Texas began to be developed into a sort of a town, a good many of the old Point Isabel people came in and cast their lot amongst us. That is the reason why a good many of our old settlers were born in Point Isabel. The first storm or hurricane that struck Point Isabel and the whole frontier of Mexico as far as Eagle Pass, Texas, was on October the 4th, 1844. It did not hurt Point Isabel because there was nothing to be hurt, as the people that inhabited the place at the time lived in straw huts covered over with raw kettle hides and then recovered with sacahuiste grass. I suffered a little loss because it blew down my two houses that I had just rebuilt in connection with my stage line, but I very soon had them rebuilt. This hurricane was beyond a doubt the most severe one that had reached this section of the country, then Mexico. It blew down some of the best brick houses in Matamoros. We were visited by another storm the following year, but it did not last long and did but little damage. On October 7, 1867, Another storm paid us a visit, which devastated the whole coast of the Gulf of Mexico, from Pensacola, Florida, to Veracruz, Mexico. Poor Point Isabel was once more wrapped up in the mantle of destruction. The storm commenced just at the turning point of midnight, when the entire section of this part of Texas came within the vortex of the storm. Although we were in the storm but four hours and one half, you should have seen the wreckage that it brought to both Point Isabel and our sister city, Brownsville, Texas. It was simply a scrap of destruction. Yet with hardly a murmur, the citizens went to work, 
and repaired their losses and were soon on their feet again. The little town, once more, made its appearance before the civilized world. Yet there was one more blow that came almost unexpectedly that brought down the walls of her existence. The fourth and hardest blow that Point Isabel ever received was when the Rio Grande Railroad was built. A committee was appointed to select a starting point, and a Spanish gentleman, Don Simon Celaya, was elected chairman. The committee of five met at the office of Don José San Román. At the very first meeting, the majority of the committee was in favor of having the road commence at the old Point Isabel, claiming that by doing so, the road would only have to cross two resacas, although they would have to go five miles further, but that the saving in cost would be much less than the other proposed road that was being fostered by Don Simon Celaya and one of the other members of the committee, Don Francisco Armendariz. After a good deal of confab over the right-of-way and the proposed route, the committee at last agreed, in order to keep peace in the family, to leave it to the stockholders to decide the issue of the best of the two propositions which were in controversy amongst the committee. The stockholders all were in attendance at the stated meeting. When the question was brought before the stockholders, Don Simon Zelaya addressed the members and put on all the blue tint that he could in favor of his proposed route. And after he got through, Mr. H.E. Woodhouse came to the front and displayed before the stockholders the great benefit the road would accumulate in the course of years by coming from Old Point Isabel via the Old Indian Road to Brownsville, Texas. He had hardly finished giving details of the great advantages that the railroad company would derive from his proposed route, when Don Francisco Armendariz, without expressing any opinion at all, called for a vote. At the same time, he made it known to the stockholders that the way he was going to vote was the Simon Celaya proposed route. The ballot was gathered, resulting in the selection of the Celaya route. Undoubtedly, Don Francisco Armendariz's influence, through his declaration of the way he was going to vote, brought about the selection of the route. In other words, Don Francisco Armendariz, being a multimillionaire and a Spaniard, naturally brought the majority of the stockholders who were Spaniards on the side of Don Simon Celaya. The question was amicably decided. The building of the road from where it is now laid at Point Isabel cost the stockholders twice the amount that was at first estimated. Their kick came in too late to be rectified. But building the road from where it is now in operation naturally placed the once proud little town of Point Isabel away out of the range of the civilized world. In fact, it put it out of existence altogether. To make matters worse, the hurricane of August 1874 put the finishing touch that wiped out what remained of the little struggling town. Nothing remains now but a sorrowful recollection for the descendants of the primitive inhabitants who laid the foundation of that beautiful, delightful, and once prosperous villa by the sea. Soft are the breezes that wave in Laguna Bay, and sweet are the odors that breathe on the gale. Fair sparkles the wave when it breaks on its shore, or wafts to the white beach of the mariner's sail. The lighthouse at Point Isabel was built in the year 1852, during the year that the Vanderbilt line of steamships was put on plying between Brazos Santiago and New Orleans, Louisiana. The lighthouse was put up by American bricklayers, and all the material was brought from abroad. A French revolving light was put in operation when finished. Although some claim that a stationary light was first put in, I failed to endorse the same, because from the very first time that it was put in operation, it was a revolving light. During the Civil War between the states, Point Isabel became quite an important place, being the only port where transportation was feasible between the Gulf of Mexico and all of the connecting towns as far as Laredo, Texas. When the General Banks expedition to the Rio Grande breached off Brussels Santiago on November 3, 1863, the first thing that the commander of the expedition did was to send a few companies of soldiers to take Point Isabel. They came, but were repulsed. The Union general tried over and over to land troops at the point, but was repulsed over and over again until Confederate Colonel Chilton 
was ordered to report at headquarters by General B. When Colonel Chilton pulled out for tall timber, the Federal forces made their first landing, which was on the 8th or 9th of November, 1863. When it was known here that everything was going the wrong way, and that General B. had given orders to destroy all government property, Colonel Chilton was in command of the Confederate Army stationed at Point Isabel. Upon receiving orders to destroy everything that was in connection with the Confederacy, Colonel Chilton first ordered that a 25-pound keg of powder be exploded as to demolish the lighthouse. Sure enough, the morning that the Confederates abandoned Point Isabel, the explosion took place. It only blew the front door clean out of its hinges, and with the exception of a slight crack in the upper part of the brickwork, an injury to a brass wheel of the mechanism of the revolving light, no further damage was accomplished. The lighthouse was used for a good many years afterwards, until abandoned by the U.S. government. But the lamp was in good working order and was sent to headquarters at Mobile, Alabama. The grounds on which the lighthouse was erected became U.S. government property during the latter part of President Grover Cleveland's administration. The government paid the owners $5,000 for the one-acre tract of land that the lighthouse occupied. Chapter 5. Short Sketch of Jean Lafitte. Introduction. The details of Jean Lafitte's life are sketchy, and in some instances, conflicting. We do think, however, that he may have spent some time along the western Gulf Coast. In the following section, the story is told of a woman who claimed to be the wife of Lafitte, who was left at Baghdad and who later moved to Matamoros. In most of the accounts of Lafitte's career, there are such long chronological gaps, the story could have an element of truth. The elder Mr. Neal was a very observing gentleman who lived in Matamoros during these years. He was doubtful that the lady in question was telling the truth. Realizing that this account is probably fiction, it is included as a sample of the stories that came out of this area during these years. Through traditional history, we are informed about the life of the notorious pirate by the name of Lafitte, whose bold deeds of piracy thundered throughout the world. Jean Lafitte was a native of France, where we are told he was born about the year A.D. 1780. We are also informed through the same sources that from his childhood, he detested to go to school and he was restless while spending his time by the fireside of his parents. It is said, when Jean reached the age of 12 years, he ran away from home and through his pleading, obtained a passage as a cabin boy on board a vessel that was sailing for the island of Martinique. He made several voyages on the vessel between France and various French possessions. When Jean reached the age of about 20 years, he got a job as a sailor on board a Spanish ship bound for Cuba, where he found that the vessel was in the slave trading business. Arriving at Cape Macy in Cuba, he was called into an office where the chief informed him that the ship was going to Africa for a load of Africanos that were to be brought to Barataria, Louisiana. Pay was to be 25 francs per month, and at the end of the expedition, a gift of 20 francs was to be received for good services. Traditional history further informs us that when they came back to Louisiana, they received their full pay, but most of the crew did not want to go under the Spanish flag, for the simple reason that the English Navy was on the watch for vessels carrying slaves. While idle in New Orleans, Lafitte got a proposition that could net him a good profit. He was told that he would receive a hundred and fifty francs for each slave that he would deliver to the chief buyer by the name of Stoddard at Barataria, and furthermore, that he was to receive payment for all the expense incurred on the journey. He accepted and sailed for Tunis, where an African man by the name of Kringi delivered to him 125 Negro slaves. He made a successful voyage and got his money to the cent. He was about to try another trip of chance 
and had set sail for the black land when an English man of war halted him and searched the vessel. Finding nothing but indications, they concluded to take them all back to Cuba and burn the vessel that carried him and his crew. Like all Frenchmen, Lafitte had a lot of nerve. He told the captain that the vessel might have been in the slave trade in the past years, but that he bought it with the intention of sailing to South America for fruit and coconuts. The captain, after giving him a cautious talk about the penalty of being caught in slave trading, let him go. But first, he had to go to Port Kingston, Jamaica, in order to be released by the proper authorities. Upon reaching the first rounding near Cape Macy, he saw an English man of war sailing in towards the port, and Jean for the first time saw what would be his end if he was caught in the same business. When the English war vessel reached the port, Jean saw nine men strung up to the main yard of the vessel, and he recognized among those hung a friend of his with whom he had made his first trip. Jean changed his mind, and together with his companions, came to the conclusion of going on another piracy business, less dangerous but more profitable, that of plundering all the vessels that were going to Africa to get slaves. They had to carry money in order to buy slaves and pay their expenses. In order to be in a more suitable position than they would be in Louisiana, that was well guarded by English men of war, they concluded to use the mouth of the Rio Grande and established a sort of hamlet that they afterwards called Baghdad. For a good many years, Jean Lafitte and his companions preyed on the sailing vessels that plied between Mexico and foreign countries, but more especially on the Spaniards, who shipped a great deal of gold and silver to their mother country, Spain. Jean Lafitte, together with his companions, not only worked their piracy at sea, but often waylaid passengers coming from the interior of Mexico by land. They not only took their money, but everything they had in the shape of jewelry. There was one good thing about Don Juan, and that is that he was very kind to his men, and to the inhabitants of the ranches that are between Matamoros and the mouth of the Rio Grande. The above exploits of Jean Lafitte are derived from some of the tales told by his wife, who lived in Matamoros for a good many years, together with her adopted daughter. Mrs. Lafitte, his wife or common-law wife, ran a coffee house and a Mexican restaurant in front of the market square in the city of Matamoros, Mexico. Along the early part of the 1840s, a good many of the old Mexicans who lived among the ranches between Matamoros and Mexico claimed that they personally knew him and all spoke highly of him as being a kind and generous fellow. Lafitte's wife, or perhaps his common-law wife, lived in Matamoros, Mexico, and was well known by the late William Neal, who during his life claimed that somewhere between 1837 and 1838, while in conversation with Madame Lafitte, he asked her when she last heard from her husband. She answered that she had not heard from Jean for nearly two or three years, and that he was at the time operating between Havana and Florida, but that his long silence convinced her that Jean was not living. Otherwise, she would have received some information of his whereabouts. Jean Lafitte must have been well known by the ancient Mexican natives that were living in Matamoros and at the mouth of the Rio Grande, because Mr. William Neal, in relating about his experiences among the Mexicans living at Baghdad and Point Isabel, declared they all had a story about the exploits of the famous pirate. Mrs. Lafitte left Matamoros about the early part of the 40s and took along with her an adopted Mexican daughter. She stated to her friends that she was going to Louisiana to die among her relatives, if any remained. A couple of years afterwards, rumors were circulated in Matamoros that she had been murdered by her relatives. How this rumor got afloat, no one has been able to find out. But some of the old people, when conversing about Mrs. Lafitte, wondered if the report of the death of both her and her adopted daughter was only a ruse to cover the whereabouts of her husband. In one of Mrs. Lafitte's conversations with friends, the question turned to where she met and married Jean Lafitte. 
She stated that she was born in a small fisherman's village that was situated in the great St. Bernard Parish near the mouth of the Mississippi River. It was the custom for the natives, who mostly were French and naturally Roman Catholic, when Lent was terminated on Easter Sunday, to celebrate the event by having a good time consisting of all kinds of games and amusements, especially dancing. It was on Easter Sunday that a large sloop came to anchor near the village, and the sailors, together with their captain, came ashore and commenced to mix with the fishermen. The following night, the young men of the village gave an open yard dance, to which the captain, Jean Lafitte, and some of his men were invited. During the ball, the captain was introduced to her by her own father. They danced quite a number of polkas and waltzes, and he seemed to pay much attention to her, making a good many of the rest of the girls jealous. Just as the ball was about to break up, he asked her if he could call on her at home. She stated that she was surprised to think that a captain of a large vessel should ask a poor fisherman's daughter for the privilege of calling upon her. But as her own father had introduced him to her, she answered him, Your company, Captain, will certainly be accepted. After he had paid her quite a number of visits, Jean popped the question to her of becoming his wife. While they were engaged, he made several trips out to sea, and every time he came back, he brought many presents, especially jewelry. At last the day arrived when they married, August 25, 1804. The poor fisherman's daughter was transformed into a lady, decked with diamonds. After taking a few refreshments, Jean took her on board his vessel, and they set sail for Barataria, where they spent their honeymoon. The husband was not a tall man, only three inches taller than his bride, being about five feet seven inches. He was broad-shouldered and weighed about 160 pounds. She described him as a very handsome man and full of life. During all their married days while in his company, she never asked what he was engaged in. But through his friends, she learned that he was a pirate, pirata. They had been married about four years when Jean told her that he was going to move to a place in Mexico where there is a big river that empties into the Gulf. Within an hour, they sailed and after a few days, landed at a place called La Boca del Rio. There, they cast anchor and went to a small place that Jean called Baghdad. They stopped at the village some two years, and while there, Jean made several trips, and every time brought a good deal of money and jewelry. She never asked him where he got it, but kept her mouth shut like a clam. Mrs. Lafitte claimed that she did not really know the date of the last time that he sailed. After kissing her goodbye, he went, but did not return. She claimed that if her Jean was alive, that he would have come to her or sent word of his whereabouts. This he did on two occasions, but this time, not a word had been received. She thought that he must have drowned during one of the severe hurricanes that have frequently made their appearance in the Gulf. Not hearing from Jean for more than a year, she moved to El Refugio, present-day Matamoros. She must have been a beautiful girl in her younger years, for even in her advanced age, some fifty-odd years, she still retained a complexion that would be the envy of a good many of our so-called pretty girls. The old residents of Matamoros at the time that Mrs. Lafitte was there questioned whether she was telling the truth or prevaricating regarding her marriage to Lafitte, because it seemed queer that she would not answer when being hailed as Mrs. Lafitte. The only thing that she had in her possession that closely verified the fact that they were well acquainted with each other was a large tin-type photograph, wherein both were taken together, and that had an endorsement worded, Trin and Jean. There is no doubt that Lafitte lived for some length of time at Baghdad, now in ruins about three miles from the mouth of the Rio Grande, because some of the old Mexicans, as far back as 1837, claimed to have known of him, which fact can be verified by their descendants, who in after years confirmed what their grandfathers had told them of the wonderful exploits of Lafitte. Chapter 6. 
The Battles of Palo Alto, and Resaca de la Palma. Introduction. The following sketch makes no attempt to trace all the activities of the United States Army on the lower Rio Grande during the early stages of the Mexican War, 1846, but rather it presents a few of the incidents of that struggle as they were viewed and recorded by some of the citizens of the region. Differences between Mexico and the United States became intensified over the Texas question in the 1830s, and when Texas was annexed to the United States in 1845, an armed clash seemed inevitable. To protect the boundaries which Texas claimed while negotiations were in progress, General Zachary Taylor was ordered to Corpus Christi, where he arrived in August of 1845. The following March, 1846, he proceeded toward the Rio Grande, a move considered an act of war by some of the Mexican authorities. His presence on the north bank of that stream caused General Pedro Ampudia, then commander of the Mexican forces in the north, to order Taylor and his men to retreat north of the Nueces River within 24 hours. General Taylor refused to obey this order, pointing out to the Mexican commander that he would maintain his present position until the negotiations then in progress settled the boundary question. He set to work immediately, erecting a supply base at Point Isabel, a location near the mouth of the Rio Grande, which would allow him to maintain connections with the outside world by water. At the same time, he began construction of a fort directly across the river from the Mexican town of Matamoros. This fortification was later completed and named Fort Brown for one of the officers who was killed defending the installation. Frequent skirmishes occurred between the two forces facing each other, but on May 8th and 9th in 1846, two engagements, known as Palo Alto and Resaca de la Palma, were fought. Some of the events revolving around these two battles are here recorded by the elder Mr. Neal, either as he saw them or as he secured information from people who were participants or eyewitnesses. The United States Army left Corpus Christi on March 11, 1846, and arrived on the banks of the Silvery Rio Grande on March 24th, 1846, and went into camp opposite the city of Matamoros, Mexico. Immediately, the engineers of the army commenced to lay breastworks, and afterwards built the famous Fort Brown, in spite of the elements, sharpshooters, and mosquitoes. After having erected Fort Brown partially, and having found that his provisions were getting low, General Zachary Taylor took the major part of the army, went to what is now known as Point Isabel, and lay there waiting for reinforcements that were promised him, but which did not arrive until both battles, Palo Alto and Rosaca de la Palma, were fought. On April 24, 1846, a scouting party consisting of about 70 men, dragoons, were sent out under Captain Thornton. The command had reached the San Pedro Ranch, which was situated 10 miles from Fort Brown. While they were enjoying a rest, they were surrounded by a large force of Mexicans and were captured. After waiting patiently nearly two months, Taylor at last received a battalion of infantry, together with a lot of army wagons and army supplies, which put new life into both officers and soldiers. During the waiting, a sickness of a malignant type began to spread amongst the troops, which carried to kingdom come a great many of his men. At this time of great strain, he heard the echoes of the guns that were being fired in defense of the fort under Major Brown some 22 miles from Point Isabel. With sickness on one side and anxiety on the other, he gave the order to pack up and get ready to march in order to relieve Major Jacob Brown, who undoubtedly was pressed. On May 8, 1846, the army commenced to make its way to the Rio Grande, with Fort Brown as its destination. Old Zack Taylor and his little army, composed of about 2,000 men, had reached a point about halfway between Point Isabel and Fort Brown, called by the natives Los Tulares, or Palo Alto Prairie. There he came across the Mexican army under General Arista in the battle formation with all of his band playing the national hymn, and General Arista and his staff officers all riding up and down their lines, encouraging the men to stand and fight for their country. The Tulares Lakes, where the Battle of Palo Alto took place, are situated about 12 miles from Point Isabel, and about 2 miles north of what is now called Loma Alta, 
going from Brownsville to Point Isabel. These two lakes, named by the Mexicans as El Tular Grande and El Tular Chico, that is, in English, the Big Tular and the Small Tular, are really not lakes, but are what we would call marshes, being filled with bulrush weeds, impossible for an army to penetrate. The road from Brownsville to Point Isabel ran between these two lakes. General Arista placed all his infantry at the head between the two lakes, placing his artillery on the south side of the small Tula Lake, which is situated on the left-hand side of the road from Point Isabel, placing all of his cavalry, Lanceros, dismounted on the south side of the west end of the large Tula Lake, which, owing to the tall Tule, or bulrush weed, kept them from being seen by old Zack. General Arista had undoubtedly placed his Lanceros with the idea that if he routed General Taylor's army, his Lanceros would either kill or capture all the Americanos. General Arista, in laying his plan, undoubtedly forgot that General Taylor had also laid his plans, which were either to capture Arista and his whole army, or to defeat him badly. Upon General Taylor's arriving on the grounds where General Arista waited to meet the American army, he immediately formed his army in line of battle, which was accomplished inside of one hour. Then, all at once, General Taylor commenced to shell the Mexican position. No sooner did the batteries of the U.S. begin firing than the Mexican artillery replied with solid shot. This could be traced through the high Sacahuista grass, and when it neared the American boys, all they did was to open ranks and let it pass, while nearly every shot Taylor fired found its victim. One shell was seen exploding right in the midst of a Mexican band that was playing Los Zapadores de Jalisco. It killed nearly all, and even those who managed to get out of range were badly wounded. The hot firing lasted about three hours, and shots fired now and then lasted another hour. General Arista, seeing that his troops were giving away everywhere, put spurs to his horse and beat it. He did not stop until he reached Matamoros, where he arrived in a fainting condition, complaining that the Americanos had bought his soldiers off with money and that all was lost except his honor. During this battle, the U.S. Army lost one of its most promising officers, Major Ringgold, who lost his life directing the artillery. A solid shot went through his knees, tearing off both of his legs. The shot went through his horse, killing him almost on the spot. Major Ringel died a few hours afterward. He died brave, laughing over a joke he had sprung on his doctor. At a short distance from the battlefield of Palo Alto stands what is called by the native Mexicans Loma Alta. It was behind this hill that Don Rafael Moscoro was in charge of 300 head of cattle for General Arista's army in their campaign against the American army. This very Don Rafael was the individual who gave me all the information about the battle. He told me that the battle lasted about two hours at the most, and that both armies were very slow in getting to a suitable position on account of the marshy grounds in that part of the Palo Alto Prairie. He also stated to me that the actual firing did not last 30 minutes after the Americanos began to fire grape shot. This put a finishing touch to the Mexican side of the fight. All at a sudden, something must have struck the nerves of the Mexican army. I say this because all at once, the Mexican army was nothing but a mob trying to get to a place of safety. Upon seeing his crowd flee, Moscoro commenced to drive the cattle toward the Rio Grande. He claimed to have seen an American artillery officer hit by a cannonball that killed his horse and took the officer's two legs. In after years, he found out this was Major Samuel Ringgold. It was observed later that when in battle, General Taylor would ride through the lines of the soldiers with both of his legs on the same side of his horse. This custom became noticeable to the extent that an inquisitive brother officer once asked him if he rode half-straddled because he was suffering from army piles. The old general turned and told him, Hell no! 
I ride in that manner as a precaution because I have a great deal of responsibility on my shoulders. He continued that Major Ringgold lost his life by having both of his legs shot off, and he did not wish his to be lost the same way. Taylor claimed he had adopted this method of writing, so in case he was struck as the Major was, he would lose only one leg at a time. With Palo Alto over, General Taylor gave the order to advance slowly, undoubtedly fearing that as night was coming, that the enemy might be lying in amongst the chaparral timber that adorns all that lower country. About sundown, he gave orders to camp at Guadalupe Ranch, which is situated between the Los Mesquites Resaca and the Resaca de la Palma, and to rest on arms. The following morning, he appointed Captain D.C. Buell to take at least 200 men to scout for the enemy. Captain Buell obeyed orders and did not find any enemy in front, and so reported to General Taylor. After participating in a good breakfast, the troops received the orders on the morning of May 9th to march to the Rio Grande because of the firing of the defenders of the fort and the enemy could be plainly heard. The army got on its way about 10 a.m. with Captain Luther in advance with about 100 picked men. No sooner had Captain Luther reached the Resaca de la Palma than he was killed with a volley of small arms fire in which the captain was killed. The men, seeing their captain fall immediately, charged the enemy who were strongly entrenched on the opposite side of the Resaca. Both then began to pour in volley after volley at each other. At this stand of affairs, the main U.S. Army got into position and took up the fight, which lasted about an hour, when all at once, the Mexicans gave way and broke into a disorderly mass, with our artillery pouring grape and canister shots at the retreating mob. I personally saw at least 250 Mesquital Indian soldiers dead, having been torn to pieces by grape shot. These very men were buried all together in a pit that was dug by their former comrades at arms, now prisoners at a place about 200 feet from the main road on the left side coming from Point Isabel, the plot being about 50 feet from the Resaca, where the battle was fought. The most horrible and pitiful sight to witness was when the routed Mexican army reached the Rio Grande. The ferry at Freeport Crossing consisted of a large flat-bottom barge and two small flat-bottom skiffs, with the capacity of about 40 passengers. When the crazy defeated mass of humanity reached the ferry landing, the mob jumped into the boats that were already filled with old men, women, and children, causing a good many of the women in their fright to jump overboard into the river where most drowned. Some of the foot soldiers who could swim were trying to evade getting tangled with their drowning companions while others were clinging to the rails of the boats, hoping to save their lives. All were struggling to be saved. Women and men were crying and yelling, and children were being smashed and trodden under the heels of the frightened mob. I tell you, it was a horrible sight to witness, especially when the mounted lanceros de Hidalgo came on in full run and flung themselves into the river among the mass of human lives that were trying their very lives to save. They showed no pity, no respect for their own race, disregarding the cries for help of both women and children. On they went into the river, tramping down the struggling mass of human lives that came their way. It is horrible to relate. In many instances, the cowardly demons killed their former comrades-at-arms by either plunging their swords into them, or, in a good many instances, by splitting their heads wide open just because the poor wretches were trying to save their lives by clinging to the soldiers' horses' manes or tails. There is no telling how many lives were lost by drowning in a stampede during the evening of the 9th and 10th of May 1846. The Rio Grande at the time was on a rise, which by the 14th had overflowed the whole country. The routed mob, those that managed to get across the river safely, did not stop in Matamoros, Mexico for any length of time. They simply kept a going 
until they reached the interior where they gave out a good many different stories as to how they whipped the bolios. Their stories changed considerably when the natives saw the American army going towards the interior of the country. They soon found out that their countrymen did not give them a true account of what had happened. On the evening of May 9th, right after the Battle of Resaca de la Palma, General Taylor reached the fort on the Rio Grande, but found its able commander, Major Jacob Brown, dead. The fort was named after him, Fort Brown, as was the city of Brownsville. When fully constructed, the fort resembled a turtle, with the front-facing Matamoros on 6th Street, and in a position that the right and left guns could sweep the most important part of the city. Well, in the middle, there were mounted two guns that could sweep not only the business part of the city, but also the military plaza, Plaza de Armas. While General Taylor was waiting for reinforcements at Point Isabel, and Major Brown was exchanging shots with the enemy, a small fort was erected by General Arista at the foot of 5th Street that was sheltered by the tall brush and was manned by one six-pound naval gun, which at times became very annoying to the United States soldiers while putting the finishing touches to Fort Brown. Vainly did the soldiers try to locate the gun, but somehow all efforts failed. It was while Major Jacob Brown was trying to locate the little swamp angel that he received the wound that caused his death. Major Brown, accompanied by a lieutenant, a sergeant, and two enlisted men, started on a reconnoitering trip along the banks of the river. They had reached what is now the foot of 12th Street, when they heard a volley of shots fired from across the river. One of the lead missiles hit Major Brown, and the brave commander lost his life. The hidden Fort Conejo, Fort Rabbit, was never located while the war lasted. But the remains of the fort were visited later by a good number of those who tried to locate it during the war. I wish to give the correct story of the way that General La Vega was captured by Captain May on the evening of the 9th of May, 1846. I knew both Captain May and Don Romulo de la Vega. Both were good friends. Many a good chat I had with them, especially with Captain May, who very frequently called at home. Being a great reader, he would borrow some of my books to read, as he often made the remark to pass away the time. Romulo de la Vega, a little prior to the Mexican War, lived with his family at a place now known as the Taylor Crossing at the Arroyo Colorado, then known as El Paso Real. During all this time, he was a Mexican customs officer and held the rank of comandante of all the mounted customs inspectors in the district. His father... Don Manuel de la Vega married one of the Bailly girls who lived at a ranch called Los Bailles, situated on the Rio Grande. Don Manuel de la Vega took his family to live at the Santa Anita Ranch, then owned by Don Matias Gomez, who was a friend of his. He was blessed with quite a large family, which consisted mostly of girls. Romulo, the general, Jose Angel, and another boy by the name of Modesto were the only male children in the family. Jose Angel remained at Santa Anita, where he lived and died. I do not know whatever became of Modesto. Romulo, who was the brains of the family, went to live in Matamoros, where he became mixed up in city affairs and was finally rewarded for his trouble by receiving a customs house appointment as Comandante del Resguardo, or a corporal, and was stationed at the Paso Real Crossing at the Arroyo Colorado. His district was composed of the three main crossings of the Arroyo Colorado, one being at the Taza, another at the Paso Real, his headquarters, and the third being at Paso de las Tavernas, which is situated at the mouth of the Arroyo. The Paso Real, as before mentioned, is what is now known as Taylor's Crossing. When the Army of Occupation left Corpus Christi and was nearing the Arroyo, Vega and his men made haste to Matamoros, arriving with a tale of woe to relate to General Pedro Ampudia, who was still in command. General Ampudia, upon receiving the information that the U.S. Army was on the way, immediately began to get ready. He appointed Romulo de la Vega as an auxiliary captain and placed him in command of all the civilian employees as well as all the customs house force, totaling about 200 men. 
Upon his arrival, General Arista, who superseded General Ampudia, reconstructed and reorganized the whole force. In this juggling, he placed some of the worst men as officers, and at the same time, he stripped Captain Romulo de la Vega of the best men that he had, leaving him with about 25 men. Arista placed him under the command of General Lozano, another of the so-called generals who arose all at a sudden from captain to generalship. Although I will say that Mr. Lozano was a fine man, being a man of his word, the only things against him were that he liked mezcal a little too much and that he was an illiterate, being totally ignorant of letters. When General Arista, at the head of his army, left Matamoros to meet the American army of occupation under General Zack Taylor, he left General Lozano in charge of Matamoros. At the same time, he was to guard the rear of Arista's army with orders that if called upon, he would go to the front to render assistance. General Arista left Matamoros with an army of about 5,000 men, consisting of about three arms, infantry, artillery, and cavalry, all under his personal command. He left Matamoros on the morning of the 4th of May, 1846, and camped on the night of the same day, on a hill called Loma Alta. Upon seeing that the U.S. forces were coming towards where his army was camped, he immediately marched his army a little ahead of the Tulares Lakes, placing his artillery on the ground back of the small Tulares Lake, and his lanceros and cavalry around the large Tulares Lake, where he met the Americans, which resulted in his total defeat. The routed army beat it, and did not stop to catch breath until they got to Matamoros. While this was going on, General Lozano and his men came to the rescue. No sooner did Lozano reach Resaca de la Palma than he met the U.S. boys, who put him out of the fight. He also beat it to Matamoros, leaving Captain Romulo de la Vega in command. Captain Vega had about 400 men to hold back the army of occupation, until the main Mexican army was safely in Matamoros. The Mexican soldiers who participated in the Battle of the Resaca de la Palma undoubtedly fought bravely and held their ground until their ammunition was exhausted. While the advance guard of the army was engaged, the main U.S. army came up and took a hand which brought things to a close. They charged against the Mexicans, and in a very short time, they all beat it for the Rio Grande, leaving only Captain Vega, who was at the time handling a six-pound cannon and had fired the last shot on hand right in the face of about ten U.S. soldiers who had crawled up the steep bank of the Resaca. This resulted in some of the men being burned beyond recognition by the powder. Their faces were nothing but holes. Others were totally blind. When some of the soldiers reached solid ground, they were led by Sergeant Melville, who made for the man with a sword and captured him without a struggle. Sergeant Melville, after having taken Captain Vega's sword and belt, strapped it around himself and took Captain Vega and a few other Mexican soldiers towards where the main army was. When they came across Captain May, Sergeant Melville unstrapped the sword and handed it over to Captain May, stating, Captain, this is the general that I took the sword from. He seemed to be the whole works. Captain May then took charge of Vega. The above is a true story told by Tom Melville about the capture of Romulo de la Vega. After the battles of Palo Alto and Resaca de la Palma, General Taylor crossed over to Matamoros by way of the Freeport Ferry, which was then known by the Mexicans as the Paso Libre. It was situated about 200 yards above the present site of the old International Bridge, known as the Brownsville and Matamoros Bridge. It took General Taylor three days to cross his entire army over to Matamoros. In connection to the war between the United States and Mexico, I will add to what one of our oldest and best respected citizens had to say about the experience he had during his service as a soldier in Taylor's army. Mr. Alexander Warbisky stated that when the army started from Corpus Christi, all went well until they arrived on the sand prairie, with the hot sand blowing square in your face, and the slow and tedious march was trying to human stability, and only willpower got them through. During the march, what seemed to put the ginger into the boys 
was that they wanted to fight and at the same time see the pretty Mexican Indian girls that were described to them through Indian novels that were spread among the boys to read and to encourage them to go to the front. It was amusing to hear the talk of the boys sitting around in groups after having their supper, all stating what they were going to do after the war. Some had in view marrying rich Indian girls, while others were of the opinion to marry and stay among the tribe, with the hopes of someday becoming chief of the tribe. Others were of the opinion of marrying beautiful Indian girls and taking them to their homes. While on the march, slowly, almost snail-like, they arrived at a small Indian ranch, situated about where the King Sao's ranch now stands. And as they passed, a good many of the Indian girls came out to see them. This afforded them a chance to see for the first time what an Indian was. All to be seen was a grass hut, covered with hides and strings of dried fish in each yard, and the Indian girls they so anxiously sought. When they pitched camp, one could witness the change of color in the boys' faces. All were silent, with their mouths shut close as clams. While rounding up for a rest, some of the boys referred to the scene. All were despondent. <laughs> Chapter 7, Brownsville, Texas. Introduction. In the following section, no attempt is made to trace the history of Brownsville from its beginning, because this has been done by others. Instead, some random observations and comments of William Neal are given. The material was written by William Alfred Neal from notes left by his grandfather and from conversations which the two men had over the years. Previous to the existence of the city of Brownsville, Texas, the main thoroughfare between Matamoros, Mexico, and El Fronton, now known as Point Isabel, was as follows. Upon leaving Matamoros, one came across the Rio Grande del Norte on either a flat boat, generally called by the natives Chalana, which provided for those who had vehicles, or by a small flat bottom ferry boat used for foot passengers. On reaching the present Texas side of the Rio Grande, one first had to go via Tanques del Ramireño, now known simply as El Ramireño, from whence the road brought one to the main road that ran about 10th Street, where the Capitol Theater is now located, and led to El Fronton, Port Isabel. The road crossed the first resaca, at the place known as Las Ladrilleras, the brickyards. The next place where Resaca was crossed was Puente de Guadalupe. The entire road from Ramireño to the Fronton was named Camino de Santa Isabel. The Ramireño Ranch, which was situated on the northwest city limit line, was one of the oldest ranches in Cameron County. Some of our leading families in Brownsville, Texas, descended from some of the settlers of the Ramireño. The Vera, Falcón, Vela, Ramírez, Treviño, Villarreal, and Longoria families were the most prominent of those who lived at the ranch. When the city of Brownsville was organized, nearly all of the families of the Ramireño came into the new city to live. Ramireño was once the gateway not only to Matamoros, but also to the interior of Mexico. All had to go via the Tanques del Ramireño, whether they liked it or not. The so-called Tanques were water holes built to furnish people and livestock with clear water. These earthen cisterns were filled when the river rose and overflowed its banks. It filled up the several tanques, and when one got empty, it was clean for the next rise, and so on. After the war between the United States and Mexico, people from the states came pouring towards the Rio Grande and gathered around the county seat that was established at Santa Rita, during the latter part of the year, 1848. Judge Israel B. Bigelow, a lawyer of note, conceived the idea of laying claim to that portion of Matamoros, Mexico, which lay on the Texas side of the Rio Grande and became Texas property by the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. This cutoff, when measured, contained 1,558 acres of land. While the land was being explored and measured, it was found that nearly all of it was situated on a flat ridge that at present can be described as lying between 4th Street 
and the Lower Garrison Gate, better known as Fort Brown Military Reservation. Judge Bigelow went to work with a handful of friends, including William Neal, John Webb, and Stephen Powers. They applied to the state for a charter to incorporate the 1,558 acres into a city. Except for a lumber building that was erected on the corner of what is now known as Levy and 11th Streets, owned at the time by a Jew by the name of Slinger, and the store known as the Mandarita. The balance of the ridge was covered by willow and mesquita trees, with an undergrowth of prickly pear and brush. With the exception of a small cow pen situated near where the Francisco Iturria home now stands, the rest was occupied only by rattlesnakes, centipedes, lizards, and horned frogs. The Salinas family and the Cavazos family, consisting of Don Antonio Cavazos and his two sisters, Maria Josefa and Refugia, occupied the lower lands that lay between the lagoon in Fort Brown and the Tomatoes Ranch. The city plan for incorporation was laid out by George Lyons, deputy surveyor of Cameron County. People commenced to flock in, including the famous Patrick Shannon. As the brush was being cleared from the ridge, a large gathering of squatters, under the leadership of Pat Shannon, began to fence in not only blocks of the city, but large acreages of land which they claimed by squatters' rights. During the forming of Brownsville's charter, a good many fights occurred in naming the proposed town site. Patrick Shannon wanted the city named Shannondale, while a good many others wanted it named Taylor, and still others, Brownsville. After a good deal of wrangling over the name, the Honorable William Neal urged the citizens to give the town site the name of Brownsville, after the name of its brave defender. This choice was supported with the aid of the veterans by a good majority. The town site was named in the charter as Brownsville, and Judge Israel B. Bigelow was unanimously elected mayor of the city. Many lawyers of note came to Brownsville. Among the many who came were Basson Horde, W.E. Garland, Stephen Powers, Israel B. Bigelow, and Charles E. McManus. All the main streets in Brownsville are named after the presidents of the United States, except Elizabeth Street. That was named for George Lyon's wife, who died while her husband was planning the city. Ringgold was named after the hero, Major Ringgold, who lost his life at the Battle of Palo Alto. Fronton Street derived its name from the general use of the road that ran from El Ramireño to Fronton. St. Charles Street was named for Charles Stillman. Brownsville, during the time mentioned above, was a distributing point for people whose destination was the gold rush of California. The reason that Brownsville became a haven for transient travelers going to or returning from the Pacific coast was that it was the safest way to reach California. Instead of going through vast prairie lands and running the risk of being killed by wild Indians, all one had to do via the Brownsville route was to cross over to Matamoros, hire a conveyance, and go along from town to town until he reached Douglas, Arizona where he got stages owned by Americans that would take him either to what is now known as Carson City, Nevada, or San Francisco, California. Coming back from the gold fields, one came the same route, but in order to play it safe, travelers coming with gold would hire a military escort from the commander of the Mexican army, who would guard them and their gold until they got to the first town that was out of his jurisdiction, where the same process had to be renewed, and so on, until they got to Matamoros, Mexico. There they came across to Brownsville, and were once more in the United States. During the gold rush, those that were engaged in business enjoyed good times and made plenty of what makes the mayor go money. Some of the leading financiers in the United States made the beginnings of their colossal fortunes in Brownsville. Among the many was Charles Stillman. Among those who came to Brownsville were a lot of gamblers who really were the deciding vote in the city elections. There naturally became a faction among the office aspirants. When Mr. William Neal became mayor of the city, he initiated at once a scheme to get some revenue from them by putting through an ordinance that all gamblers had to pay a fine and pay for a 30-day stay in jail. This brought quite a revenue. After the law was passed, all gamblers would come regularly on the first of each month and pay both the fine, which amounted to $25, and $1 for each day of the month, 
totaling $55 or $56, according to the number of days that the month contained. This practice enabled the city to reconstruct not only the Market Hall, but also paved the principal street, Elizabeth, between 12th and 13th streets. It permitted replacement of all the old-time street lamps by putting in iron posts and kerosene lamps to furnish excellent lights for the city's use. Also, the old cowbell that was used to call both the police and aldermen was replaced by a bell. A brick wall was really financed by fines collected from drunkards and small Monty dealers. It was during Mr. Neal's first administration of city affairs that Washington Square received attention. He ordered all prisoners that could not pay their fines to go and spread the dirt and garbage over the place that was once a lake. It took time, but it was at last accomplished, and is now adorned by the Independent School District. Chapter 8. Richard King Any history of the region lying between the Nueces River and the Rio Grande from 1847 to 1885 would be incomplete without some mention of Richard King and his role in its development. Little is known of King's early life, but we know that he came to the Rio Grande, or the frontier, in the spring of 1847 at the request of his friend, Mifflin Kennedy, to help run a fleet of riverboats which General Taylor needed to supply his army as he moved into North Mexico. After the Mexican War, King chose to remain on the Rio Grande, where he became one of its most famous citizens. He was self-reliant, aggressive, and at times even boisterous. But these were the qualities one needed to survive in this turbulent era. In the following short selection, the Neals give a description of South Texas during the early days of King's association with the region. Captain Richard King was born on a farm situated in Orange County in the state of New York on July 10, 1825. Captain King was one of the most noted pioneers that ever reached the frontier of Texas on the lower section of the Rio Grande. He was a square dealer. King came to the frontier during the month of June, 1846. He married Henrietta, the daughter of an old pioneer, Reverend Hiram Chamberlain, on December 9, 1854. When Captain Mifflin Kennedy was ordered to buy steamboats for the use of the U.S. Army, Captain King became the commander of the steamer, Colonel Cross, a position which he held until the war ended. After the war ended between the U.S. and Mexico, and the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was signed, both Richard King and Mifflin Kennedy came closer together by forming a partnership in purchasing steamboats from the U.S. government. Soon after the King-Kennedy Company got into operation with their steamboats plying between Brownsville, Texas to Brazo Santiago, King and Kennedy conceived an idea of going into the cattle raising business. In their hobby, Captain King settled on a large tract of land owned by Don Luis Gutierrez named Santa Gertrudis, and Kennedy bought what was then known as Los Laureles. I will now try to explain as briefly as possible the condition of the country as well as how things were carried on among those that lived on the lands in the way of honest trading. When both Richard King and Mifflin Kennedy acquired their lands, all that territory between the Nueces River and the Rio Grande consisted of sand hills and vast prairies of salt grass, Sacahuiste, inhabited mostly by a few Indian tribes that had for their companions rattlesnakes, gophers, owls, and above all, coyotes. In these large prairies, thousands of head of wild horses and cattle roamed about without a brand or owner. This land became known as No Man's Land and became the contentious bone between the state of Texas and Mexico, which was finally settled by a war between the United States and Mexico. I will now give you an idea of what kind of land we had to raise cattle on between the Nueces and the Rio Grande by going over the same route that General Zachary Taylor took when he marched his army to the Rio Grande. Generally, you left Corpus Christi early in the morning about 4 a.m. in order to enjoy the delightful breeze and the scent of the prairie flowers. After traveling about two hours, one arrived at a small Mexican Indian ranch known by the name of El Tejon, owned by a man who went by the name of Realitos, 
who had a sort of a restaurant that only served eggs in combination with yapin sauce, picadillo hash, trimmed with the same chili sauce, and tortillas and coffee, and would charge you what he liked. But his bottom figure was cuatro realitos. From this custom, he got the name Realitos. While you indulged in your morning breakfast, old Realitos would entertain you by giving you his pedigree that carried the line of his ancestors clean almost to Adam. About the strangest thing in his detailed story was that he intermixed his ancestors with ghosts, especially with Don Juan el Pirata, Jean Lafitte. This stopping place was visited by a good many travelers who were on the way to the Rio Grande. I almost forgot to state that before you left Corpus Christi, you had to include in your luggage a full supply of eatables that would last you until you got to Brownsville, Texas. After you had got through breakfast at Realitos, the stage driver would blast out, All aboard! After which the crack of his whip would start the stage on its way. This jornada the distance from one stopping place to another, would carry you to another small ranch that went by the name of La Pita, where the stage stopped in order to rest the horses and give the passengers time to stretch their legs and to operate other unmentionable necessities. <laughs> it was after leaving this bosa that you would soon arrive at the edge of the sand belt, where you had to spend two days and one night in crossing the desert from La Pita to the Garza Ranch or El Saltillo. When you arrived at the sand belt, there was no more cracking the whip in order to make the horses go faster. It was a jog from the time that you entered the sand until you got through. The worst thing that a traveler had to contend with was, first, there was but one stopping place on the sand belt run by a few Mexicans. This ranch was situated on a plot of sound ground and was called Las Motas. While traveling through this sandy country, half asleep and weary, fanning yourself with your hat on account of the intense heat, all at a sudden, the driver would yell at the top of his voice, CURTAIN DOWN! What for? One of the passengers near the driver's seat would ask. Why, don't you see the sandstorm we have just gone through? And sure enough, one soon learned what CURTAIN DOWN meant. One would get accustomed to meeting these kinds of whirlwinds in the sandy region. But as you came along, nearing a spot where it had rained, you could see something like a cloud rising from the ground. The driver would in most cases call the attention of the nearest passenger and ask him what he thought the cloud consisted of. Why, it's a small rain cloud. The driver would only laugh, but just as soon as the stage got to where the cloud was, he would yell out in a loud voice, Curtain down and tight! The cloud soon turned out to be nothing but a cloud of mosquitoes, gall nippers, which, when we arrived in the midst of them, not only made a charge on the horses, but on the passengers as well. In most cases, the result of their sting produces fever. The reader can imagine what kind of a time passengers had to go through. Just to imagine what one had to go through would produce a sensational shudder. At last, after arriving at Las Motas, we stopped a whole night in order to give all a rest, including the poor horses. While we were resting at night with the hopes of getting both a good sleep and rest, all at a sudden, you could hear the voice of the coyote's song, which naturally would not be very pleasant for the stranger to hear. After traveling for four days and nights, one would arrive at last in Brownsville, Texas, and on arriving, had to stop at the only hotel, which at the time consisted of a two-story building nicknamed Noah's Ark, then owned by Mr. John Webb. When you arrived in this celebrated hotel, all you could hear was the voices of men who were returning from the gold fields of California, who were naturally drinking at the Miller's Bar, and were having a good time. Once in a while, you could hear one called all kinds of epithets, including the son of an unmarried woman. But when one called the other a liar, the shooting commenced. All this naturally was very unpleasant for a tenderfoot to experience, but he too would be in a very short time to get accustomed to the current times. It was during these times that the whole country of Cameron 
was in the hands and at the mercy of the Mexican Indian element, to the extent that it was dangerous to travel on your own ranch without having an escort of well-armed men. It was during this period of dangerous times that a good many men lost their lives. It was during these trying times that Richard King, although quite a young man, moved to Corpus Christi in order to be nearer to his ranch, thereby giving him the opportunity of attending to his other lands that he had acquired. King, little by little, as fast as he could get money, employed the same by buying lands and enlarging his property. Mr. King has been severely criticized by a good many of his friends, but they, in doing so, were stating things that were not true and could not be proved, all arising from what some other individual said. Captain King, during his lifetime, very frequently visited Brownsville in order to see to his business at this end, and immediately after getting through with what he had to attend to, he would go to Miller's Hotel and see some of his old-time friends that frequented the saloon. Upon arriving, he always had a riddle, and when he got through reciting the catch, all laughed whether it was a new or a stale riddle. All would have a hearty laugh over the joke, which naturally pleased him. Come on, boys, have a drink! This would be the commencement of having a good time. Captain King, during his life on the frontier of Texas, was known as a plain, outspoken man. In other words, he was one that what he had to say, he said up above board. He never spoke evil about anybody, or was known to cast a remark against the character of anyone no matter whether it was his worst enemy or his friend. Chapter 9, The Cortina Raid, What Brought It On Introduction One of the most controversial figures in the history of the Lower Rio Grande region was Juan Nepomuceno Cortina, whose career has been the subject of several books, numerous articles, congressional investigations, and even international diplomacy. He was pictured by some as a Robin Hood, a defender of the weak, the poor, and the downtrodden, while others accused him of being a bandit and a cattle thief. As late as 1949, a master's thesis was written at a Midwestern university reappraising his role in border history. Since the facts surrounding his life and activities are well known and have been treated in so many sources, no attempt will be made to retell them in any detail. It is felt, however, that some mention should be made of this episode, for Cortina's raid on Brownsville in September 1859, and its aftermath, had important consequences for the Neal family. In the first place, William Peter Neal, the 26-year-old son of William Neal, was killed during this disturbance. He left a two-year-old son, William Alfred Neal, who was reared by his grandfather. Also, the ranch property of William Neal, sometimes called the Baston property, located near Santa Maria, was burned a short time later, thus destroying not only thousands of dollars worth of property, but also some of the papers which Mr. Neal had been collecting for years. The following section includes some information not found in the usual accounts of the turmoil, excitement, and violence which characterized these years. The Espiritu Santo tract of land on which the city of Brownsville is situated, comprising of about 270,000 acres, was donated by the Crown of Spain to José Salvador de la Garza in the year 1782. After the war between the United States and Mexico, this area was ceded to the United States in 1846 and 1848, and became Texas territory and is now part of Cameron County. Amongst the many heirs that Don José Salvador de la Garza left behind him was Doña Carmen, who was a grandchild of the said Garza, and her son, Juan Nepomuceno Cortina. Also surviving was Doña Refugia Cavazos, who was another grandchild of the said José Salvador de la Garza. When all the land bordering on the north side of the Rio Grande became Texas property, thousands of immigrants came pouring in from the states, as well as people returning from California, dazed with the gold craze. All began to settle and partition the lands amongst themselves, all claiming squatters' rights on what they called vacant lands. 
Naturally, the heirs to the land resented the encroachment of the Americans, and bad blood began to boil between the squatters and the rightful owners of the land. Amongst the many clients that placed their claims with the law firm of Bass and Horde was Doña Refugia Cavazos and Juan Nepomuceno Cortina, who joined with his aunt in bringing joint suit for the recovery of their lands. The suit was pending and was being carried from term to term in the district court. On July 13, 1859, J.N. Cortina came to town on horseback from his ranch to attend court and stopped at a coffee house which was situated on the east side of the market square. Dismounting from his horse, he went in and had a cup of coffee. He returned to his horse, lighting a cigarette, mounted, and started to go towards the courthouse, which was situated on the corner of Levy and 10th Streets. At this stage, he turned around to see who was hailing him, and he saw the city marshal, Mr. Robert Shears, having in his custody a man by the name of Cabrera, who happened to be one of Cortina's peons. It happened that during the beginning of the month of June 1859, the city of Brownsville, Texas, was without a city marshal. After a great deal of hunting for an efficient person to fill the position, Mr. Robert Shears was selected and sworn in as the chief of the police force. On July 13, 1859, while Mr. Shears was purchasing some chewing tobacco at the Cometa grocery store, situated where Manato's store is now, he saw a drunken man raising merry hell. Mr. Shears, in approaching the individual, recognized him as Cabrera, a man wanted for horse-stealing that occurred during the time that he, Shears, was on the ranger force. Mr. Shears went up to him and arrested him. While he was having an argument with his prisoner, he saw that Cabrera was trying to get a large pocket knife. Immediately, Mr. Shears pulled out his revolver and struck Cabrera over the head and got the knife, which was thrown on the ground. While tugging with his prisoner, Juan N. Cortina came up, riding his horse at a quick gait and demanded from Mr. Shears that he release the prisoner because he was his peon. Words brought words until Cortina put spurs to his horse with the view of overriding Mr. Shears. At this juncture of the situation, Mr. Shears took a shot at Cortina but hit the pommel of Cortina's saddle, which undoubtedly saved him from being killed. Cortina took a shot at Shears and missed him then fired a second shot, which took effect in the left shoulder. Mr. Shears tried to cock his pistol, but it hung on him. He went back to the Cometa store, where a doctor came and pronounced the wound as dangerous and advised him to go home. If Mr. Shears had had his own revolver, things would have been different. His gun had been left a couple of days previously with Don Juan Rico to be thoroughly cleaned and greased. While his pistol was being cleaned, he took an old pistol that was in the city marshal's office, which was examined after the affray and pronounced worthless. Some of the old-timers who examined the pistol wondered, how in the hell did the first shot went off? This sad affair was what brought on the Cortina raid. Mr. Robert Shears, during the time that he was in the ranger service, was considered by his comrades one of the most fearless men in the company. He had very little to say outside of his duty. His own comrades, when referring to his ways, often quoted that Bob Shears ought to have been a woman because he detested to hear smutty stories and stale jokes. <laughs> when in conversation with friends, he generally remained silent and listened to what his friend had to say. Occasionally, he chipped in a word. His only faults were that he used chewing tobacco to an excess leaving a pool of tobacco juice wherever he stood or sat. And with all his good characteristics, whenever he got angry at anyone, he would, on the spur of the moment, issue a flow of curses and words that would require a rosary to keep track of what he had to say. But, I will say, he seldom got angry. Mr. Shears died at Bremer's Drug Store, where he went to get medical aid and medicine, to ease the pain that arose from the wound he received in his encounter with Cortina. The above affair put a feather in Cortina's hat and made him a hero amongst his countrymen. And it was the starting point 
of his career as a first-class cattle thief and a cold-blooded murderer. After Cortina had his first fight, things looked rather stormy, and everyone expected that a clash of arms would take place between the local authorities and the Cortina followers. At the advice of some of the go-between lawyers, things were suspended and finally dropped. That is, on the part of the American side of the question. But on the side of Cortina's followers, things were of a different nature. Their side was nothing but a smoldering fire, only waiting for the wind of opportunity to strike when we least expected it. Although a lady by the name of Mrs. Wayman, who lived at this time up the river at a ranch called Santa Rita, very often wrote letters to the authorities in the city, citing and cautioning them to be on the lookout, stating to them that the Mexicans around the vicinity of her ranch seemed to be restless and grouped in small numbers, which indicated that they were undoubtedly plotting to do some devilment. All her warnings seemed to have no effect all turned a deaf ear to her heedful advice. Things ran smoothly until the day as well as the opportunity arrived, with no soldiers at Fort Brown, all having been called by General Twiggs to San Antonio, Texas, we were left totally at the mercy of the natives. At about daylight on the morning of September 28, 1859, Cortina, at the head of about 90 men, mostly mounted, entered Brownsville. All his men were shouting, Muere los gringos! And all were raising merry hell as they came in. Upon coming down what is now called Elizabeth Street, Cortina placed two men at each intersection with orders to shoot anyone attempting to congregate or interfere with any of his men. He then proceeded down the main street, Elizabeth Street, until he arrived at the Miller Hotel, where he stopped and taking a few of his men, divided them into parties of about four each. To each gang, he handed a list instructing them to kill all the men that were on it. The list never came to sight after things got quiet again. Although good rewards were offered for it, no list or lists were ever obtained. Among the individuals that Cortina wanted were Adolf Glavik, George Morris, Red Thomas, Peter Collins, James G. Brown, Henry Klon. All escaped, except George Morris, the jailer. Poor Morris was asleep when the firing and shouting awoke him, so his wife stated. Getting out of bed, he went to the window to see what was going on, saw the crowd coming towards his house, dressed himself, and taking his revolver, got under the house for safety. The gang of cutthroats searched the premises, and at the pleading of his wife, who stated that her husband was not at home, were near leaving. When somehow, one of the gang happened to observe that the steps leading to the house seemed to have been removed and were not in their proper place. He gave the steps a jerk, and they readily gave way. Under the house, he detected the man they were looking for. All the gang commenced firing under the house at him. But before they killed him, he shot three of their gang. They took poor Morris after he was dead and hacked his body with their knives into such small pieces that his wife, Doña Luciana, had to get a sack in order to put his remains in so as to be able to bury him. The writer has had several conversations with Doña Luciana who afterwards married Red Thomas, regarding the sad affair. And she confirmed the above, which was copied from a statement made by my grandfather, William Neal. Naturally, while Cortina was having his own way, hundreds of the natives came flocking in to join his command. Even the servants that were working with the American families quit in order to join Cortina. At this juncture of affairs, and while the town was in an uproar, the tame Mexicans that had joined Cortina in order to fall in the good graces of their leader informed Cortina that he could get good horses that were in the Neal stables. Cortina then gave the order to go and get them. The crowd came down the alley between Washington and Adams, abutting on 14th Street, 
where I, William A. Neal, now live. Amongst the crowd were three brothers of the Tapia family, who were raised from childhood by Mr. William Neal, my grandfather. When the crowd arrived at the point of their destination, they undoubtedly saw that my father, William Peter Neal, was asleep, having just returned from a trip to Point Isabel, where he took some passengers to meet the steamer that was about to sail for New Orleans. I was then two years old and was sleeping in the same bed at the time. From John Webb's statement, the crowd arrived, and seeing my father asleep, one of the cutthroats by the name of Indalesio Tapia, or Gonzalez, fired through the window, which was open, at my father at close range. The shot having taken effect, my father in his last moments, with the few fragments of life that he still had, picked me up, threw me under the bed, rushed out into the yard, and expired near a wood pile that was about the middle of the yard. I remained two days and nights under the bed, so I was told by my aunt, Mrs. Isabel Neal Cowan, where she found me. So unexpected was the raid that at the time it took place, most of the leading families of Brownsville were in attendance at a fair at the Plaza de la Capilla in Matamoros. My mother, as well as most of the Neal family, was also taking in the fair, and as we had a furnished house in Matamoros, it made no difference whether they stayed a day or a week. It placed no inconvenience on us whatever. Mr. William Neal, my grandfather, was at Santa Maria and was not present when the raid took place. The first information he got about what happened was a note that he received from Mrs. Wayman, in which she sent him the following message. Bill, come to Brownsville. Your son is hurt. Mr. Neal, upon receiving Mrs. Wayman's note, immediately got ready to come on horseback and was about to start, when his compadre, Don Guillermo Cano, came rushing to the ranch and told Mr. Neal not to come to Brownsville on the American side, but to cross over the river and go on to the Mexican side, as Cortina was on the road killing all the Americanos he came across. Mr. Neal took his compadre's advice, and together with his old friend, Josiah Turner, crossed the river and came to Matamoros, where he crossed back to Brownsville too late to see his son who had been buried the day previous. Cortina, fearing that the United States government would send troops against him, crossed over to Matamoros, Mexico, where he could see personally what was going on, and at the same time direct things to suit himself in the line of horse and cattle stealing. At the same time, he had quite a large force stationed at El Carmen Ranch, to have them ready for any emergency. Cortina was having things his own way. He claimed that the Americans stole all the cattle they owned from the Mexicans, and that he was stealing from the Americans only. As time passed, the forces that Cortina had at the Carmen Ranch were getting tired of working for one boss for almost no pay, and commenced stealing on their own hook. No sooner did Cortina hear what was going on in his ranch than he crossed from Mexico to the Texas side at the Carmen Ranch, and in less than two days, he had shot all of those men that were doing outside business. If I remember correctly, I think that there were nine shot. The rest of the gang remained faithful, only stealing for one boss. These boys naturally were held with great respect by their chief. During Cortina's stay at his ranch, he would frequently give out that he was contemplating making another raid on Brownsville to finish the work that he had left undone on his previous raid. The rumors naturally got on the nerves of our citizens, to the extent that at a mass meeting held at the Market Hall on October 6, 1859, a company of volunteers was formed, with no other object in view than to fight Cortina to the last ditch. The company was called to duty the following day, but only about half responded to the call of their names. All the absentees offered a good excuse. 
Some had a bad toothache. Others had their wives or someone at home sick. Well, to make the story short, the captain of the company came to the conclusion that he would attack Cortina with what men he had under his command. He made a firing line speech to the citizens of Brownsville, requesting them to join their comrades that were ready to give up their lives in defense of their homes. A good many joined his command. The very next day, Captain Slaughter gave orders to march on the enemy. The Carmen Ranch is situated on the banks of the Rio Grande, about nine miles north of Brownsville. Cortina was informed about the movements amongst our citizens through the spies that he had amongst our tame Mexicans. So well were these spies organized, at the very morning, the secret orders were given for the company to move. Cortina was informed in less than a quarter of an hour, and in less than an hour, he was on his way to his ranch. He reached the American side at 11 o'clock and got his men ready to meet our attack. When our forces began their forward movement, it began to rain in regular torments. It seemed that fate was against us. It made the roads almost impassable to heavy marching. More especially, Mr. William Neal wrote, for those men who had to drag a piece of artillery, a six-pounder, through mud and slush. It took the company nearly two weeks to reach a point just one and one-half miles this side of the Carmen Ranch, where they met Cortina and his men. The fight lasted only about 15 minutes when a general stampede took place. Our fire eaters were in full retreat, abandoning everything they had in line of overcoats, blankets, and such other accoutrements that hindered them from putting more space between the Cortina forces and themselves. They even left the six-pounder cannon stuck in the mud just about two miles this side of the Garvin Ranch. Cortina and his men were very much elated over the easy victory they gained over the Americanos. But things were not to remain any longer. On the 5th of December, Major Heinzelman arrived in Brownsville and was joined by Colonel J.S. Ford, with homemade volunteers and Tobin State Rangers. These three men locked their heads together, and when ready, they fell upon Cortina and his forces at the Carmen stronghold, killing about three quarters of his command. The rest that managed to escape were pursued and met at Rio Grande City, where they were fully and completely annihilated. Chapter 10, Baghdad. Introduction. Baghdad, or Boca del Rio as it was called by the natives, was a small village on the south side of the Rio Grande, located near the point where it flows into the Gulf of Mexico. It was a primitive place, devoid of any comforts of modern civilization, and composed of a few jacales built on the low-lying fringe of beach that extended from the coast back to the sand hills that stretched to the west. In the 1850s, it was described as a wretched place, which bore no resemblance to the oriental town and the abode of Harun al-Rashid. Some reed huts, plastered with mud and oyster shells, gave shelter to a dozen Mexican families whose existence was a problem to me, for to a distance of 20 miles all around, there seems no trace of cultivation. Despite its poor location and lack of natural facilities, Baghdad served at various times as a port of entry for Matamoros and as an exit for the trade of North Mexico. Although Matamoros was situated on the Rio Grande, about 25 miles from its mouth, a bar across its entrance prevented vessels drawing more than six feet of water from ascending to the city. Consequently, it had to depend on Baghdad, although it was severely handicapped as a port because it had no breakwater or natural protection from the open gulf. To add to its limitations, a bar offshore prevented ships drawing more than four or five feet of water from approaching the harbor area. This meant that most ships were forced to stand off a considerable distance while lighters brought out cargo and passengers. During the winter months, when the gulf waters were rough, 
This situation caused long delays and also added to the expense and inconvenience of doing business at this poorly located outlet. The elder Mr. Neal operated a stage line from Baghdad to Matamoros from 1837 to about 1846, and again in the 1860s. In about 1846, the United States steamship line that had been making irregular calls at the port ceased to stop there and began to call at Brazo Santiago, north of the Rio Grande. The economic outlook was so bleak and business was so poor that Mr. Neal decided to discontinue his stage line. The United States Civil War brought new life to Baghdad, however, and for a few years it enjoyed great prosperity and at times feverish activity. After the beginning of the war, one of the first acts of President Lincoln was the issuance of a proclamation announcing the blockading of the entire coastline of the southern states. This blockade was not complete during the first year, but when sufficient ships were available to make it fairly effective, the South began to experience increasing difficulty in shipping its cotton to Europe to secure money to pay for the material which she needed so desperately to carry on the war. This situation created a great opportunity for the port of Baghdad because it suddenly became the back door for the Confederacy and the port through which flowed much of its foreign trade. This situation was possible because of the location of Matamoros and Baghdad. According to Article 7 of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, 1848, the Rio Bravo, or Rio Grande, was declared to be open to the vessels and citizens of both nations. The Union Navy could not ascend the river, however, because of the bar blocking its entrance. Furthermore, the Union or Federal forces only controlled Brownsville and the area between that point and the Gulf for a comparatively short time in 1863 and 1864. So with the Union forces unable to patrol the river and thus control the North Bank, and also unable to enforce its blockade south of the entrance of the Rio Grande, a steady and at times mighty stream of cotton passed through Brownsville and the upriver cities and villages and over the Rio Grande and out at Baghdad. Badly needed war supplies were thus enabled to enter at Baghdad and cross the river, which was under the control of the Confederates most of the war years, and eventually to reach the Confederacy. So the struggling port was not only revived, but overnight it was transformed into a roaring, boisterous boom town where fortunes were quickly made and as quickly lost. The cosmopolitan city of Baghdad was a veritable Babel, a Babylon, a whirlpool of business, pleasure, and sin. A common laborer could easily gain from $5 to $6 per day, while a man who owned a skiff or a lighter could make from $20 to $40. The gulf, for three or four miles out, was literally a forest of masts. Ten stages were running daily from Matamoros to Baghdad. Numerous shanties had been constructed on the sands out of unplaned boards. Some of these shanties were hotels, some billiard saloons, and others grog shops. The beach was piled high with cotton bales going out and goods coming in. The stores were numerous and crowded with wares. Teamsters cracked their whips in the streets and horsemen galloped hither and thither. The panorama looked like some magic scene which might have been improvised in a night. To the prosperity and activity caused by the Confederate trade, was added that which came as a result of the French invasion of Mexico in 1862. Beginning with the summer of 1864, the imperialist forces of Napoleon III held the port of Baghdad, and so the feverish activity continued. The exciting story of Baghdad has been told, in part, by many people, but few knew the place over the long period of time, as did the elder Mr. Neal. The following sketch is particularly valuable, for it records some of the aspects of this historic episode by a man who was there. In the early part of the year 1837, while I was in the city of Matamoros, Mexico, working in my trade as a painter, 
I conceived an idea of putting on a stage line between Matamoros and the mouth of the river, called by the natives Boca del Rio. After laying my plans, I naturally had to go to the port to see how things stood. At the same time, I wanted to make suitable arrangements toward making it comfortable for the passenger trade, as well as also to find a convenient place to establish my stables, and if necessary, to erect a hotel and to see about such other things that might have to be done in order to have an A1 stage line. As I have already stated, after having made all the necessary arrangements in Matamoros, I undertook my trip to the Boca del Rio, taking in my journey a very light ambulance for my conveyance. Since it had rained a little the night previous, not knowing how much it had rained, I went to the market to ask some of the vendors who live amongst the ranches down the river as to how the roads were on the line of my proposed trip. After hearing them all declare that the road was alright and that the rain was only a matapolvo, I made myself ready and started. After a tedious travel through mud and water from 8 o'clock in the morning until 7 o'clock in the evening, I covered the 23 miles. Upon arriving at the destination, the first thing I did was to look for a place to have something to eat for myself and my team of mules. After making inquiry, I happened to meet an individual who styled himself as Capitan del Puerto who, after a little chat, recommended a Doña Gregoria as one who kept an A1 place. I made a thorough investigation of the situation, and at last thought it was about time to take the necessary steps towards finding how much I was to charge to my expense account. So I approached the madam, and after making her a bow, I opened the conversation by asking her as to how much she charged per day for both board and lodging. She whirled around and, standing as if on one of her heels, she told me that I had to wait until her husband came home so as to find out whether he would consent to the lodging part. She made the remark that as far as the boarding part, there would not be any trouble. So in reply, I asked her how much was her price for a day's board. She told me that her price was 50 cents, and as soon as her husband came, if acceptable, she would let me know. I concluded at once to announce to the lady that I was hungry and wanted something to eat. To this she replied that she would have supper ready in about half an hour. So I concluded that I had to wait. While waiting, I saw an individual arrive who, as soon as he got to the door of the main hakal, where the light showed from the inside, I recognized my first acquaintance, El Capitan del Puerto, the very fellow that had recommended Doña Gregoria. Upon his arrival, he and Doña Gregoria bade themselves the hour with a kiss, and both started towards the back of a hut that had the appearance of a kitchen. There they stopped, and after a short conversation, both came towards the main house, where Doña Gregoria informed me that it was all right for me to occupy the room, which was well aired and well ventilated, having a window facing the south, which is the prevailing wind during the greater part of the year. I waited not only the half hour, which was her estimate to have supper ready, and it now had reached fully an hour, with nothing in sight. I asked her what her price was for a night's lodging, and she said it would be 25 cents. So I readily accepted her bid. After waiting another half hour, I again asked her about supper. To this she replied that supper would be ready just as soon as her errand boy would arrive with the meat bread, and sugar that she had ordered from her compadres at the Burita Ranch, situated about six miles from there. I almost decided to let supper slip and get to bed on an empty stomach. I had already given my mules their supper of both corn and oats and was about to turn in when I heard a fellow coming towards us, singing and smoking a shuck cigarette at the same time. This, Doña Gregoria informed me, was the boy and for me to have a little patience. At last, after another pause, I heard the lady say, Ya esta la cena, señores! With one bound, I landed on a chair as near the meat as possible, where I served myself to a good broiled chunk. I enjoyed my supper after all. After supper, I had about 15 minutes of conversation with the Capitan del Puerto, before bidding ourselves good night 
and going to our respective beds. I went to the hut, appointed to be my ventilated room, about which I found that the natives had told the truth. I found that the little hut had hardly any of the grass roof left, it having been blown off by the wind, and there remained dirty walls made out of bulrush reeds that at one time kept the wind and rain out, but now resembled the dilapidated appearance of a fish depository. The plastering which once withstood the winds was a thing of the past, as not a vestige was left on the walls to tell that there was once upon a time such a thing as plaster on the walls. The old lady, Nonga Gregoria, for the second time told the truth when she informed me that the room was well aired. Being tired and sleepy, I very soon went to sleep. I awoke just about sunrise, and to my great surprise, upon opening my eyes I heard the melodious voice of Doña Gregoria, who after asking in the usual custom as to how I passed the night, linked with Buenos Dias, good morning, informed me that the almuerzo, or breakfast, was ready. Upon receiving such good news, I hastened to wash my face and hands, and when ready, I sat down by the captain of the port and had the first breakfast, which really tasted good. The menu consisted of two fried eggs, a small piece of pork, and a large cup of coffee, which went down all right. I almost forgot to mention that at breakfast, she gave us tortillas de harina, which were surely appreciated by both the Capitan del Puerto and myself, to the extent that the Capitan del Puerto bellowed out loud enough so that Doña Gregoria could hear, ¡Ah, qué buenas están las gordas de harina! Parecen que los ángeles los hicieron. Which means, how good the flour tortillas are! It looks as if the angels made them. Upon finishing my breakfast, I took my mules to water and afterwards fed them. After getting through the usual preliminaries of the morning, I took a look at the huts that constituted the village. I made the acquaintance of some of the inhabitants, and found amongst them two fellows, or gents, who were customs house officers. After questioning me about my visit, and upon my being found all okay, both offered me their services. A las órdenes de usted! I then saw that the opportunity was now at hand, so I got into a sort of a powwow with both of them, and informed them what I proposed doing, that is, of establishing a stage line between La Boca del Rio and Matamoros, and therefore would need some good help. I wanted sheds built for both my horses and mules, as well as a large hut for both my stage and men to sleep in. I also needed two large corrales, etc. I finally told them that for the present, I would like to get two good men to build me a good, strong jacal, about thirty feet in length, with a grass roof. To my great surprise, both of them offered me their services. They even told me that they would quit the custom service and work for me. I found out during our conversation that they were getting thirty dollars a month, from which they had to feed their horses and themselves. I informed my friends that as soon as I got things in shape, that I would certainly call on both of them, which I did a few days prior to starting on my new enterprise. While I was talking house and sheds to them, I asked them both how much they would ask for building me a hakal thirty feet long. After a low talk amongst themselves, they came and told me that they would put me my hakal, ready to occupy for fifteen dollars, which I accepted and told them to go to work as soon as possible. I will aver that when I got everything in proper shape and started my stage line between Matamoros and the mouth of the river, I hired both of them, Antonio Villarreal, who I broke in as a stage driver, and Manuel Luna, who I put in as a roustabout, as he would sometimes take a turn and act as driver. I have never come across better Mexicans than these two natives, in all respects. They were both honest and good workers. Having made all the necessary preparations and other suitable arrangements, I proceeded to pay Doña Gregoria for my board and lodging, including the dinner that I was about to participate in. Dinner having been called, I sat in my usual seat, next to El Capitán del Puerto, who during dinner made a remark first about how delightful the weather was, and at the same time, in continuation of his delightful conversation, once more brought up the subject 
of what a good cook Doña Gregoria was, that nothing this side of Mexico City could beat her. I took it all in, and was extremely glad when he had to get up after having cleared everything that was brought before us. After dinner, I called Doña Gregoria and informed her that I was about to leave and I wanted to pay her for my board and lodging. She immediately said that I owed her ten bits, that is to say, one dollar and twenty-five cents, which I handed her, and at the same time, I slipped a dollar into her hand. Upon counting the money, she found out that she was one dollar over. She called my attention to it, but I told her that I did not make a mistake, that I tendered her the dollar as a gift, for which she thanked me over and over again. In after years, this woman, Doña Gregoria Herrera, turned out to be quite a valuable hotel keeper at the mouth of the river. I turned over to her all of the passenger trade that came my way. To give you all an idea of what kind of a place the mouth of the Rio Grande, the Boca del Rio, was, I can tell you all in a few words. The ranch was situated about three miles from the mouth of the river, almost surrounded by sand hills. The village consisted of nine huts, or jacales as they were commonly called, one being occupied by Doña Gregoria, two by the Capitan del Puerto, or one being for his official use and the other was a sort of stable and storehouse. Three other huts were occupied by the customs inspectors, two being used for their families and the other being used by both for stable purposes, and three other dilapidated huts were occupied by fishermen. That is all that existed of the Villa Boca del Rio from 1838 to 1840. After this time, things began to get better, especially when the steamers plying between New Orleans and Veracruz touched the mouth of the river and had to be unloaded of what freight was consigned to merchants doing business in Matamoros. The passengers had to be taken off the steamer by pilot boats owned and operated by John Webb, an Englishman by birth. This little movement brought a little excitement and improved things at the Boca del Rio, bringing a few of the working class and their families. As this little freight business was long times between, I got the natives to go into the fishing business, which also turned out to be a great help between the coming of steamers. From the year 1840 to the year 1850, Boca del Rio, Baghdad, grew up somewhat in population and had spread itself chiefly upstream, where it reached within two miles from the Burita Ranch. The population at the beginning of 1850 must have been in the neighborhood of 300 souls, consisting of almost all natives, with very few foreigners amongst them. I can safely put the foreign element to be about 15 souls. The usual traffic in commercial business crept on, going at times all well, and at others the reverse. In other words, during the summer months, business was good, owing to the fact that the steamers made regular trips and one could count on work in handing both freight and passengers that were coming either to Matamoros or to the interior of Mexico as far as the city of Zacatecas. But when the winter months came, there was no telling when we were able to get even near the ship. The northers would hit the steamer just as it reached off the mouth of the river, and sometimes would stay a week, dancing upon the angry waves of the sea. I have seen the times when the steamer was detained fifteen days out in the gulf, and then did not unload either freight or passengers, and had to put back either to New Orleans or Veracruz for coal. The delay surely put a damper on the situation, to the extent that about the latter part of the year 1856, there was nothing worth staying for where I had expected to make good money. To make matters worse, the steamer quit calling at the mouth of the river, claiming that it was a losing proposition. So I also had to quit and hunt other fields to make a living. Upon leaving the Boca del Rio, Baghdad, I went to my ranch at Santa Maria and started to work by entering on a different scale of an enterprise. One that I did not have the least of an idea of running, much less handling. I opened a retail grocery and dry goods store at a place almost opposite what in after years was known as the Borsa Bend of the Rio Grande. This 
together with my stage line to Point Isabel, under the management of my son, William Peter Neal, and with my trade as painter, netted me quite a good revenue. Owing to the civil war between the northern and southern states, commonly called the War of Rebellion of the southern states, the town, Baghdad, began to get some life, to the extent that in less than three months, it loomed up, as if by magic, into a thriving town. What helped to awake the slumbering burg was that the U.S. Navy of the northern states, having blockaded all of the Confederate seaports along the Atlantic and Gulf of Mexico coasts, as far south as Brazos Santiago's Texas, began to menace all the cotton trade that was still in the hands of the southern people, thereby leaving as the only chance to save their cotton from confiscation the risk of running the blockade and transporting their cotton for safety to our nearest neighbor, Neutral Mexico. Baghdad, being the neutral seaport in Mexico nearest to us, naturally fitted itself for the occasion. By the Treaty of Peace between the United States and Mexico, which was ratified and signed at Guadalupe Hidalgo, Mexico on the 2nd of February 1848, Article 5 of the treaty states that the boundary line between the two republics shall commence in the Gulf of Mexico, three leagues from the opposite to the mouth of the Rio Grande, otherwise called Rio Bravo del Norte. The nearest port to the United States, Baghdad, situated right across the Rio Grande, three miles from the coast, had the greatest advantage over all other neutral ports in Mexico. Hence, Baghdad became the goal of all the cotton blockade runners of the states bordering on the coast of the Gulf of Mexico. In order to make the enterprise a success, those interested procured light-draught sailing vessels, together with light-draught side-wheeled steamers that could hug the shore as near as possible so as to be out of range of the shells fired from the guns of the blockade squadron stationed off of Brussels Santiago and the mouth of the river. Very few of the light-sailing vessels were put out of commission. They generally got through safely. When General N.P. Banks' Red River Expedition arrived on the Texas coast, General Banks sent a squadron of heavy warships, together with quite a large number of transports, conveying some 7,000 men of all arms, together with supplies, which arrived at Brazo Santiago on November 1st, 1863. After very severe hardships, the army was finally landed between the 2nd and 10th of November on Brazos Island. After getting through with the landing of the troops, ammunitions, and supplies, all of the transports were sent back to the bases of operations at Galveston, Texas, leaving only the heavy war vessels, together with a few side-wheel steamers, as dispatch boats to carry on the blockade. The war vessels remained on the blockade duty for nearly two years, and accomplished nothing. All they did was to stand watch, look wise, and fire in reports to the Navy Department in Washington, D.C. Sometimes one could witness quite exciting times watching the race between the side wheel steamers, the blockade runners, and some of the small war vessels from the U.S., generally called dispatch boats. In this kind of race, I do not believe that there is one case on record wherein a U.S. vessel ever captured one of them. They all got through in port with their colors flying or were sunk, but the cotton was always saved. Sometimes one of the careless schooner captains ventured too far out and came within reach of the guns of the smaller U.S. war vessels, and by doing so would naturally draw their fire. As the gunners of these vessels were what is termed experts, they generally planted their shells into some part of the vessel that would either sink or destroy it. In one case that I witnessed while at the mouth of the Rio Grande, on the Mexican side in the latter part of March 1864, a full-rigged schooner named the White Swan came sailing along. Instead of hugging close to the shore as near as possible, she came in sailing too far out. There came the swan with her sails full, looking like a majestic bird, full and proud of her feathers. But suddenly... We all saw a small side-wheel steamer put out from under the stern of the heavy war vessels and make her way directly towards the swan. Just as soon as she got within the reach of the guns, we saw a puff of white smoke come out of her forward guns, 
The next thing we saw was a lot of flying timbers going through the air in all directions. The white swan listed to one side, and like a panoramic scene, the 18 bales of cotton, together with the crew, consisting of eight sailors, were all dumped into the gulf. The sailors took the situation with such coolness that they seemed to enjoy themselves. They swam around to where the cotton was floating, and each one picked a bale and made for the shore, pushing his bale before him. During all this time, the gunboats were firing shell after shell until the crew landed their precious bales out of the reach of the guns. Such courage is seldom witnessed. While all this scene was taking place, at about nine miles northeast of the mouth of the Rio Grande, all the beach on the Mexican side, for a distance of two miles, was lined with human beings, who during the excitement cheered, yelled, and shouted words of encouragement to their brave comrades. The excitement, which lasted nearly two hours, became so intense that some of the natives jumped into their small fishing smacks and sailed towards the scene of action to lend aid and assist their comrades in saving their cotton, which they did, but under tight circumstances. The old Mexicans living along the border, very often in their tales of woe, will repeat and refer to the period, which they term El Tiempo de los Algodones, which means in the time of the cotton and will tell a good many tales of adventure that they underwent in order to land the bales of cotton from the vessels as they lay perhaps eight or ten miles from the shore. One of the most exciting times that was experienced in this section during the Civil War was when Colonel Edmund J. Davis and Captain Montgomery were arrested at Baghdad, Mexico, while waiting for a U.S. government steamer to convey both of them to New Orleans, Louisiana. On March the 3rd, 1863, Colonel Chilton left Brownsville, Texas, and when he arrived at Clarksville, with his command consisting of about 80 men, he crossed over to Baghdad, Mexico, and there arrested both Colonel Edmund J. Davis, who was afterwards governor of the state of Texas, and Captain Montgomery, who was hanged a short time afterwards in the garrison of Fort Brown, near where the stables are now built. He was hanged to a mesquite tree. While in Baghdad, Colonel Chilton's command shot at some of the Union men that were also waiting to be transported to the northern states, for no other purpose but of extorting what money they had in their possession. After arresting Colonel Edmund J. Davis and Captain Montgomery, and bringing both of them to the Texas side of the Rio Grande, the Confederates put them in prison at Clarksville, Texas, and stripped them of their belongings. The Mexican authorities made a complaint to the commander of the Confederate Army stationed at Brownsville, Texas who immediately gave orders to release them. Colonel Chilton was shortly afterwards sent to Virginia. This uncalled for action on the part of Colonel Chilton was not endorsed by Colonel J.S. Ford, because Colonel Chilton had no authority to act in this manner. His excuse for doing so was nothing but a pack of falsehoods. All that Colonel Chilton wanted was money. Colonel Chilton's plea was that Colonel Edmund J. Davis with the aid of Captain Montgomery, was enlisting Mexicans who were to assist the Union forces that were on their way to capture Fort Brown under the command of Brigadier General E.B. Brown. Colonel Edmund J. Davis was turned loose and caught the steamer in time to reach New Orleans, Louisiana. Although the civil war between the northern and southern states brought to Baghdad what can be termed good times, Yet comparatively speaking, it did not amount to anything when compared with the times of the Bonanza that was brought on by the French invasion of Mexico. It was during this short epoch that Baghdad enjoyed what can be called wealth, and at the same time is what placed her on the map of the world. The French army that was operating around Cumbres and Puebla the first time found out that it had to combat Mexican soldiers that could fight and were ready to die in defense of their country. So it became necessary for the French government to send additional troops to back up their enterprise. While French troops were being landed at Veracruz, a squadron of French war vessels, together with quite a number of small gunboats, arrived off the bar at Baghdad on August 7, 1865. The 700 French soldiers were sent to Baghdad for the purpose of reinforcing General Tomás Mejía, who had not yet arrived in Matamoros. 
The French troops had to lie on Easy Street for nearly two months. At last, on the 29th of September, General Tomás Mejía arrived in Matamoros, bringing with him about 2,000 men of all arms. The French reinforcements arrived in Matamoros on the 8th day of October 1865 and were placed under the command of General Tomás Mejía. No sooner had the French fleet arrived off Baghdad when all at once, it seemed as if by enchantment, Hundreds of vessels flying the French tricolor flag made their appearance. Upon nearing the coast, after casting anchor, the French hired the Mexicans who had any sort of sailing vessel at their price. No matter what price was asked, it was generally accepted. The whole flotilla was nothing but a lot of merchants who hired and loaded their vessels with French goods and sailed in the wake of the naval vessels, and upon arriving at the port of destination, all wanted to land first. The commotion was something excitable. Transportation on the Mexican side of the Rio Grande was something hard to get. The merchants, finding themselves short of ox or mule teams, had to send Mexicans into the interior of Mexico, while others were sent to Corpus Christi to hunt and bring wagons or any other kind of vehicle that could haul freight no matter as to the quantity they could carry. All the merchants wanted to get to Matamoros as quickly as possible, regardless of expenses. I saw buggies that had the body and their seats taken off, and the rest consisting of the four wheels, made into a sort of light truck, capable of carrying a load of about 1,000 pounds weight. When the wild rush and commotion of all sorts of business fell upon Baghdad, as if by enchantment, it awoke from a sleepy hollow into an important city. All you could hear, both day and night, was the sound of the hammer and the buzz of the saw. Sometimes, through the noisy commotion, you could hear some hot-headed Frenchman yelling and piling on all the garzas that he could possibly bring upon the contractor's head, hoping that by doing so, he could hurry on the construction of his building. In most cases, the roof was put on long before the premises were finished. By doing so, the owner was enabled to store his goods that were perhaps piled amongst the sand hills covered by tarpaulin. Without expressing any exaggeration on my part of what I actually witnessed, I can safely aver that I have seen upwards of 100 vessels ranging from a 30-ton schooner to a 2,000-ton steamship anchored off the coast of Baghdad, all being lighter the best way they could, which in most cases was accomplished by light sailing smacks and small sailboats. Baghdad was at this time, as above referred to, simply an enchanted city rolling in wealth. Why, even a cotton handler was being paid as high as $2 per hour, and in some instances were paid as high as 3 and $4 per hour, especially when lightering a vessel far out at sea where the prevailing south wind would toss them towards the Texas coast within the range of the U.S. war vessels that would take a shot at them. But amid all the excitement, I don't believe I have heard of a bale of cotton or a package of contraband merchandise ever being captured by the U.S. naval forces. One can hardly imagine how so many mechanics of all kinds of trade work, from a boss carpenter to a flunky, ever got the wind or heard of the good times that were then prevailing in Baghdad. In less than three months, there were upwards of 200 of the best kinds of carpenters who found work at a good price per diem. Capital just came pouring into the boiling pot like hail falling from heaven. One had to get busy or starve as the commodities of living were sky high. A simple meal would cost you all the way from two to three dollars, while lodging would likewise cost you from five to eight dollars per night. Times were surely on the hum. All you could observe during the day from sunrise to the late hours of night were ox carts, wagons, and all other kinds of vehicles being loaded with all kinds of merchandise manifested for the interior of Mexico. 
Everybody was too busy to see or inquire how his next door neighbor was doing. It was simply work while the sun is shining. To give an idea of the exciting times that prevailed during the Russia Baghdad, I will recite one instance, which is as follows. A friend of mine by the name of Lafon, a Frenchman, one of the first to arrive a little before the general boom came on, had built a frame building called a California Batting House, having a 40-foot front by 60 feet long, which when erected cost him by contract $2,100. When the boom began to seriously blast, he sold the premises to another Frenchman for $12,000. Mr. Longano, who paid 12000 to Mr. Lafon, sold it to another excited Frenchman by the name of Arnaud for $18,000. All these transactions were negotiated inside of a week. A good many other buildings were sold at fabulous figures. The good times continued to prevail in Baghdad until the Maximilian Empire began to sway towards its end. And finally... The finishing touch came on the 7th day of October of 1867, when the great hurricane swept Baghdad off the map. When the rush came and awoke the old sand hills of Baghdad and things began to buzz, I happened to go to pay a visit to an old friend of mine, Mr. Rougier, in Matamoros, Mexico, where, after having had quite a chat with him, I ventured for the second time to put on a stage line between Baghdad and Matamoros. This was in the latter part of the year 1864. This time, I was fortunate in my enterprise. Of all my drivers, I found only Manuel Luna, in whom I had the greatest of confidence. Business got to rushing, so that I was compelled to have two stage lines going in order to accommodate the passenger traffic. I put the fare at $5 with one meal. Although I made up what I had lost in my first adventure, yet I felt that the rush would not last long, and it surely went down the minute the empire was tottering on its last legs, then the news reached us that the Southern Confederacy was at an end, that General Lee had surrendered with the Army of Northern Virginia to General U.S. Grant and that the Civil War was now over, and peace was once more established between the states. This change in the affairs of the world at large was naturally felt by those interested in business at Baghdad, for it did not take long to have the mainstay, cotton, which was the only medium towards making good business, taken away from Mexico and shipped direct to Europe, as well as to our northern markets where it found ready cash. Although business continued somewhat stagnant, yet there was business to be had in most every line on smaller scale than heretofore, and it continued while the Maximilian Empire existed, but when the empire was crushed, that put the finishing touch to the little hamlet of Baghdad. When I observed that a host of the merchants that infested the once prosperous little town were leaving, I also took off my stage line, as I could realize well that Baghdad was once more a thing of the past. While the Maximilian government was tottering on its last legs, an episode occurred to me while driving and bringing some passengers from Baghdad to Matamoros, which... I think is worth mentioning, as it cost the life of a poor sergeant in General Mejia's army. I left Baghdad early in the morning with a load of six passengers for Matamoros. All the passengers seemed to be delighted with the weather, and all were engaged in having a real good time conversation. We were nearing a ranch called Las Comas, when all of a sudden, the horses stopped. I turned around and told my passengers to prepare and have their firearms ready to defend themselves, as I thought that some of the river bandits, called by the natives rateros, might come and try to rob them of what they had. Just as I pulled my pistol out of its holster, I saw a man coming towards the coach. I hailed him. Just at that moment, I heard a shot which sounded to me as if fired by one of the passengers. At the same time that I heard the shot, I felt my hat fall off my head, 
and the soldier that was coming towards us picked it up and handed it to me. I thanked him and questioned him as to what he wanted, and he very nicely, with much politeness, asked us if we would be kind enough to give him a few cigarettes, as he was out of them entirely. I convinced the passengers and collected five packs and about ten dollars, which he at first refused, but upon being coaxed, he finally took them, thanked us all, and walked away towards his companions. I began to examine my coach as I wanted to know where the ball hit. I could not find the least sign of a bullet hole anywhere on the coach. I then pulled my hat off, and to my great surprise, found that the ball had hit the rim of my hat and gone through, but had hurt nothing. The passenger who had shot was a man whom I believe was scared, and his pistol went off accidentally. I can't forget the way that poor Frenchman begged my pardon. He simply went crazy. I told him that it was all right, and not to let such trifles prey on his mind, that it was an accident and nothing more. Before reaching Matamoros, I requested as a favor of the passengers that they not mention to anyone what had occurred, and they all promised me faithfully that they would not mention it to anyone. To my astonishment, about the third or fourth day after the occurrence, while I was at a breakfast, a lieutenant with a guard of two soldiers and a corporal called and handed me an envelope, which I found contained a summons to appear instantaneamente before a court-martial, which was being held at the general headquarters. I knew General Mejia well, and we were what can be called good friends. So I took my time in finishing my breakfast. When ready, I took my place on the left flank of the lieutenant, while the soldiers took the lead in front. That was done to let the people know that I was not a prisoner, but a person called to the general headquarters. Upon arriving and entering, I was met by the general himself, who, after tending me a good handshake, bid me to take a seat on a sofa, where we both sat and had a chat. When I asked him what I was called for, he told me that I was called to testify before a court of inquiry. When the door of the room where the court was in session opened, I immediately recognized the poor sergeant sitting on a bench, with two sentinels alongside of him. I was interrogated every which way, and gave my testimony through the interpreter, a Mr. Rafael de Soria, a well-known character in this vicinity. In giving my testimony before the board, I put it in such a way that I thought it prudent to help the poor sergeant. I was asked how many packs of cigarettes were handed to the accused, and I answered for a fact I did not know, but as to what I heard afterwards. I was then cautioned by the presiding officer not to mention any hearsay evidence. I then began to relate to the best of my knowledge all of what really occurred. I informed the court that it was a case of one friend asking another for a smoke, that friends furnished him with a smoke, and that was all that occurred. The presiding officer then asked me about how much I gave in money towards the sum handed the accused. I answered that I did not contribute one cent, that the passengers were all having a good time and feeling good, made up a purse which was handed him to buy cigarettes. I thought that my testimony was at an end, when I saw the presiding officer arise from his seat and approach me, stretching his hand, requesting me to hand him my hat. I then realized that some one of the passengers had let the tail out of school. The chief investigator took my hat, turning it over, observing a hole through the brim, and then asked me to be kind enough to explain to the court, giving in full detail how I got my hat shot that morning and what brought on the excitement that caused one of the passengers to shoot his pistol accidentally, coming very near to being effective to me. I informed him all about the mules stopping, and of my fearing that some of the rateros were in our wake and of my telling my passengers that all that had arms were to get ready to defend themselves against the rateros, which were very plentiful. Then all of a sudden, I heard a shot that sounded as if it had been fired from inside my coach. I felt my hat fall, but as I was not hurt, 
I thought it was the wind. I found afterwards that I had a hole in my hat, and afterwards I found out who the passenger was that, through nervousness, had accidentally shot his pistol. I took it as a joke, but I dare say it was a serious joke. I was then told to go into the next room. Upon entering, I found all of the passengers that were on the same trip. Only one was missing, a Spaniard who left the same day of his arrival for the interior of Mexico. Through the man who fired the accidental shot, the whole thing was aired. He related what had happened to his friends at the hotel where he was stopping, and the story finally got to the military. The second day after the trial, I heard that the poor sergeant was condemned to be shot. Upon hearing this rumor, I went personally to General Mejia, together with the rest of the passengers that were on that eventful trip, and I pleaded with him to spare the life of an innocent man. If ever there were men that felt bad with sorrow for what was to happen, we all were. I begged Mejia and assured him that I did it to save the life of a poor Indian. The general replied, directing himself to me individually, An army without discipline is no army at all. He was judged by the army, found guilty, and the sentence of the court must be carried out. The poor Indian was shot two days afterwards. Chapter 11, The Baghdad Negro Raid Introduction During the early morning hours of January 5, 1866, the small Mexican town of Baghdad was captured and sacked by a group of adventurers who were never positively identified. The fact that some United States soldiers took part in the raid made the subject of intense interest locally, nationally, and internationally. The United States Civil War was over, but a sizable force of Union soldiers was still stationed along the Rio Grande, either in temporary camps or at the various forts which had been built prior to the war at strategic spots along the river. At the beginning of 1866, several hundred of these troops were concentrated at Brazo Santiago, located on Brazos Island, and at Clarksville at the mouth of the Rio Grande, and directly across from Baghdad. These small bases were overcrowded with men, many of whom actually had little to occupy their time. Among these troops present were several hundred colored soldiers who were led by white officers. Complicating the whole picture along the river was the violent struggle raging in Mexico for political control of the nation. Maximilian, supported by the French, held much of the country, including Baghdad and Matamoros. Many of the people on the Texas side of the border were still sympathetic with Maximilian, despite the fact that the United States government was openly supporting Juarez and his liberal army. To add to this confused picture was the presence of a group of adventurers who appeared on the border, ostensibly to take advantage of the unsettled political conditions. The Daily Ranchero, published in Matamoros during these years, was a staunch supporter of Maximilian, as well as being intensely pro-Southern. Without any hesitation, this paper, which made no claims to being unbiased, announced that, that the United States troops, led by their officers, were responsible for the pillaging of Baghdad. On the other hand, the United States Army blamed the attack on a group of adventurers. The senior Mr. Neal was not in Baghdad at the time of this disturbance, but he was thoroughly familiar with the whole area, and after talking with several eyewitnesses, he recorded the observations of some people who were present during the event. On May 7, 1865, U.S. Grant issued orders to General Philip H. Sheridan to proceed from Washington, D.C. to Fort Brown, Texas, placing under his command about 25,000 men under Major General J.J. J. Reynolds, said army being composed of the 4th and 25th Army Corps. Amongst the army that was sent to the Rio Grande, there came also a part of the Negro troops that were attached to the 9th Corps, consisting of the 41st, 81st, 117th, and the 118th Burnside, together with two batteries of heavy artillery. The 81st and 118th were stationed at Clarksville and the balance at Fort Brown, Texas. Towards the latter part of the month of December 1865, a general order came from Washington, D.C. to disband part of the army stationed at Fort Brown, 
leaving only the 10th U.S. Infantry, three troops of the U.S. Cavalry, and the famous McAllister batteries of artillery. The first to be mustered out were the Negro troops, amongst them being the 81st and the 118th, who were both given orders to assemble at Clarksville and await transportation. Most of the white troops that were not mustered out were distributed along the Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, and California military posts, and at the various Indian reservations as far as the Indian Territory, now Oklahoma. I wish to state that I was not a witness to the Baghdad raid, and that I am not a person, or rather an individual, that likes to misquote actual facts simply because I was a Confederate officer during the Civil War. But I will say, and fully aver, that the persons that I got the information from were all very reliable individuals. As I have heretofore stated, the 81st and 118th Negro Regiments were mustered out and were both waiting for the transports to take them to the States. While passing their time loitering, the 81st finally asked their one-time colonel, Colonel Crawford, whether it would be permissible for them to cross over to Baghdad in order to see the town and buy a few things to take home. Upon receiving the permission, they commenced to get into groups, giggling and punching each other as they passed each other on the thoroughfare. Finally, during the night of the 13th of January, they were taken to a place about two miles upriver from Clarksville and were crossed to the Mexican side of the river in ferry boats. And on the morning of the 14th of January, 1866, they entered the town without molesting anybody. Upon reaching the center of the town, the business portion, they all made for the saloons and commenced to drink all sorts of drinks. Finally, some soldiers had got drunk and commenced to stop people on the street and demand from them money, which in most cases, they obtained. In other cases, upon being refused, they simply made a grab for watches or whatever jewelry they could get a hold of. While these apparent good times were going on, the balance of the soldiers that remained belonging to the 118th Regiment on the Texas side, upon wakening up in the morning and hearing the merry roar of their comrades from across the river, very soon came to the conclusion that they were entitled to some of the fun. So they all got together, and with one rush, they went to the ferry and took charge of all the ferry boats, together with all other boats that belonged to the private parties, including the ship Prince of Wales, that was seized by U.S. Customs. After several trips, they were all landed on the Mexican side of the Rio Grande. During the latter part of the evening, you could hear all sorts of noise, from a scream to a yell and an occasional shot. It was sure a hell of a place to be in Baghdad during this raid. Toward sundown, a few of the leading citizens of Baghdad crossed over to Clarksville, Texas, and called upon the commanding officer of the U.S. troops for protection and suggested to him to please send over a few armed soldiers and take charge of the men who were committing all sorts of depredations and who would like to burn up the town. The colonel was at the time sitting in his office having a chat with some of his subordinate officers. The empty bottles of French cognac, together with a few that still remained untouched on the mantelpiece, indicated that they were having a jolly time over the situation. After hearing the commission's request, he turned around and informed them that their request had to go through the regular channels, as he had no authority to send troops across to a foreign country. While the committee was holding the powwow with the U.S. officers, things were getting worse on the Mexican side of the Rio Grande. At last, at about half past six in the evening, a little after sundown, about 60 men bearing U.S. caps and arms appeared on the scene and mixed in with the crowd, and after a few drinks, joined their comrades in having a good time. Toward 10 o'clock, the fun really commenced. I should not say fun, but should say very hell commenced. A sort of a Mexican justice of the peace named Cayetano de Luna was called upon by some of his friends, as he could speak a little English, to go and talk to the Negroes and tell them that they could have all the fun they wanted, but not to shoot or hurt anybody, and that things would then be all right. The poor devil went to the small military square, where the greater number of saloons were situated, and on arriving, spoke to a good many regarding keeping quiet, etc. One of the Negroes with whom he was talking, and who was armed with a U.S. rifle, 
told the Justice of the Peace that he'd better go home and mind the babies and remain there. Otherwise, he could expect nothing but trouble. With this, the Justice of the Peace said something to another Negro sergeant, who was close by, and asked him to be kind enough to see that the soldier boys did not do anything that was against the law. With this, he started towards his home. Mr. Luna had hardly reached the end of the block when a Negro soldier ran out of the saloon and yelled at the Justice of the Peace to stop. He commenced to run after him, as if trying to reach him. Just then, one of the Negroes that was armed ran out and requested the other Negro to stop, and seeing that he could not stop, lifted his rifle and fired. He missed the Negro, but plucked the Justice right back of his head and killed him on the spot. This night, January 14th, 1866, was the commencement of the Baghdad Raid, which lasted 22 days. Mrs. Simmons, a widowed lady, informed me in a general conversation that we had about the raid that she was an eyewitness to a good many dreadful things that the troops committed during the raid. She told me that with her own eyes, she saw soldiers stop people on the street and take the finger and ear rings from some of them, her neighbors among them. She also claimed having seen four soldiers catch hold of a girl of about 16 years of age who sold grass for a living and throw her down. They ravished her right in the open street, acting like savage animals, to the extent that the poor Mexican girl died the following day. For 22 long days, this furious calamity was held over the heads of undefended poor Mexican people. Just to think what a heart strain there must have been to those who are compelled to stay behind closed doors of their homes without food, expecting each moment some of the Negro fiends to burst open their door and by brute force debauch their mothers, wives, or daughters. It surely must have been horrible, with no other hope, to look to for aid but divine providence. Years afterwards, I met a Negro sergeant by the name of Anton Frank, who belonged to one of the companies that composed the 81st Regiment at the time of its being mustered out, and who was one of the men who participated in the so-called raid. In a sort of conversational reference to the raid, he related to me what happened. He was mustered out together with the rest of the Negro soldiers that composed the 81st Regiment, and that after loitering around the town of Clarksville and its sand hills, waiting for transports to arrive in order to take them home, a lot of them put their heads together and thought it a good idea to go across the river and kill time, and at the same time, have a good time. By doing so, it would shake off the monotonous time that they were experiencing in their daily routine in Clarksville. But before making up their minds about going to Mexico, they thought it a good idea to ask Colonel Crawford whether it would be permissible for the discharged soldiers to go over the river. They received the information from Colonel Crawford that they were mustered out of the U.S. Army and that they were at the liberty to go where they damn pleased. After a little confab amongst the men, a lot of them concluded to vamoose across the river. They waited until nearly 10 o'clock p.m., on January 13, 1866, and all started to go up the river for a distance of two miles, where they were then told by their guide to stop and wait for two hours for a couple of boats that were being brought from an upriver ranch. At last, the boats arrived. They commenced to cross over to Mexico. What caused so much delay in crossing was that the two boats that were pressed into the service were badly constructed and could only carry about 20 men at a time. So those that crossed first had to wait until the rest got over. It took several trips to accomplish the feat. Finally, all got over at about half past three on the morning of the 14th of January, 1866. They arrived at the outskirts of the town of Baghdad at about half past five o'clock a.m., arriving just in time to see the doors of the saloons opening to receive their guests. They all, in mass formation, made for the nearest one. In fact, within ten minutes, all of the saloons that were situated in the main square of the town were filled with soldiers, all busy, calling for drinks. 
Sergeant Anton Frank told me that not one of the men that belonged to the 81st carried any arms on that trip. They all went to have a good time, which they did for a short time only. He admitted that he got drunk, and together with a few of the boys, went around town to see the girls of the town. They paid as they went along. After having quite a delightful time at a place near the outskirts of the town, they all returned to the center of the town, where the rest of the boys were. Upon arriving, they were very much surprised to find the number of soldiers had increased, and that things began to look rather squally. He went in and joined the crowd and began to fill up again. Amongst the boys that went over with him in the morning were several that could play the guitar and sing a good many songs. One of the saloons that they frequented was owned by an American named Jack Ellis. Mr. Ellis, he claimed, was a very nice fellow and took good care of the boys and would not let them get into a fight amongst themselves. Frank got him to borrow a guitar and together they went to see the girls that they had seen in the morning. They stayed there singing and having a good time until Frank thought it was about time to be getting either towards where the rest of the boys were or trying to get across the river the best way they could. They at last concluded to go where the rest of the boys were. This time he saw quite a number of soldiers just arriving, coming in from the west side of town. All joined the gang for a good time. Amongst some of the men who came over a little before sundown, he noticed some armed with U.S. pistols and others with U.S. rifles. He then approached a Negro sergeant, who seemed to have a lot to say, and after having a friendly chat with him, he found out that they had been sent over to try and get the boys over to the U.S. side of the river. But after the Good Samaritans got a few drinks under their belts, they also took a hand towards helping themselves to whatever they laid their hands on. <laughs> During that night, a few shots were fired, and after looting a few stores, they decided to cross over to the U.S. side of the river. They had four days of fun, during which time no one was hurt. They returned the same way they went over. A man by the name of Nick was the man that ferried them over the river both ways. Undoubtedly, this man, Nick, must be no other individual but Nicolas Porchas. During the melee that occurred in Baghdad, which lasted 22 days, according to James Klan, an eyewitness, the Negro fiends, having taken possession of the upper part of the town, committed the most horrible and brutal crimes against the poor, helpless Mexicans. Just to think what a time of suspense they had to undergo during the days that can be called a reign of terror makes one feel horrified. Just to hear that in some instances, both father and mother, perfectly helpless, had to see their daughters taken by brutal force and outraged before their eyes. It is too horrible even to repeat. Mr. Klon also related to me that when the armed Negroes appeared on the scene, all drunk and disorderly, he saw them all in one mass rush towards the San Carlos, and taking down the sign, they changed the name from San Carlos to U.S. Quartermaster Department. He also related that he saw a good many Negroes carrying all sorts of bedding and enter the hotel with it for the purpose of having a bed for themselves. The bedding that was carried into the hotel was taken from the homes of the people living in the residential part of the town. Poor Baghdad, that is the residential part, was gutted from top to bottom. All the clothing, bedding, and even kitchen utensils were taken to the Texas side of the Rio Grande where it was as quickly as possible disposed of, being in most cases sold to the Mexican element at any price. The hour of relief at last arrived. General Mariano Escobedo, who had just arrived in Matamoros, Mexico, from the interior of Mexico, had been informed of what was occurring at Baghdad, immediately rushed troops to the scene, but they arrived too late. The troops arrived in time to see the last boats being ferried across by the Negroes to the Texas side. They also saw all sorts of looted material piled sky high and safe on the American side of the Rio Grande. The Baghdad raid was such a disgraceful affair that during its occurrence, the good people of Clarksville entered a strong protest to the commanding officer's station at Clarksville, Texas, 
and at the same time sent a petition to Washington, D.C., protesting against such an outrage. All that was ever done was to appoint a committee to investigate the affair, take and submit evidence, and to report at as early a date as possible. But the investigation, as well as the investigating committee, turned out, as usual, a lot of red tape which wound itself up in nothing. The persons from whom I received the foregoing information regarding the Baghdad raid were the following who were present when the raid took place. Mrs. J. Larcado, Mrs. Simmons, Mr. James Klan, Mr. Antonio Martinez, Mr. Antonio Valente, Mr. William Penn. Chapter 12, Peñascal. Introduction. For several years after the United States Civil War, lawlessness increased along the lower Rio Grande. South of the river, Mexico was plagued by political instability, frequent revolutions, and the apparent inability of her officials to maintain law and order on her northern frontier. Brigands were able to cross the Rio Grande at hundreds of isolated and secluded spots, fan out over the vast expanse of territory that stretched as far north as the Nueces, gather cattle and or other livestock, and drive them south through the brush, which reached back from the Texas bank of the river, recross that stream, and dispose of their booty in Mexico. By the mid-1870s, the area between the Nueces and the Rio Grande was aflame with violence. During the April 1874 term of court in Brownsville, Judge Doherty, 15th Judicial District, issued the following order. Considering the circumstances existing in the country between the Rio Grande and Nueces rivers, and the danger of traveling in said section, it is ordered by the judge of this court, now here, that the sheriff be authorized to employ 14 men as guards to enable him to convey the eight convicts sentenced at the present term of the court to the state penitentiary. The grand jury for the May 1875 term of the district court held in Brownsville reported that they had returned 16 bills of indictment, and furthermore, since the last term of court, that insecurity of life and property had been daily increasing to such an extent that no honest person feels safe in traveling the public highways of the county. In May 1874, a party of bandits appeared at Peñascal, a small village located about 60 miles south of Corpus Christi, and murdered four men. Feeling that these acts must be avenged, a group of citizens from Nueces County formed a vigilance committee to attempt to punish those responsible for these acts. A climax seemed to be reached in the spring of 1875, when a group of ruthless raiders attacked the small settlement of Nueces Town, a few miles west of Corpus Christi. The people living at Peñascal had not long been suspected of smuggling of various types. It was rumored that they were being supplied with goods from Rio Grande City or Mir, Mexico. This community was well located for this type of activity, for its inhabitants could cross the shallow water of the Laguna Madre and reach Padre Island with little effort. After crossing the island, they had direct connection with the open gulf. Peñascal was viewed by some of the neighboring ranches as a concentration point for many undesirables, therefore a menace to the surrounding cattle business. In the mid-1870s, the whole village was destroyed by a group of men whose identity was never clearly determined. The younger Mr. Neal secured the story of its destruction from several of those who were eyewitnesses to the affair, or who visited it immediately after it was burned. The Peñascal butchering and arson affair has been for some time placed in the annals as a thing of the past. I beg to submit the following statement that one of the older chief mayordomos of the King Ranch made to the writer, William A. Neal, during a conversation. Don Luis Gutierrez served in the employment of Mr. King for nearly 40 years, in various grades, from a simple cowboy to chief mayordomo, or overseer, in which capacity he was when the Lord called Mr. King away. He served Don Ricardo faithfully until his last breath, but when the captain died, he was fired. During the days of his employment, a very sad affair took place at the Peñascal Ranch, now situated in the La Parra Pasture Company owned by the Kennedys. 
You must remember that the cattle ranges were all held as almost everybody's land. So unequalized were the holdings that the large tract owners had a law passed in the state of Texas legislature that compelled each landowner to fence his land in. This was done to protect the large landowners. The reason this was done was on account of some small landowners who probably owned two sitios of land and would have some 3,000 head of cattle grazing on 8,000 or 9,000 acres. For instance, take Mr. Ramirez who owned the Bobada Ranch. He probably owned 10,000 or 12,000 acres of pasture land, yet he had probably 30,000 head of cattle and about 50 manadas of horse and mule stock. Then there was my compadre, Don Cheno Cavazos Rivas, who owned some 15,000 acres of land, who probably had some 6,000 head of cattle and horse stock. And such was the case until the law was passed by the legislature of the state of Texas, compelling all owners of land to fence in their lands. This, I think, was a very wise and just law that placed all concerned on the same level. The Peñascal Ranch, during the time that I have reference to, consisted of quite a good number of well-constructed houses and a few jacales, and enjoyed a population of some 500 souls. The menfolk were mostly cowboys who were employed by cattle owners in rounding and branding cattle. With the consent of a good many of the principal owners, Captain King fenced the whole of the Caricitos tract. While the fencing was going on, the ranchers of the Peñascal Ranch commenced to go into the cattle business and were stealing cattle from all owners right and left. The stolen cattle were crossed over to Padre Island and there sold to buyers, Spaniards, who embarked them to Havana, Cuba. This was a nefarious business and ranchers who were missing a good many cattle began to make complaint to the county authorities, but nothing was done. All proceedings against them went on the manana business, with promises being made by the civil authorities that never materialized. People got disgusted. In view of the condition of things, several of the old rancheros who owned a good deal of cattle called upon Captain King at his Santa Gertrudis ranch and had a confab with him about the conditions of things and wanted his advice. Don Luis Gutierrez declared that in his presence, King told them to go to Brownsville and have the sheriff deputize some of their best men and lay for the thieves and arrest them and have them sent to the penitentiary. They took his advice and got some 20 of their men appointed as supernumeraries. These came back on the range clothed in full authority of the law. All came to Captain King to receive instructions. He repeated in the same systematic way that he had advised their bosses. All understood what was to be done in compliance with the law. Somehow or other, Captain King saw a fellow by the name of F. Robles, who seemed to have more to say than the rest, and he advised the crowd that they should choose a leader, and at the same time suggested this fellow as the man. All approved the idea, but before leaving the Santa Gertrudis ranch, Robles called upon Captain King. It is said that he asked Captain King that if he got into trouble in arresting anyone whom he caught stealing cattle, ending in someone's being killed, would King stand by the deputies? Captain King told him that he would see them justified. That was all that passed. It wasn't a month before we heard of the Peñascal Ranch being shot and burnt off the face of the earth, and that F. Robles was the leader of the gang. Captain King, upon hearing what had occurred, sent for Don Luis and gave him instructions to take a few men and go to the Peñascal Ranch and bring him a full report of what had occurred. Together with five men, Gutierrez went directly to the Peñascal. There he was amazed to see the whole ranch, nothing but ashes. The only thing to be seen was the brick chimneys standing like sentinels, overlooking the vast destruction of property. In going over the situation, he met several of the women folk who gave him such information as they had gathered from others, but which was of no use. He came across an old friend by the name of Don Antonio Aleman, and from whom he had obtained what actually occurred. It appeared that at about two o'clock in the morning, while most of the ranch were in slumber, expecting nothing, all at once they heard a great deal of yelling and shooting. At the same time, flames began to arise. 
Aleman stated that he saw several individuals almost naked with lighted torches going from house to house, setting fire to the grass roofs. All of those that were on horseback were naked and were painted in different colors. He escaped together with a good many women, girls and boys. Mothers carrying their children followed him through the brush until they got to the Cabilo Ranch, where they met a good many of their friends who had arrived there earlier. He borrowed a horse and was on his way to La Parra when he met Gutierrez. Both of them went to Santa Gertrudis and reported to Captain King all they had seen and heard. The grand jury sitting at Brownsville examined the whole affair and indicted a good many that undoubtedly were connected with the affair. But like all such cases, not one was tried. Our worthy citizen, Mr. W.O. Rachel, who kept a general store at the Peñascal, happened to be away from the ranch at the time of the raid, but stated that he had heard from reliable sources that among those that had engineered the raid were some of the very men that were on the ranch, who afterwards showed up with wonderful stories. Some of these men were disposed of during the McNally campaign against the evildoers that infested the borders of the Rio Grande. Regarding the person who posed as a leader of the murderous gang, blame has been placed on several of the young ranchmen, among them being Clemente Vasquez of the Chilipin Ranch, Antonio Aleman of the Saltillo Ranch, and Juan Garza of the Yescas Ranch, who at the same time lived on the Peñascal Ranch. But as the state authorities failed to pin the crime on any of them, the case went by default. Many years later, a woman claiming to be the widow of the real perpetrator declared in conversation that her husband was the one who led the men that participated in the raid. She furthermore stated that they stripped themselves of all clothing at the Mogote de la Cabra and hid their nakedness by a tapaojo and painted themselves with lamp black and red sand mixed with flour paste. Joaquin Trevino for a good many years served the city of Brownsville on police duty. During one of our several conversations about the Peñascal affair, Trevino related what really brought on the total destruction of both lives and property of the noted ranch. In reference to the burning of the ranch, he stated that he was living at the ranch when it occurred. He was at the time working when employed by either the king or La Para owners, such as rounding cattle or overseeing the wire fence that had just been constructed around both pastures. There is no use trying to deny that the great majority of men that lived at the Peñascal Ranch were nothing but a set of cattle thieves. Trevino, who often went riding around the king pasture fences, could plainly see by tracing the tracks of cattle through places where they had lowered the wires and passed the cattle, which in most times led to the lower end of the Peñascal land. He also knew that the cattle were being passed on homemade chalanes, or flat boats, over to Padre Island, but to go and offer information would have been death to him. He did once mention to Don Luis Gutierrez in a sort of joking way that it was better to raise cattle over a fence than to raise them in a pasture, <laughs> that it was easier and cost less. Don Luis commenced to ask him several questions, but he remained mudo because there was a sort of rumor going among the ranchmen that Don Luis was doing some private stock raising with some of the leading men of the ranch. So he kept his mouth closed as tight as an oyster. The night of the raid, Trevino was sound asleep, when all of a sudden, he was awakened by his mother, and upon getting out of bed, he heard a lot of hollering and shouting, and at the same time, an occasional shot. He next saw the whole of the ranch was on fire. He immediately took his folks and beat it to a nearby ranch, where they arrived somewhere near 10 o'clock the following morning. While getting prepared to leave the Peñascal, he stepped out into the yard and clearly saw by the immense fire that the whole ranch was being burnt by men, most of whom were entirely naked and painted with black and red stripes. There were, as near as he could judge, about 100 of them. He also claimed that some of them had coal oil cans, from which with a tin cup, they could dip into the oil can and get a cup of oil, which they would throw over the grass roofs and set them afire. Soon the whole roof was on fire. He claimed that he did not know any of the offenders. 
All that he did observe closely was that most of them were full of mezcal and drunk, and furthermore, that they were all armed. Laughingly, Joaquin would state when among friends that he really believed that the Peñascal affair was what saved him from joining the band of cattle thieves. Chapter 13, Porfirio Diaz in Brownsville. Introduction. For a period of 35 years, from 1876 to 1911, Don Porfirio Diaz dominated the political life of Mexico. He and Benito Juarez were natives of the state of Oaxaca and cooperated in the effort to defeat Maximilian and to expel the French during the 1860s. Diaz's rise was rapid, but when the foreign intruders were finally driven out in 1867, he was eclipsed on the national scene by Juarez. He retired from public life and returned to his native Oaxaca, where he lived in semi-retirement for a short time after 1868. However, during these years of apparent political inactivity, he maintained constant contact with the opponents of Juarez, and soon he headed a formidable force of malcontents. Diaz opposed Juarez for the presidency in 1870, but since neither of the three candidates, Juarez, Diaz, nor Lerdo, received a majority of the votes, the election had to be decided by Congress. Juarez was declared president on December 1, 1871, while Lerdo became president of the Supreme Court. Diaz and his followers revolted and promptly announced the Plan of Noria, which, among other things, denounced the re-election of Juarez. This revolt was suppressed, but before Juarez could enjoy the fruits of his victory, he died suddenly on July 18, 1872. Lerdo de Tejada became the provisional president and then was elected for a full four-year term in the fall of 1872. Diaz took advantage of a general amnesty law passed by Lerdo and traded his military titles for a pardon. It was during this period that Diaz was elected to the National Congress, and the years 1874 to 1875 saw him continuing his efforts to regain some of his former power. He was reported to have left Mexico City in the latter part of 1875 for New York for the purpose of putting his children in school. However, he sailed to New Orleans instead, and after remaining there for a short time, he and some of his friends appeared in Brownsville, Texas. Here, headquarters were established and plans were begun for an attempt to overthrow President Lerdo. The Diaz party remained in Brownsville for several months, perfecting their plans to oust the Mexican president. And finally, during the last few days of March 1876, they crossed the Rio Grande and captured Matamoros with little opposition. The following selection was written by the younger Mr. Neal and is particularly valuable because as a young man of about 19 and as an employee of a business firm that handled part of the shipment of munitions Diaz used in the capture of Matamoros, he took part in one phase of this event. General Porfirio Diaz came to the Texas frontier in the latter part of November 1875. He came to the city of Brownsville in December 1875 and remained totally unknown to anybody. At the time of his arrival, he was accompanied by General Manuel Gonzalez and an Italian who afterwards turned out to be chief of artillery. They first rented the Ward House, which had been built by Mr. William Neal, who removed the house to the north corner on the alley on 14th Street between Elizabeth and Washington Streets. It happened that Mr. Solomon Ashheim bought the premises on which the ward house was situated and requested its occupants to move as he intended to build a brick structure on the site. They had occupied the place fully for three months before anyone knew who they were, much less their errand. All was in perfect silence. The rain actually poured into the house for want of shingling, and they moved into the Manuel Trevino home, now owned by the family of Dr. A. S. Wolf, situated on Washington Street, where they received callers. On January 2nd, 1876, quite a number of notable Mexican people were seen calling on Don Porfirio Diaz, and amongst the many, Don Baltasar Fuentes Farias called also. But everything was carried on in silence to the extent that nobody paid any attention to what was going on, 
not even being suspicious that they were up to a revolution. All was quiet on the Rio Grande. Quietly, Don Porfirio Diaz commenced to obtain funds from his friends. Don Salas Cavazos donated money, and some of his interior friends contributed liberally towards financing the revolution. While the process of time was going on quietly, Don Porfirio Diaz, together with Manuel Gonzalez and the station officer, would call very often at the office of the firm of Bloomberg and Raphael and hold conferences with the head of the firm. Naturally, the writer, William A. Neal, who was a salesman of the firm, had to adopt the system of a clam, that is, with his mouth shut, to what was going on. The object of their visits, to obtain arms, was finally accomplished through the firm of John P. Moores and Sons of New York City. Among the many visitors that frequented the house, where Don Porfirio Diaz had established a sort of headquarters were Don Miguel de la Peña, F.J. Ankin, and Magdaleno Flores, all three well-known characters. Coronel Miguel de la Peña had served as a colonel under the Mexican Empire of Maximilian. Colonel Ankin had served in the Union Army in the Civil War. And Magdaleno Flores, a man of great grit, had been connected with all the revolutionary movements and had a great deal of influence among the Native Americans on the Mexican frontier. It was on these three men that Don Porfirio Diaz relied to enter Mexico. On the morning of March 7th, 1876, while General Porfirio Diaz was recruiting men on the Texas side of the Rio Grande for the purpose of overthrowing the Lerdo de Tejada government in Mexico, General Toledo, who was then the commander of the Northern Division of the Lerdo Mexican Army, with its headquarters station in Matamoros, Mexico, upon being informed of what General Diaz was up to, ordered a piece of artillery, a 12-pound Napoleon gun, to be placed at Santa Cruz Point, which is situated right opposite the city of Brownsville, Texas, almost in line with the public ferry. Upon seeing what the Mexican authorities were doing on their side, a few of the leading citizens of the city got together and called upon the commanding officer of Fort Brown and entered a complaint against such uncalled-for proceedings. The major told the spokesman of the committee that he would take it up immediately with the military headquarters of his division. While this controversy was going on, Mr. William Neal and a few of our old citizens got together and procured a couple of old cartwheels and an old piece of stovepipe, and during the night placed the same pointing to the Santa Cruz, together with a big red flag and a lot of old pumpkins piled up, representing required ammunition. When the following morning made its appearance, the old sham gun looked defiant. In less than an hour, there were upwards of 5,000 souls from both Matamoros and Brownsville down at the ferry landing to see the sight. Oh, it was a peach. General Toledo sent a communication to the Mexican consul, Don Manuel Trevino, protesting such a gross insult. The Mexican consul called upon Major Miriam and entered his complaint, whereupon Major Miriam sent a guard consisting of about 20 men and threw the whole outfit into the Rio Grande. While things were getting along quietly, a Morgan steamship of the Southern Pacific Line arrived, loaded down with what resembled dry goods cases. All were stored in the Rio Grande Railroad storehouse. They were rather heavy, but not a box showed its contents. While all this was going on, some of Don Porfirio Diaz's friends got in touch with the undercommanders of the Mexican army and bought them out completely. The army at Matamoros was fixed so that all Don Porfirio Diaz had to do was enter without firing a shot. The foregoing deal had to be done in such a way that it required the utmost non-suspicious manner because the garrison was commanded by two officers, General Toledo and Coronel Cristo, who were people, I should say, entirely faithful to their government and could not be bribed with money or promises. These two commanders, together with Don Francisco de la Barra, known for his strict fidelity, who was then the collector of customs for the Northern District of Mexico, were the stones that Don Porfirio had to contend with. But reader, what can three do against nearly 3,000 that sold themselves? Not themselves, but their honor. All at a sudden, while things for the invasion of Mexico were getting prepared, 
and the fixing of the enemy was going on, the news reached the ears of the Diaz faction that an order was on its way to arrest Don Porfirio Diaz and his followers. All got on the move, but none of the leaders got frenzied over the situation. All went on quietly, without a murmur. On March 11, 1876, news was received that the U.S. government had ordered an urgent investigation into what these revolutionary chieftains were up to. Those interested began to get a little uneasy and began to get a move on themselves. General Diaz was spirited away during the night of March 23, 1876, to Baltasar Fuentes Farias Ranch, which is situated about three miles below Santa Maria. General Manuel Gonzalez went to one of his relatives, who had lived in Brownsville for a good many years, Pepe Joseph Cantu, where he remained in hiding until the night of March 27th. General Manuel Gonzalez, together with a few friends, went up to the Santa Rosalia Ranch, where he awaited for orders. The writer cannot forget the night of the quick move. I was called from my home, close on to 10 o'clock, and told to go and deliver the strange boxes that were stored in the railroad warehouses, which I did with care. When I arrived at the railroad depot, there were all sorts of conveyances ready. I lost no time, and as fast as I could, I loaded five carts and sent them off to where they had to go. All these sinews of war were shipped to Baltasar Fuentes Farias' ranch under the strictest silence and secrecy. By five o'clock, Every box was on its way, and all arrived safely. The strangest thing that I observed when returning home was at the premises where Don Porfirio Diaz and his followers had made their headquarters. The doors and windows were all open. A light was on a homemade center table, and an old Mexican whom I knew well was there. When I saw such a strange view, something egged me to go stop and to make an inquiry. I hailed Don Julio, and I asked him what had become of the crowd, and he laughed and said, Ya volaron! They have flown. On March 27th, the deputy U.S. Marshal, Mel D. Kirkpatrick, was looking for the whole gang with warrants of arrest. But no Diaz was in sight, for he had disappeared. By the following evening, the whole cargo of arms and ammunitions were on the Mexican side of the Rio Grande, at a ranch called by the natives La Palma, where there were at least 2,000 men congregated to receive arms and their necessary ammunition. Before morning, they were ready, and all started on the go. The only loss sustained took place when a small detachment of men, sent under the command of Coronel Magdaleno Flores, to investigate a report that the Reynosa commanding officer was sending a force of soldiers down the river to intercept his crossing, failed to meet such a command. While scouting among the ranches, they came across a few mounted customs officers who fired one volley, which ended the life of Coronel Flores. Coronel Miguel de la Peña went with a force of 500 men and took Camargo, while Colonel Enkin, an American, attacked and captured Mier. Both Peña and Enkin not only took both towns, but also enlisted a good many of the natives. These were sent to General Diaz who upon receiving such a large number of recruits, pushed on to Matamoros, which he entered on April 2nd, 1876. When he took Matamoros, everything was fixed. General Toledo pulled his freight without firing a shot. Toledo, upon being informed that the revolutionists were advancing, ordered his officers to get the army in proper position to meet the enemy. The officers left the headquarters, laughing and giggling over the command. General Toledo, seeing that his orders were not being obeyed, took his troops out of the city limits and placed them in position to meet the enemy. But he soon saw that they had been tampered with, especially when the soldiers commenced to sing La Golondrina. He put spurs to his horse and pointed his nose toward Monterrey, and has not even been heard from since. He left without even saying, Adios. The only one who had made a slight resistance was Coronel Leonides Cristo, who was stationed at the Casa Mata, the powder magazine, with a few men. After his men had fired a few blank shots, he surrendered. General Diaz refused to accept his sword. 
After the war, Coronel Cristo was appointed by Diaz as collector of customs of the port of Tampico. He was stone deaf, but a brave man. After Coronel Miguel de la Peña and Colonel Enkin had captured Camargo and Mier, they were both ordered to join the main army. It was on their way down that the city of Reynosa fell into the hands of the revolutionists. Diaz remained in Matamoros about a month, which he spent in organizing his army, after which he went to and captured the city of Monterrey, Nuevo León. Chapter 14, Captain L. H. McNally. Introduction. The region between the Rio Grande and the Nueces in the 1870s became a veritable battleground, with the local citizens pitted against groups of mounted raiders who ranged far and wide over most of the area. Some contended that the presence of General Juan Cortina along the border during these years was responsible for this turmoil for Cortina allegedly was supplying the Cuban cattle market, and the region to the north afforded a good source for his needs. It was also alleged that another reason for this situation was the fact that the officials along the Mexican side of the river not only knew of these wholesale thefts, but in some cases even condoned these practices. It was pointed out that in this area, a large majority of the population had been in Mexico or was of Spanish-speaking extraction. It was claimed that many of these people were reluctant to testify against these armed raiders, allegedly from south of the Rio Grande, thus making their apprehension and conviction more difficult. This fear was not restricted to the Mexican-born ranchers, but also extended to all stockmen of the region, for many either abandoned their holdings or employed armed guards to protect their property. Another explanation for some of this violence was the fact that during this period, a person could declare his intention of becoming a United States citizen, and after a year of residence in Texas, he could register as a voter. Many people along the border took this first step and went no further towards establishing citizenship. There was a large floating or squatter population which fell into this category, and when and if they got into trouble, they would fly to Mexico and then claim exemption from extradition to the United States because they were Mexican citizens. On the other hand, because of these circumstances, Mexico claimed that the majority of those doing the raiding were citizens of the United States, and that therefore Mexico was not responsible in any way, nor could she do anything to correct the matter. The constant marauding not only interrupted the business of the area, but it caused ill feeling on both sides of the Rio Grande, to the extent that finally the United States government became concerned over the events. There followed many frantic appeals and petitions for help by the citizens of the region, and these were followed by investigations, the appointment of commissions, and subsequent reports by both the state and national authorities. The multitude of these studies testifies to the seriousness of the problem and the concern which it aroused. The situation became so critical that in 1875, the governor of Texas, Richard Koch, sent Captain McNelly to the lower Rio Grande in an attempt to halt these depredations. McNelly's methods were sometimes harsh, but they evidently secured the desired results in most cases, for soon thereafter, much of the violence ceased. The following selection presents some sidelights on the conditions in the region and the activities of McNelly and his men. The years that intervened between 1872 and 1877 were really what can be called years of terror, when a man's life was only worth his backbone. That is, his life depended on how quick he was on the trigger. In making this expression, I do not mean that the whole communities inhabiting the border towns were on the rampage. I simply mean that all had to be on the lookout and alert when being out at night or when traveling through the high roads of the county. Great precaution had to be taken on account of the lawless element of banditism that roamed all along the frontier, bordering on both sides of the Rio Grande. Many a good man was sent to the silent land by these ruffians. I will mention a few of these that met their limit of time on Mother Earth. Mr. Joseph Alexander, 
senior member of the firm of Messrs. Alexander & Co., engaged in wholesaling dry goods, while on the way to Rio Grande City on business, in company with Mr. Henry Simeon, a friend, was killed near the Relampago Ranch in Hidalgo County by Francisco Perez, alias Chicon, for no cause whatsoever. He was just simply shot down for the sake of shooting. This Chicon Perez was the head bandit of a band of cattle thieves that General Cortina had operating under his protection. The account of the affair was told by Henry Simeon as follows. On the invitation of my compadre, Mr. J. Alexander, to accompany him on a short trip to Rio Grande City, which I accepted, we started, leaving Brownsville about 5 p.m., so as to travel at night, it being cooler than to travel through the red-hot sun during August. We traveled all the former part of the night, stopping at only one ranch. After taking coffee and a smoke there, we started up river, having a fine time in conversing about when we were young men. The moon shone brightly, making everything almost as distinguishable as in daytime. We traveled at a moderate speed and got to the outskirts of the Relampago Ranch, where we slowed our gait. We came across some families that were coming from a fandango that had taken place near the center of the ranch. We had already crossed the dance grounds when all at a sudden, a man came riding up and placed his horse right across our team. He ordered us to halt, which we did. He then came alongside of us, and we both recognized him as Chicon Perez, a noted criminal and the little finger of General Cortina. Mr. Alexander spoke a couple of words to him, and bidding him so long, requested the driver by the name of Balboa to drive on. The horses had hardly started when this Perez came right up with his revolver in hand, and upon reaching the side where Mr. Alexander was seated, fired the shot which took effect. Mr. Alexander was instantly killed. Upon killing Mr. Alexander, Chicon Perez would have continued killing the rest of us, but our driver knew where Mr. Alexander had put his pistol and got possession of it, jumped from his seat and fired one shot at Chicon Perez, who immediately put spurs to his horse and made for the river, swimming to the Mexican side. Such was the fate of one of the finest gentlemen that adorned the frontier. Amongst the many others who lost their lives by the hands of Mexican bandits were George W. Fulton, who with his clerk by the name of Leal, was assassinated at his ranch called El Saus in Hidalgo County near the San Juan Sugar Plantation. Mr. H. Bishop was killed a short time afterwards in the same store in which Fulton and his clerk were killed. Mr. Bishop, who had bought the store from the relatives of Mr. Fulton, was doing quite an extensive business. One late afternoon, three men entered his store and, looking over the shelving where yardage goods were displayed, requested him to please show them a particular piece of calico. As he turned around to get the calico, he was shot in just the same manner that his predecessor was shot. Mr. Bishop lived almost 12 hours after he was shot. William McMahon, school teacher teaching school at the Yescas Ranch, while on his way from Brownsville to the Yescas Ranch, was met by a gang of cattle thieves under the leadership of a young bandit by the name of Jose Maria Olguin. Upon coming across poor Billy, they must have requested him to come along with them, and he did so voluntarily, undoubtedly thinking that they wanted some information as to what he heard was going on in town. They received the answer that all was quiet. The victim was asked when the rangers were expected, and he replied that he did not know. One of the bandits told him, I'll make you know. They then took poor Billy about two miles on the road leading to Point Isabel, and upon reaching a mott consisting of mesquite the timber, made him dismount. The bandit then repeated his question and received the same answer. He told the poor Billy, since you refuse to tell us, we'll hang you. With this sentence, Billy asked him to inform his family where his body could be found so that he could be buried in the Brownsville Cemetery with the rest of his family. Upon hearing Billy's request, the outlaw jumped on his victim like a tiger 
and with the assistance of another cutthroat, plucked out both of his victim's eyes. After this was done, he had poor Billy tied up both hands and feet. He then ordered two of his men to cut both of his feet off, which was done. He then took the bleeding body of his victim, and lifting him up, at the same time kicking him, tried to get him to dance on the stubs of his footless legs. At this moment, one of the men came forward and fired a shot through their victim's head, ending the sad affair. The foregoing narrative was told by one Librado Mendes, alias La Lisa, who was one of the gang to a good many people while he was in Matamoros. Among the many who heard him were Mr. Charles Nordhausen and Mr. Rafael Crespo. La Lisa further stated that after they had done away with the old schoolmaster, he quit the gang, claiming that he was not hired by the Bas Cortina to kill people in such a manner, that he was hired only to steal cattle from the Americanos. Such, dear reader, were the conditions of our Mexico-Texas frontier. A man's life was surely carried in his hands. There was no telling when one of these cold-hearted murderers would kill you for 50 cents. But time had to change, and it did change when Captain Lee H. McNelly, with his company of Texas Rangers, came to the border. At the request of the citizens of the border counties, the governor of the state of Texas sent Captain L. H. McNelly of the state ranger force to the frontier. In sending Captain McNelly to the frontier to put down the lawless murderers, cutthroats, and cattle thieves that infested this section of the state, he was empowered with what is called a carta blanca, so as to be able to act right on the spot and not wait on grand jury actions, jury trials, and lawyers to try the case. In other words, he was the whole cheese. Before proceeding with what happened afterwards, I wish to state that I never came across an energetic young man in all my life that could compare with McNelly. He did not believe in waiting for further information or further orders. He was right on the spot. He was an able commander, as well as a fearless and brave man. Every man in his command loved him, and he had the greatest respect of them all. Captain L. H. McNelly arrived in this city on May 28, 1875. Upon his arrival in this city, the first thing he did was to hold a conference with some of the leading citizens, chiefly cattlemen, in order to find out what the country really needed. He spent three days in these interviews and became fully convinced that the counties of Cameron and Hidalgo needed a good purging. After having learnt all the ideas of the principal cattle owners, he commenced work right away. Captain McNelly arrived in this section with 22 men. The captain and most of his men were total strangers. He wisely enlisted in his company the following young men who worked actively towards suppressing bandits and cattle thieves. James Kennedy, Thomas McGovern, H. S. Rock, George Moore. He also enlisted a squad of both American and Native Mexicans who knew the lay of the country, as well as some of the worst characters. This squad consisted of the following well-seasoned men. Bill Burke, Macedonio Longorio, Lino Saldaña, Timoteo Solis, Jesus Sandoval, and Matias Serrata as guide. With the above-named men, Captain McNelly started to comb the bandits out of both Cameron and Hidalgo counties. I dare say that in less than two months, you could use a fine comb through both counties and not find one of them left on our soil. Those that he could not get were all accounted for and left for his successors to finish the job. This was attended to by Captain Billy Burke and his men. Yes, you could leave your watch on the highway and return a week hence, and a hundred to one, you would find your watch in the same place that you had left it. On the morning of July 12, 1875, while Captain McNelly was engaged in conversation with gentlemen on the front porch of the Miller Hotel, Matias Serrata, the guide, rode up. The group consisted of M. L. Wise, James G. Brown, Sheriff of Cameron County, and H. S. Rock. Serrata called Mr. Brown aside and informed him that a gang of cattle thieves was at the Arpada Ranch going towards the Rio Grande. They would probably cross into Mexico, 
the big herd of cattle that they were driving at either the Tulosa Ranch or near the mouth of the river. Mr. Brown informed the captain of what Matias had told him. McNelly no sooner heard what Serata had to say when he turned to Mr. H. as Rock and told him to get whatever of his men he could and to wait for him at the city cemetery bridge. The captain then went to the military telegraph office, situated in the Ituria building, and sent a message to the boys stationed at Santa Maria to put spurs immediately to their horses and meet him at the Palo Alto Prairie at the Rebata Ranch. Upon sending his message, he rode out to the bridge where he took all the available force that he could get ready and started towards the Reparo Ranch. Included were the following rangers. H.S. Rock, Timoteo Solis, Casimiro Tamayo, John Armstrong, Barry Smith, Barry Smith Jr., who was not a ranger but followed his father, Rudd, Oglesby, and Lee Hall. They reached the edge of the prairie near the Reparo Ranch at about half past 10 a.m. They had hardly arrived and concealed themselves in the woods when they saw the herd of cattle coming out of the woods into the prairie, driven by 11 or 12 men. The herd consisted of some 300 head or more. There was water on the prairie, and thinking that it might be that the owners were driving their cattle to better pasture, McNally told his men that he would go to see who the parties were, but he gave orders that if he whirled his horse around, to come at once. McNelly started on his errand and had hardly got halfway when the cattle thieves opened fire on him. When the sound of shots reached the boys' ears, they all put spurs to their horses and rushed to the aid of the captain, who was at the time being pressed badly. As soon as the boys got within range, the fight began in earnest. After a running fight for about six miles, there was not a single one of the cattle thieves left to tell the tale. The leader and ten of his men were stretched out on the paved front of the market square so that their relatives could come and claim their remains. The only one that escaped, though badly wounded, was Jose Maria Olguin, alias La Aguja, or The Needle. Olguin, an American-born, was afterwards extradited and, while being conveyed to Corpus Christi, tried to escape and in attempting to do so, was shot by a ranger who was serving as a guard on the trip. On the ranger's side of the fight, a young boy by the name of Barry Smith was killed, and this happened for his not obeying Captain McNelly's orders put to his men on the eve of the fight. Captain McNelly gave them strict orders that if they shot a man, not to go and see whether he killed him or not, but to keep on shooting at the rest that if he or any of the boys fell in the fight, not to stop, but to keep on shooting. Young Smith, upon seeing the leader shot, dropped from his horse and rushed to where he was under a bush. The bandit, seeing his only chance, fired a shot, killing the boy where he stood. As the fight was over, the rangers were going over the grounds to inspect where the bandits fell, so as to be able to gather them for burial. There lay the poor boy stretched out on the ground with a sweet boyish smile on his face, as if nothing had occurred to him. While the crowd of rangers was mourning over their dead comrade, one of the boys happened to cast a look at where the leader was. He observed that the bandit was still alive. He gave a yell to his comrades to give the sign that the bandit was not yet dead. The Winchesters once more spoke. And when the smoke cleared away, he was shot to pieces to the extent that you could almost use him as a sieve to sift for flour. Poor Barry Smith Jr. His remains were brought to Brownsville and were laid in state in the city hall. And from there, he was carried to his last resting place in our city cemetery. The funeral was one of the largest ever held in Brownsville. Chapter 15 the Rio Grande Railroad Robbery, January 19, 1891. Introduction. The Rio Grande Railroad was chartered by the Texas Legislature on August 13, 1870. Several earlier attempts to construct a rail line from Brownsville to Point Isabel had failed. Consequently, in 1870, the former city was still dependent on the fleet of small riverboats, 
which threaded their course up and down the tortuous channel of the Rio Grande for its main contact with the outside world. Those citizens who owned the riverboats had long been accused of blocking the completion of a rail connection with the Gulf, and strong opposition from this quarter had to be overcome before the road could be completed. Most of the organizational effort and financial backing for this line came from the Brownsville businessmen who were anxious to break the virtual transportation monopoly long enjoyed by the King Kennedy Riverboats. After overcoming a number of discouraging obstacles, which included some litigation with the riverboat owners, the Rio Grande Railroad was completed, thus opening up what its supporters hoped would be a new era in transportation for both sides of the Rio Grande. During its lifespan, this short line of approximately 25 miles experienced a number of severe financial reverses. Possibly its greatest losses came as a result of destructive tropical storms, which swept in periodically from the Gulf, causing great damage to roadbed and track. Among other troubles which beset the road were irregular quarantine restrictions placed on the lower Rio Grande area when an epidemic of yellow fever or smallpox would sweep the region. Frequently during these times, all schedules would be suspended, which resulted in great financial loss to the owners. Finally, the crowning blow came in 1886, when the line went into the hands of a receiver. From the exciting and hectic history of this railroad, which was still struggling in 1891, Mr. Neal recorded the following account of a daring train robbery, which is reminiscent of earlier frontier days. Owing to a strict quarantine that existed between the city of New Orleans, Louisiana, and Brownsville, Texas, caused by the smallpox epidemic that was raging in this city, all shipments of every nature were suspended. The Morgan Steamship Company naturally withdrew its ships from our trade. Things began to look very gloomy and sad. We were getting to the bedrock foundation of hunger. At last, on January 15, 1891, we received the joyful news that the quarantine was ordered lifted and that the Morgan ship Aransas would resume her usual trips. All were happy. While the quarantine was in full force, naturally a great deal of merchandise of all kinds accumulated waiting for shipment. Among the commodities awaiting shipment were a good many thousands of Mexican silver dollars. Actually, some $68,000 had accumulated. On the morning of the 18th, the Morgan steamship Aransas arrived at Brazo de Santiago and gave notice that she would sail the following day on her return trip to New Orleans. On the morning of the 19th, the first train pulled out of Brownsville, carrying both passengers and mixed freight. The passenger list consisted of the following persons. Martin B. Kingsbury, Samuel V. Rousset, John Thielen, Mrs. P. Thielen, Reverend Hall, Joseph Cardosa, and two Spaniards. The train pulled out, and everything went well, until it reached the nine-mile post from Point Isabel, when all at a sudden... The train flew off the track. The passengers at first paid little attention to what had happened, but they soon found out that they were being held up. Masked and armed men came into the passenger coach, made the passengers enter an empty boxcar where they were then locked in and left to the mercy of divine providence. The robbers then took from the express car 34 sacks of Mexican silver dollars, robbed the United States mail, in which there were some $7,000 of post office money orders, and carried their loot into the brush, where the money was divided. The money orders were useless to them. The manner the robbers employed to derail the engine was well planned and well accomplished. They first picked a precise spot that answered their purposes. This is a place situated about nine miles from Point Isabel consisting of two small mounds of land separated from each other about 30 feet, but connected with each other by an embankment about 3 feet high, sufficient to hide the two men easily. In order to derail the train, they took out the spikes of the right-hand rail for about 60 feet 
and tied a rope onto the loose rail and waited for the train to reach a distance of about 80 feet before they pulled the rope, which naturally opened the track, which derailed the whole train. While the passengers and the crew were locked up in the boxcar with the flames gradually creeping towards their car, a Mexican man by the name of Pomposo Arriola, who was going toward Point Isabel, was very much amazed at seeing such a destruction, but seeing nobody about, started towards the boxcar in order to push it out of the reach of the fire when he heard the voices of those that were in the car. He then procured an iron bar from the tool chest of the engine with which he broke the lock and thus released the prisoners. At the time that this occurred, Mr. Matthew Brown was sheriff of Cameron County. Don Santiago A. Brito, who had been sheriff, was then chief of police of the city of Brownsville, and at the same time, special captain of rangers by appointment of the governor of the state of Texas. For quite a number of days, the robbery remained a mystery, as the robbers did not leave the least clue for the officers to work on. After waiting to hear some results of the officers' efforts to find the robbers and hearing nothing, Don Simon Celaya, together with some of the leading merchants, called upon Don Santiago A. Brito and requested him to take a hand in arresting the perpetrator of such a dastardly crime. Don Santiago got to work immediately. With some of his old deputies, he started a general survey to find out among the ranchmen if anyone had seen any mounted men scouting around in the area where the deed was committed. Failing to find anyone that could give him an authentic answer, he concluded to try his investigation on another angle by interrogating some of the single hut ranches that are quite numerous in the county. His investigation on this line also proved a failure. While coming towards home on one of his trips, he came across a half-witted boy who was herding a lot of sheep near the nine-mile post of the railroad. Don Santiago, upon reaching the boy, asked him his name, to which he readily replied, Librado Jaramillo. Don Santiago then asked him the whereabouts of Don Jose. The boy answered that his uncle had gone away with Don Jose Mosqueda and Fabian Garcia. Upon being asked when or on what day they left, the boy promptly replied that the last time he had seen them was the day that the robbers stopped and robbed the train. This sort of information was a good lead, but Brito could not make up his mind that these men were implicated in the deed. However, Don Santiago kept them on his list for investigation. It happened that while Sheriff Brown and Brito were doing their best to bring the robbers before law and justice, Mr. Tillinghast, a nephew of the late F.W. Latham, was coming into town from his ranch and nearing the Yesca's ranch, he had to cut off the main road on account of a water hole. While going through the brush, he came across a man by the name of Lorenzo Trevino, whom he knew as El Colote. Old Lorenzo handed him a nose bag, called a moral, which was quite heavy. Mr. Tillinghast, upon examining the contents of the nose bag, found an iron bar about two feet in length that looked like a spike puller. Lorenzo Trevino informed Mr. Tillinghast that he had found the bag thrown in the brush about 100 yards from where they stood. When they examined the spot, they came across hoof tracks, indicating that there had been at least five horses there and as many men. On his arrival in town, Mr. Tillinghast gave the iron to Mr. Brito. Don Santiago immediately sent for his men, and that very same evening, they set out without knowing where they were being led. Arriving at the Arroyo Colorado, at a ferry crossing known as Taylor's Crossing, Brito and his men went to an old blacksmith and showed him the iron that Mr. Tillinghast had delivered to them. The old blacksmith, after looking at the iron carefully, told Don Santiago that the iron was not his work. Don Santiago asked the old smith if he could tell him who he thought made the iron. His reply was that he thought it was of the work of his old compadre, Cleofas, who lived at the ranch Campo Verde. With this information, Don Santiago and his men went to Campo Verde, arriving there quite late. They went immediately to the house where the blacksmith lived and called him out. The blacksmith asked them into his house, and after some conversation, Don Santiago pulled out the claw iron. Don Cleofas declared that he had made the iron for Don Juan Benitez. 
Brito waited for Don Juan Benitez to open his store in the morning, then arrested him and brought him to town. He had caught the main guy. As they rode to Brownsville, Don Juan told Don Santiago that he ordered the iron to be made for Jose Mosqueda and Simon Garcia, who paid Don Cleofas for the work. Upon arriving in Brownsville, in order to avoid trouble with the sheriff, Brito placed the United States Marshal in charge of the prisoner, then made a dash for the rest of the gang. On returning from one of his scouting trips from the back country, Don Santiago stopped at the Yescas Ranch, where he went to the grocery store of Don Florencio Alfaro, whom he asked if he had seen Jose Maria Mosqueda. Upon receiving a negative reply, Brito requested Don Florencio to tell Mosqueda that Don Santiago wanted to see him. When he arrived in Brownsville at a late hour, Brito was handed a letter from Esteban Salas, who lived at the Borregos Ranch, telling Don Santiago he wanted to see him on an important affair regarding the railroad robbery. With this revelation that perhaps good development might show up through Salas, Don Santiago immediately resaddled his horse and managed to get two of his men to go with him to the Borregos Ranch to see what Salas had to say. To his sorrow, upon arriving at the ranch, he learned from Salas' wife that Esteban was not at home, but was in Brownsville. With this information, Brito returned to Brownsville, where around the hour of 5 a.m., he invited his men to a cup of coffee. In the restaurant, owned by a Spaniard by the name of Montejano, there was Salas with a companion. Upon seeing Brito, Salas got up to greet him, taking him aside and commencing to converse with him. All at a sudden, Don Santiago placed Don Esteban under arrest and took him to the city hall where he held him as a prisoner. The arrest of Salas caused quite a stir between the sheriff and Brito to the extent that both came very near clashing against each other over the affair. I really believe that it would have ended in bloodshed if it had not been for the clever head of the Honorable James B. Wells, who poured oil of peace over the troubled waters. Peace between both parties once more resumed its peaceful channel. Mosqueda and Fabian Garcia were both arrested and put in jail. While a prisoner, Mosqueda was sweated and he sang. In other words, he confessed all that he knew of the affair. It is remarkable that the manager of the whole affair, Jose Maria Mosqueda, was an illiterate Mexican who did not know the first letter of the alphabet, yet he accomplished through his cunningness one of the best planned crimes and came near to completely baffling the detectives. While there was some wrangling about the prisoners, Deputy U.S. Marshal John M. Haynes took them under the charge of robbing the United States mail. This ended the fuss between the sheriff and Don Santiago Brito. Of all the gang of bandits that robbed the train, only two were tried, Jose Maria Mosqueda and Fabian Garcia. Mosqueda was sent to the Detroit Penitentiary for life, while Fabian Garcia got a sentence of 10 years. Both died in the penitentiary. One of the bandits, Jose M. Jaramillo, was killed by Esteban Cadena, one of Sheriff Brown's deputies, while resisting arrest. Of the total amount, $68,000 in Mexican silver dollars, only $28,000 was recovered. During the trial of Jose Maria Mosqueda in the United States Circuit Court, Judge T.S. Maxi presiding, Mosqueda made the full confession as follows. It was during the night of December 31st, 1890, that I was in company with Simon Garcia and Jose Jaramillo, having a jolly time waiting for the new year to enter. We were all drinking mezcal when the conversation turned to the injustice that the civil authorities had placed on all the poor people. By putting on such a strict quarantine, which enabled the merchants to sell all of the rotten stuff which had accumulated in their stores. While we were on the subject, a merchant doing business in Brownsville, accompanied by a friend, came and both took coffee. We heard the merchant tell his friend that he would give most anything to have the quarantine raised, for he was paying interest on bills that he owed while he had $2,000 lying idle in the railroad office. Not only he was in such a fix, but also there were others who had thousands upon thousands of dollars in the same fix. 
Hearing this, I conceived an idea of getting a few of my camaradas to assault the train on her first trip. I did not preach the subject to Simon Garcia at the time because there were too many ears around where we were, but a couple of days afterwards, I met Simon Garcia at Juan Benitez's store at the Campo Verde Ranch. While Juan Benitez, Simon Garcia, and I were taking a drink, I called the attention of Simon Garcia to what we had heard at Point Isabel regarding the thousands upon thousands of Mexican silver dollars that were waiting to be shipped by the first ship when the quarantine was lifted. Juan Benitez then made a remark about how easy it would be to get some of the money, and I asked Don Juan how it could be done. He said it could be done by derailing the train in the same manner that the Americanos do in the United States. We kept on talking, and once in a while took a drink of mezcal. It was nearly midnight when we commenced to talk about holding up the train, and, at Don Juan's suggestion, we adjourned with the strict understanding that we were to meet the following day to talk over the matter. At the same time, he gave us to understand that we were to be very careful not to refer to the affair while in general conversation with others. The following day, we met as per agreement, and after a few remarks, Don Juan informed us that he did not sleep very well during the night on account of thinking about the matter we had on hand. He told us that he had studied the matter carefully, and he drew a paper from inside his coat which showed a sort of an iron that had one end like a claw. The drawing was to illustrate how easy it was to pull spikes from logs of the railroad and to loosen the rails. We got our heads together and entered into a compact not to divulge to anyone what we had on hand. Benitez told us that he would get old Don Cleofas to make the iron, and that after it was finished, I was to go to a certain place and get the iron and hide it in a place where we could find it when it was wanted. This being done, we adjourned until Don Juan would let us know when he wanted us to meet him. We waited about three days when a man from Campo Verde came and informed me that Don Juan Benitez wanted to see us. I immediately went by way of the ranch del Cipres, where I picked up Simon Garcia, and both of us wanted to see what Don Juan wanted. After a hard day's travel, we arrived at the Campo Verde ranch and saw Mr. Benitez, who informed us that he had the iron ready, but that he thought it wise to try to get other parties into the job, as there was plenty of money for many more. He gave us the iron, and we started on our way home. On the way, Simon Garcia and I talked over the matter, and came to the conclusion of enlisting at least six more men to help us. I suggested that we get only such persons as were connected by our family ties. This Simon Garcia approved and remarked that I had a good head on me. <laughs> With this understanding, we divided our selection into half of the required number. I went over and saw a good friend named Jose Jaramillo. Also, I secured Emilio Villarreal and Blas Loya. Simon Garcia enlisted Fabian Garcia, H. Loya, and his son, and at the same time spoke to Esteban Salas, directing him to take care of the mule and horse stock to be used as pack animals. Things were ready. After waiting some days, we began to feel the strain caused by the patients in waiting for the hour. At last, on the 17th of January, a notice appeared in the daily newspaper that the train would leave at the usual hour, 9 a.m., on the morning of the 19th. With this news, I got Simon Garcia and went with him to see Don Juan Benitez, who congratulated us and embraced us in farewell. We headed on our way to get all the money on the train. On the morning of the 18th, I picked up my men, except for Emilio Villarreal, who got cold feet. Not all knew who their companions were until we got to the ground that I had personally picked to derail the train. We slept on the ground behind the hill, and toward 5 o'clock on the morning of the 19th, we pulled out the spikes and tied a rope to the rail, hiding it by covering it with sand. Then, we waited for our victim. About 10 o'clock, we heard the puffing of the locomotive coming in at full speed. We got ready, and just as the train was about 50 yards from our doctored rail, we pulled the rope, which spread the rails, and pretty soon the precious cargo was in our hands. That is all I have to say. <clears throat> In connection with the Mosqueda confession, I will add what the jailer said in a conversation with friends regarding the robbery. 
When Mosqueda returned from the U.S. courtroom, after being sentenced by the judge, he got into a regular conversation with the jailer, and asked through what source Sheriff Brown had got all the information from which he testified in court. The jailer informed him that Fabian Garcia had made a confession to the sheriff, telling him all he knew about the robbery, and at the same time giving the sheriff all of the names of the persons who participated in the robbery. To this, Mosqueda remarked that all of this had happened by taking boys into their affairs. As to the sentencing of his friend, Mosqueda felt that Garcia had got off cheap. On the way to derailing the train, in selecting the best place, Fabian had wanted the bandits to derail the train at the Black Bridge so that all the passengers and crew would be killed, Mosqueda revealed. Simon Garcia had persuaded Fabian to leave the selection of the place to Mosqueda, who wanted to kill no one. His wish was only for the money. Mosqueda added that he had told Simon Garcia that Fabian Garcia should not have been enlisted as he was too young and could not keep secrets. But Simon said that he was his relative, and he felt sure that Fabian would never betray them. Salas, Mosqueda assured the jailer, knew nothing about the affair. All he had to do was to take care of the mules and horses placed in his farm. In after years, it came to light that Emilio Villarreal and Salas were relatives, and that they had entered into a conspiracy of robbing the robbers who had robbed the train. It appears that the money taken from the train was to be buried in a small mott near the ranch and was to be carried away gradually. But somehow, the plan was changed, and only one of the companions took his part, together with what belonged to Juan Benitez, and buried it near the ranch. This was the portion recovered by Brito and Sheriff Brown. It was strongly believed that Emilio Villarreal and Salas got away with one sack, containing 2,000 Mexican Eagle dollars. Both of the Loyas made their way into Mexico. The writer often conversed with the younger man at Ramirez Station on the Mexican National Railroad on the way to Monterrey, but our conversation never referred to anything appertaining to the robbery. Simon Garcia made two trips to where he buried his four sacks containing 8,000 Mexican silver dollars. Eventually, he was killed in San Nicolás, Tamaulipas, Mexico, in a gambling den over the dispute of a debt. Chapter 16, The Shooting Up of Brownsville, Texas, 1906. Narrator's Note. This incident, otherwise known as the Brownsville Raid or the Brownsville Affair, is perhaps the most racially charged episode to ever occur in Brownsville, Texas history. We must remember that this comes from the mind of William A. Neal, who was an Anglo living in Brownsville in the early 20th century. Apart from some of the racial language that would be deemed terribly inappropriate for modern standards, quite a few of the prejudices and biases of the era are quite prevalent in this chapter and warp some of the events mentioned here that later investigations prove to be not necessarily accurate. Therefore, do take a grain of salt when listening to William A. Neal's perspective of the Brownsville Affair. Uh, further research, further investigation can be done on your own accord to separate fact from fiction. Nevertheless, we must still consider this account historically valuable because it is, after all, a first-hand Anglo perspective of the Brownsville affair from someone who was living in Brownsville at the time of this historic incident that put Brownsville on the front page of every newspaper across America, but not for the right reasons. With that in mind, let's see what Mr. William A. Neal had to say about the Brownsville affair. Introduction. In mid-August of 1906, the people of Brownsville were aroused by an incident that rocked the entire border area. About midnight on August 13, a group of Negro soldiers stationed at Fort Brown swarmed out of the reservation gates, located near the business section of Brownsville, and spread out over the city, shooting wildly and firing into several homes in or near town. There had been isolated cases of friction during the preceding weeks between the soldiers and civilians, leading up to this attack, 
when the soldiers killed one man and wounded the city chief of police on this night. The manner in which the government rifles were secured for this raid and the identity of those guilty of the crime were never determined. This event aroused much bitterness in Brownsville, and pressures were brought for both state and federal officials to enter the picture. The whole affair was the object of lengthy hearings, courts martial, and investigations. It was established that those guilty of the crime were from companies B, C, and D of the 25th U.S. Infantry, but the individuals responsible were never detected. President Theodore Roosevelt ordered 167 men dismissed from the army with dishonorable discharges, and furthermore, they were forever barred from the United States Armed Services. The ruling provoked harsh criticism over the nation, and it was a subject of heated controversy in the press. Senator J.B. Foraker of Ohio led the fight to lessen the sentence of the president, but after a thorough investigation, the United States Senate Military Affairs Committee, by a majority vote, upheld the decision of the president. The editors are especially indebted to Mr. T.W. Celaya, a native of Brownsville, son of Mrs. Lucy Tate Celaya and grandson of Fred Tate, for information secured for the preparation of this episode. When the news reached Brownsville that a detachment of the 25th U.S. Colored Infantry was to be sent immediately to Fort Brown, the old-time citizens of this city approved the action of the War Department and awaited its arrival. Before the battalion reached its destination, Fort Brown, we heard that the whole command had conducted themselves shamefully while en route. It was handed down to us that they were the wildest set of niggers. We were told that they shot at all advertising signs on the road, they addressed shamefully all ladies that happened to be at the stopping stations, using language unfit to utter, and, I am told, went so far that they would show the women folks their private parts. These sad tidings surely put quite the damper to our expectations, and put us on the que vive when they arrived. The women folks stayed home after sundown, at least for a while. Prior to the time that the battalion reached destination, the Gulf Coast Railroad had brought a good many settlers. Amongst the many were a lot of fire eaters, who upon hearing how the Negroes were acting as they came along, commenced to boast in boisterous language as to how many niggers they were going to kill, etc. These very same fellows, when the time came, couldn't be found even with a Yerkes telescope. They went into their holes and dragged their holes with them. Before the Negro troops reached Brownsville, all the saloons in the city divided their bar rooms into two separate compartments, one being for the whites and the other for the blacks. The troops at last arrived via the coastlines and were taken from the railroad station into Fort Brown, where a sort of a repast was prepared for them. That very evening convinced the writer, William A. Neal, what kind of niggers the whole battalion was composed of. Right in front of their officers, they used terrible language at each other. The officers seemed to take not the least notice of what they were saying. All seemed to be covered with the same blanket of shame. A couple of days before the battalion reached Brownsville, I met a Negro sergeant at Lee Wise's store, who upon seeing me, came right up to me and called me by name. I at once became fully convinced that I had seen him before. After guessing, I at last struck his name, and it was in the 10th Cavalry that I had seen him when the 10th was stationed in Fort Brown. I had quite a chat with him. He was sent in advance to buy provisions for the command, etc. During our conversation, I asked him what sort of men composed the battalion, that we had already heard a good deal as to how they were conducting themselves while en route to Fort Brown. The old sergeant told me that the three companies had a lot of newly enlisted bucks who had been having their own way. The cause of this was that they were being pushed from pillar to post and had not done any garrison duty since they enlisted. But now that they were to be in a garrison, he felt it wouldn't take the old bucks long to tame them down. We had quite a good chat over the situation and finally parted, expecting to have another chat 
in the near future. Upon the arrival of said battalion, the first thing they did was to use very abusive language when nearing the ladies while they were either on business or promenading the streets of the principal business section of the city. This uncalled-for insult naturally brought on a hateful prejudice against the Negro soldiers. On Sunday evening, August 5th, 1906, Mr. and Mrs. Fred Tate, accompanied by their daughter Lucy and several women friends, were promenading up Elizabeth Street, the principal thoroughfare of the city, on their way towards the residence of one of them. When nearing 8th Street, opposite what is known as the Dalzell Building, the ladies stopped to talk. Two Negro soldiers, who were going in the same direction when nearing where the ladies were bunched together talking, made their way by elbowing through the crowd of ladies, almost pushing one of the ladies into the street. At this juncture of affairs, Mr. Fred Tate pulled out his revolver, a Colt forty-five, and struck one of the Negro soldiers over the head and floored him. The other Negro soldier ran off and did not stop until he got into Fort Brown. Although Mr. Tate ran after the fleeing Negro, the Negro had wings on his feet and got away. Mr. Tate at the time was a mounted inspector of U.S. Customs and was well thought of as being a sober and thorough gentleman, honest in all of his dealings as well as his convictions while in his line of duty. The only thing that seemed strange to me was that Fred Tate didn't shoot the Negro, because he was one of those men that was slow in weighing things, cool and reserved, but when he got into action, he was quick. I really think that the Negro soldier, Newton, that he hit over the head, should have been satisfied that he got out cheap. At least, I think so. A couple of months after the above occurrence, while in conversation with Mr. Tate, somehow or another, we drifted into the Negro affair, and I made the remark to Mr. Tate that the only thing that puzzled me was how in the name of goodness, after the Negro came very near pushing his wife into the street, he didn't let him have it. He told me that the reason was that he had old Betsy cocked, but one of the ladies called out, Don't shoot! That was the real reason why he didn't bust a cap on Newton. The Negro soldiers, on reaching the garrison, went to see Major C.W. Penrose, commander of the battalion, and lodged a complaint against Fred Tate as to how roughly Tate had handled them without any cause whatsoever. The very next day, Major Penrose called upon the collector of customs and entered a complaint against Inspector Fred Tate. Mr. John W. Van, collector of customs, with the assistance of the supervisor of U.S. Customs, Mr. Jasper A. Maltby, conducted a thorough investigation of the affair, and gathered a good many affidavits from reliable citizens, which resulted in the full exoneration of Fred Tate, and Major Penrose was so notified. While the investigation was being held by the U.S. Customs authorities, Major Penrose and other officers were holding another separate investigation at the regimental headquarters at Fort Brown, where a good many citizens were cited to appear. After spending a good many days and Uncle Sam's money, and hearing a good lot of testimony, the results of the investigation were never made public. All the proceedings were undoubtedly whitewashed, and the results endorsed, nobody knows or has heard anything. A few days after the above occurrence, the writer, William A. Neal, was waiting at the Brownsville Ferry Landing for a ferry boat to be ferried over to Matamoros, Mexico. At Santa Cruz. I had been waiting probably 20 minutes when I saw the boat leave the Mexican side of the river with two Negro soldiers as occupants that seemed to be pretty well tanked up. In other words, drunk. I recognized amongst the Negro soldiers one named James W. Newton of Company C, the very Negro who had the fuss with Mr. Fred Tate a few days prior. The ferry boat with its occupants was being rowed to the Brownsville side, and the boatman called for the fare, which was a nickel per person. This very same negro, Newton, immediately got up and used all sorts of profane language, and at the same time threatened to pick up a fight with the boatman. Knowing that all of the Mexican boatmen 
always carried either a dagger or a butcher knife on their person, I yelled to the Negro soldier to stop and be careful of what he was about. Otherwise, he would have to suffer the consequence. The boat had almost reached the Brownsville landing when the boatman called for his fare again, but was refused. Upon landing, the boatman was smart to jump first and then tell all of them that they had to pay him. Otherwise, he would have to call a policeman. At this stage of the game, Newton pulled out the required amount, and the two soldiers then commenced to walk on a plank walk that led from the flat boat, where the ferryboat landed, to the mainland. They got to about the middle of the walk, when one of the negroes slipped and fell into the mud. The other negroes, seeing their comrades struggling in the mud, did nothing but look on, being too drunk to lend a hand. The boatman, Leno, came to the rescue, and with the assistance of another Mexican, Apolonio, managed to pull the negro out of the mud and put him safely on dry land near the U.S. Customs House Garita. Mr. A.Y. Baker, a U.S. Customs inspector, was on duty at the time, and upon seeing the man in the muddy condition he was in, approached him in order to see whether he had any liquor concealed on his person. When he asked him whether he had anything on his person, Newton immediately got huffy and said something to A.Y. Baker, which I did not hear. All I saw in retaliation was that Baker kicked Newton on the butt and cracked a sort of a short, heavyset negro over the head with his gun. They then started like little lambs, without a murmur, right straight into the Fort Brown Reservation. Ride was the name of the soldier that fell into the mud. That very same evening, a little after 9 p.m., another dastardly crime was attempted by a couple of Negro soldiers. Mrs. Evans, the wife of a state of Texas quarantine officer, lived at the corner of 15th and Jefferson Streets. It was a custom of Mrs. Evans, while her husband was on evening duty, to carry him his supper, and at the same time, she would pass at least half an hour chatting with him. This particular evening, her husband requested of his wife to get home as quickly as possible, as he was very much afraid that the Negro soldiers would or might retaliate in some way or other over the happenings of the day. Mrs. Evans left her husband at exactly 9 o'clock p.m. and went straight home. The house that the Evanses lived in was situated about 50 feet from the big gate of the main entrance of the lower part of the Fort Brown Reservation. But in order to get into the yard where she lived, Mrs. Evans had to go through a gate which opened on to the 30-foot street belonging to the government reservation. This night, Mrs. Evans dismounted outside of the gate and was leading her horse by the bridle towards the stable, situated a short distance from the house. She had gone but a few steps, when a negro soldier in uniform sprang from behind the steps and caught her by the hair. At this, her horse got frightened, reared up, and drew her away from the negro. She screamed and was heard by two old retired soldiers who lived on the premises. They knew that it was Mrs. Evans' voice and came out with their firearms ready for work. The two old retired soldiers arrived upon the scene just in time to see the two Negro soldiers climb over the low wire fence into the garrison. After these two occurrences had taken place, both on the same day, another investigation was held which quickly wound up in Major Penrose's putting on a strict quarantine between Fort Brown and the city of Brownsville. These procedures put the soldiers of the Negro Battalion in a very bad mood, which they plainly show towards our citizens whenever the occasion presented itself. The officers themselves showed a mighty poor dignity. Most of these officers that were commissioned and put into the ranks of this battalion of the 25th Infantry, Companies B, C, D, got their jobs not by going through military training at West Point or through merit from the ranks, but through the influence of some political bosses who hold the whip over the congressmen composing the Army and Naval Board sitting high in Washington, D.C., and who are told what they have to do 
in order to not become lame ducks in the next congressional election. This is the very point in this case. Of all the officers that commanded the battalion of the 25th Infantry that were stationed in Brownsville, only one was a West Pointer. All others were appointed from civil life. Lieutenant Lawson of Company C was the only West Pointer in the whole crowd. In continuing with the narrative about the shooting up of Brownsville, Texas, I do so stating what I saw and not what others have stated about the sad affair. I will not quote an item that appears on the pages of the Congressional Record at Washington, D.C., because there are a good many statements there that are not very correctly stated, as they were colored to fit the occasion of trying to whitewash what really occurred. Amongst the number of civilian employees that were detained in Fort Brown by the sudden quarantine was a retired soldier by the name of Foster, who at one time served as a police officer in the city. While the quarantine was on, he was the only one that had the privilege of coming into town after his work was over. This was usually between the hours of 9 and 10 p.m. When coming into town, Foster would come by way of the little gate near the main gate from the city into Fort Brown, situated at the foot of Elizabeth Street. Foster would invariably take the right-hand sidewalk when coming home. About the middle of the block on Elizabeth Street, between 13th and 12th Street, is situated the San Roman building, where a good many of the old-timers congregated of an evening to have a chat. Said meetings would sometimes last until the hours of 11 or 12 o'clock, after which we would all adjourn until next day, when we would all meet again to have another chat. While the quarantine was vigorously being enforced by the commanding officer, Major C.W. Penrose, Mr. Foster, when coming into town with his usual gait, would generally stop when he reached the front of the San Roman place, where we were all sitting on the edge of the sidewalk, taking the evening breeze. He would give us the latest news as to how the niggers were behaving themselves, and how they were all getting along, and especially the civilian employees who were being detained against their will. This conversation was carried on from night to night, until the evening of August 11th, when he changed his tone and the tenor of his news into a more serious outlay. He gave us the information that the Negro soldiers were beginning to form in groups and were conversing amongst themselves in a sort of a whispering way. He had called the Major's attention to the fact, and he had told him also that he had seen several Negro soldiers loitering around the old magazine building. One of the Negroes was examining the lock, and would at times insert a piece of wire into the lock, etc. The Major then put a double guard that night to take care that none of the men would approach the building. Mr. Foster, being an old soldier who had soldiered with the Negro troops in the Philippine Islands during the Spanish and American War, claimed to have a thorough knowledge of their ways when held under a state of suspense or under orders pending an investigation. Mr. Foster wound up by telling us that those Negro soldiers might come out and shoot at any moment. The next evening, the 12th, Mr. Foster came to town in the usual way and stopped where we were all having our usual chat. He gave us the latest news, winding up by giving us a warning that we all better be getting home at an early hour because he feared that the Negroes were forming plans to raid the town. They were getting very nervous and hamstrung. With this, Mr. Foster continued on his way home. On the next evening, the ever-to-be-remembered August 13th, 1906, quite a large crowd was sitting inside, in the office of Mr. Fulgencio Lopez San Roman, having our chat, when at the usual hour, our old friend Mr. Foster came along. When he reached right in front of where we were all sitting, the writer, William A. Neal, hailed Mr. Foster, who at our request entered the office. I looked squarely in the face of Mr. Foster, and I could see that he was laboring under something that was preying heavily on his mind. After a little hesitation on his part, he told us that the Negro soldiers were locating 
were trying to locate the residences of a few fellows that had treated them shamefully and that they intended to get even with them at the first opportunity. Mr. Foster further told us that those damn niggers are liable to come out this very night and shoot up the town. I could almost pledge all that I have that they are coming out this very night because I saw some of them talking with the sergeant who carries the keys of the whole building. And he made a sort of a gesture pointing to a room where I am positive that there are a good many rifles and ammunition locked up. I told the major what I had observed and he immediately gave orders to have a guard placed in the building. Gentlemen, those niggers are up to something. They are looking husky, and nothing can be heard above a whisper. All looks like someone in a graveyard mourning over a dead relative. I sincerely hope that nothing will happen, and that the officers will be able to control their men, but I am very much afraid that when the time comes, that they won't be able to do anything with them. So, good night. With this, Mr. Foster left for home. And we continued our usual chat until the hour of 11 o'clock p.m., when the meeting dispersed. After the meeting was over, I crossed over to the Crichel Saloon to get a nightcap. And while there, I met several of the boys playing pitch for the drinks. I stayed long enough to see one game played. I went up to the bar and took another drink. Upon coming out of the Crichel Saloon, I walked over to the corner of 12th and Elizabeth Streets, where I met... Genero Padron, a city policeman with whom I had a conversation. Bringing up the subject about the Negro soldiers, I informed Padron of what I had heard from a friend, Foster, regarding the position the Negroes had placed all of us in, and cautioned him to be on the lookout. With this, I bade him good night, and made my way towards home. I got home about twenty minutes to twelve o'clock, and after looking over the premises, and seeing that all the windows and doors were secured, I went to my room and got undressed. Noticing that Mrs. Neal, my wife, was still awake, I made the remark to her that I thought that the Negro soldiers were coming out this very night. She replied that I was only talking nonsense and for me to go to bed. I had hardly got in bed and pulled my pillow to rest my head upon when I heard two distinct sounds that seemed to me were fired from a pistol from the direction of the garrison guard house. No sooner were the two shots fired, when all at a sudden I heard volley after volley being fired. Sounding as if they came from the alley between Elizabeth and Adams streets, the premises occupied by my cousin, Louis W. R. Cowan, and Miller's Hotel. Then I heard the call to arms sounded in the garrison. The shooting became furious with volley after volley being fired as the Negroes got up as far as 12th Street. Then all became silent again. While the shooting was going on, I got up, dressed, and put my family in a place of safety. I got my old Springfield 4570 and started towards the market. Nearing the market square, I met Marcellus Doherty, and together we walked towards Elizabeth Street, where we met Dr. Fred Combe. Mayor of the city of Brownsville. Quite a number of citizens had congregated in front of Celestine Jagu's saloon, now occupied by the Bollack store. Dr. Fred Combe recognized us and instructed us to try and keep the people quiet, as things would turn out all right. For the present, nothing could be done, but in the morning, he would order a full investigation to be made of such a disgraceful affair. The mayor himself then addressed the people, requesting them to remain quiet. While these proceedings were being held, Captain Samuel P. Lyons, with a large detachment of soldiers, made their appearance coming in from 12th Street into Elizabeth Street. When they came to where Mayor Fred Combe was, they got tangled up in a very hot conversation. Marcellus Doherty, MacDonald the Carpenter, and I were standing on the sidewalk in front of Tillman's store, when all at once, I heard some of the Negro soldiers yell out, There stand men with guns in their hands! As they made their way toward us, Marcellus Doherty told them that he was a peace officer and ordered them to stop. At this, one of the Negro soldiers saw that I had an old model Springfield 4570 
and he made an effort to come where I was. At the same time, he was trying to get the company to muss up ranks. Mingo Sanders, 1st Sergeant of Company B, 25th Infantry, saw the men leaving the ranks and butted them back, using his rifle against some of their heads, and at the same time, he gave orders to march, which order was obeyed, leaving Captain Samuel P. Lyons on the sidewalk, having it out with Dr. Fred Combe. His company marched into Fort Brown, unknown to him. I really believe that if it hadn't been for Sergeant Sanders' quickness and sound judgment, a good many of us would have been killed. The crowd that had congregated in front of Tillman Saloon began to disperse. I went inside through a partially open door into the Tillman Saloon, with the object of seeing what damage, if any, the Negroes had done. Upon entering the saloon, I came across Don Paulino Preciado, editor of the Spanish newspaper El Porvenir, who, with a few friends standing around him, was trying to stop the blood that was streaming out of the wound that he had received during the Negro shooting. He had had a finger shot off and a face scratch that did not amount to much. I suggested to Mr. Preciado that the best thing for him to do was to go to the drugstore and have his wounds attended to, which he did. I then started towards the yard, where I saw quite a number looking at something, which after edging my way through the crowd, I saw was poor little Frank Nattis stretched out dead. His face, looking towards heaven, had a sweet smile. It was a pitiful sight. I was informed by Mr. Tillman, the owner of the saloon, that young Nattis was working for him as a bartender, and when he heard the shooting that seemed to be down Elizabeth, he, with the assistance of a few men that were in the saloon, made a rush to close the front doors of the saloon. At the same time, he told young Nattis to hurry up and close the little back gate that opened into the alley. The front doors were closed right away, and Mr. Tillman told all the crowd to come into the dining room for better safety. Most of those present took cover, except for Preciado and a couple of others. A volley of shots sounded as it fired from the alley into the yard and towards the saloon. It did not last long, and when the sound died out, Tillman came out to see what was what. He saw Don Paulino Preciado bleeding quite freely from the loss of a finger and a small scrape along one of his ears. Then, someone came from the alley gate and found the dead body of poor Natus. He came and told Mr. Tillman of it, but at the time that he told Tillman, it was still risky to venture out where the boy lay. He waited for a while, and presently heard a knocking at one of the front doors. It was Mayor Combe, who ordered that no drinks were to be sold. After talking for about five minutes, both the mayor and Tillman went to the place where poor Nattis gave up his life in obeying an order. About 2 o'clock a.m., I left the small crowd that still lingered around Tillman Saloon and went to the market to get a cup of coffee. There, I met a few Mexicans and some Americans, about 10 or 12 in all. Some had rifles, others had shotguns, while others had pistols. I asked them what they were up to, and they replied that they were waiting for the damn niggers to come out again. I told them that the best thing they could do was to go home and let the city authorities handle the situation. With this, they all left, I presume for their respective homes. After getting through with this episode, I proceeded to Montejano's coffee house, but found it closed, so I went home to bed. The following morning, August 14th, I went around to see the rest of the damage. The first place that I went to see was the Cowan house and examined everything. It was pretty badly shot up. The only thing that saved the whole family from being shot was that the building was shot proof. It has a brick wall between the weatherboarding and the lining of the house. I next went to see the house of my old friend, Mr. Fred Stark. They surely peppered him up, but thanks to the great I am, nobody was hurt. They peppered Mr. Fred Tate's home very little. Old Fred Tate came out all okay.
During the day of the 14th of August, 1906, after a great deal of fuss and feathers, the mayor was requested by some of the leading citizens to call a mass meeting in order to bring pressure towards having the Negroes punished for the heinous crime they had committed. The mayor called the desired meeting, which was well attended. A committee was appointed to do whatever they thought best under the trying circumstances. With Mr. William Kelly as chairman, the committee immediately got to work in dead earnest, investigating and examining all witnesses, sending telegrams to President Roosevelt and to the War Department, calling upon both for protection and justice. Also, private telegrams went to friends and congressmen at Washington, D.C., soliciting their aid in our behalf in bringing the Negroes before courts of justice. For the first few days, the telegraph wires were kept hot. Telegrams upon telegrams were sent. Committee after committee made the reports. All one could hear during the suspense was, has the committee so-and-so made the report? Or has Washington, D.C. answered the wires sent in this AM? I will state that never in my life have I ever been so worked up. Yes, I will of her. I was never as near a breakdown as I was in this affair. Night after night, I would wake up after a few moments of catnapping during nighttime, and next morning, I had to go to my work. This method of carrying on the investigation occupied nearly 15 days. Then, all at a sudden, it fell into the silent committee to handle matters henceforth. I, for one, was perfectly satisfied, as my influence amounted to nothing. But some of those of the upper ten began to whisper around that there would be nothing doing. Nothing came but hot air that wound itself up with the following endorsement. Thrown out of court for want of evidence. Chapter 17, The Battle of Matamoros, 1913. Introduction. Of all the revolutions experienced by Mexico, none had the important implications of that which began in 1910. Not only did this movement overthrow Porfirio Diaz, but it also inaugurated a series of far-reaching reforms which were preserved in the Constitution of 1917, a document which completely changed Mexican society. Diaz, who had been in power since 1876, was finally sent to exile in 1911. Francisco I. Madero took over control after his departure, but he could not bring order out of the chaos which the ousted dictator left behind. Madero, in turn, was replaced by General Victoriano Huerta in February 1913. Venustiano Carranza announced a plan in March 1913 to overthrow Huerta, and he and his followers climaxed a victorious campaign by entering Mexico City in July 1914 although all opposition was not immediately stamped out. The event, sometimes called the Battle of Matamoros, which took place in June 1913, was really a small affair viewed from the overall national picture. Far removed from the center of political activity, but significant as a port of entry, Matamoros was the site chosen by Lucio Blanco, a follower of Carranza, to be captured in the summer of 1913. Defended by a few federal soldiers whose loyalty to Huerta was doubtful, the city soon fell into Blanco's hands. An interesting sidelight of this episode is the fact that William A. Neal was an eyewitness in 1876 to part of the activities that led to Diaz's rise to power in Mexico, and that 37 years later in 1913, he should have witnessed and recorded a fragment of the struggle that was an aftermath of the overthrow of Diaz and his influence. During the latter part of 1912, there appeared on the streets of Brownsville, Texas, a rumor that a band of revolutionary character had made its appearance, and that it was camped near Reynosa. A short time afterwards, stories commenced to circulate that the government was to be upset. Hardly had the rumor died when another nightmare war scare was circulated that General Lucio Blanco had assumed the command of the Revolutionary Party and had established his headquarters at Columbres and had amassed some 2,000 men. 
A good many thousands were expected to join his army in a very few days. Towards the end of April 1913, the news reached Matamoros, Mexico, that General Blanco was almost ready to commence military operations against the city of Matamoros, and was only waiting for a military man who was to lead the battle. A few days afterwards, the news was received that the military officer had at last arrived at Columbres, but that it required a few days to instruct the army on maneuvering and other military tactics required when an army is on the offensive. I was informed by a friend that the officer to whom I have reference worked day and night drilling his men. In the meanwhile, the city of Matamoros was not asleep. Major Ramos, a retired Mexican officer, was called into the service to take full command of all the available military forces within the jurisdiction of the city of Matamoros. While the orders were coming from the headquarters in the city of Mexico, Dr. Barragan commenced to fortify and get things in proper shape to meet the enemy. The old fortifications that were built during the Maximilian Empire were all renovated and put into proper shape. At the same time, he enlisted a good many of the Mexicans that were deer hunters and good shots. He had enlisted about 300 men, which, with some 114 soldiers that were garrisoned in Matamoros at the time, constituted the entire force that was turned over to Major Ramos. Dr. Barragan had put up defense breastworks along the principal streets of the city and around the city electric and water workshops. He had planted electric wires all around the city, which, if anyone came in contact with them, would produce instant death. Combined with these were small pits containing dynamite that would blow up the enemies at the will of the officer in charge. The electric key was on the lookout, situated in the church steeple. All seemed to be safe. A few days previous to the fight, Dr. Baragan had dug up an old cannon that for a good many years had been posted in front of the grocery store that was called the Cannon Grocery Store. After going over its condition and finding it in what he thought was good condition, he had it cleaned and mounted in a sort of a mesquite log carrier. Where he got the ammunition, nobody knows. Both sides were now ready for the fight to commence. On the other side, General Blanco had now under his command 4,000 men, well-armed and anxious for a fight. On the morning of June 1, 1913, General Blanco sent in, under a flag of truce, an escort to demand the surrender of the city, which was rejected. Upon the refusal of General Blanco's demand, he sent word to the authorities that at the hour of 10 a.m. on June 3rd, he would attack the city. When the memorable morning of June 3rd came, everybody was perched on rooftops throughout the city of Matamoros, and on the Brownsville side of the Rio Grande, people lined its banks as far as the International Bridge. All were eager to see the fight. The writer, William A. Neal, together with some customs officers, were on the roof of the U.S. Custom House, where we could witness clearly the fight from the commencement until the invading army got into the city. Precisely at 10 o'clock a.m., the bugles of the invading army blew to advance. It was a beautiful sight to see how the invaders advanced towards the breastworks where their foes were waiting for them. No sooner did they reach what is known as the cow pens when volley after volley spit out flames of destruction. You could see the invaders' lines waver as they were being moved down from the deadly fire of deer hunters whose aim and fire steadily thinned the ranks. In this charge, the long-awaited military officer was killed. Three charges were made, and three times they were repulsed. At last, a part of Blanco's army got into the city. With the enemy in front and rear, the defenders broke loose and came over to the American side of the Rio Grande and were interned by the U.S. Army. Major Ramos came over the International Bridge to Brownsville wounded and bleeding. With him came the 90 Mexican soldiers of the old army. They surely looked tired and ailing from their hands that they had burned from the heat of their own guns. At the very commencement, General Blanco had given Agustin Castro orders to fire into the galvanized tanks that supplied both the engine boilers and the soldiers with water. 
This was accomplished early in the action, naturally putting the boilers out of commission and rendering the electric appliances useless also. The cannon that was propped on logs fired the first shot all okay, but when it was fired the second time, you could see nothing but pieces of iron and lumber flying through the air. It appears that the second bag of five pounds of powder was dynamite that was inserted into the cannon as a load. When ignited, it blew up and killed three of the men who were handling the cannon. After a night of shooting and yelling, the following morning was quiet. There never was an authentic account of how many lost their lives. After the capture of Matamoros, General Blanco remained quite a long while recruiting his army and buying ammunition. No sooner was his army well recruited and supplied with the necessary ammunition that he gave orders to advance on to Monterrey Nuevo Leon. The writer, William A. Neal, witnessed one of the most brave and daring acts that he had ever witnessed in his lifetime. Before the orders were given to advance and attack Matamoros, General Lucio Blanco gave orders to Coronel Castro to be sure to open fire on the water tank that provided water not only to feed the boilers of the engine that ran both the electric wires that he knew well were set up in order to explode the hidden dynamite pits, but also furnished water to his enemy. No sooner was the battle in the heat of action when Coronel Castro, at the head of 100 men, commenced to obey orders. In a very short while, although losing a good many of his men, he put the tank out of commission. He had riddled it with holes, which left the tank entirely empty. Coronel Castro, with what few men he had left, at a double quick time, charged a small fort that was built on the left side of the International Iron Bridge that spans the Rio Grande and connects both Brownsville and Matamoros. While advancing, his men were shot down one by one until he could not have had more than 25 men left as he reached the foot of the bridge. Then, the defenders of the fort flew over to the American side of the river for protection. Upon reaching and taking possession of the bridge, Coronel Castro dropped to his knees, then fell face down. I immediately sent over Mr. Lewis Lollum, a U.S. inspector, to see what we could do for our friend. Mr. Lollum very soon returned and asked me if he could take the exhausted colonel a drink. Coronel Castro never forgot our kindness. Chapter 18 Along the Rio Grande Introduction the following section includes a number of topics that have no connection, except that they occurred, in part, in the same general geographic region. Each is obviously too brief to be treated as a separate chapter, but it is felt that they should be included in this story. No attempt will be made to give individual introductions for each account, but footnotes will be used where it is felt explanations would be helpful. The Sinking of the Morgan Line, the SS Nautilus On October 8, 1856, there occurred one of the most grievous disasters that had ever taken place in the city, caused by the sinking of the Morgan Line steamship Nautilus during a severe gale while on her way to Havana, Cuba, on October 7 and 8, 1856. On the morning of the 7th of October, the Nautilus sailed from the port of Brazos Santiago for Havana, Cuba, with a good list of passengers, among them being Mr. John McGovern, whose family was well known in the city. Besides passengers, she carried a full load of about 400 head of cattle. Before the steamer sailed, some of the old salts, amongst them being the late William Neal, called the attention of the captain of the ship to the manner of loading the cattle. Instead of having a light pine lumber separation amidship, they felt he ought to put in strong 6x8 red pine beams, well secured, and the cattle should be tied head-on to the beams. Instead of taking their good advice, the captain kept piling the cattle in, hoping that the bales of hay that were placed amidship would have the desired effect of keeping the cattle divided. The vessel left the morning at early morning, never to be heard of again. Days after days passed, 
but no answer was received to the inquiries of her whereabouts. The Nautilus was reported to the Morgan Line officials to have been lost during a severe hurricane off the coast of Cuba on the 8th. It has been supposed that during the gale in the lurch of the ship, the cattle must have all gone to one side of the ship, causing the ship to list to one side and finally capsize. All went to Davy Jones' locker. Our First Ice During the time that General Phil Sheridan was in command of the Army of Observation, which was sent by General Grant to the Texas frontier facing Mexico in the latter part of the month of May 1865, all kinds of heat sickness began to prevail among the soldiers. It became advisable for the authorities in Washington to procure ice in order to relieve the situation. To do so, several of the ice manufacturers were invited to send bids. After long delay and wrangling over the why and why fours, the question of ice began to look like a thing of the past. Then some of the ice handlers of the state of Minnesota conceived an idea of handling the pending ice question by constructing large barges propelled by sails and loading them with storage ice from the freshwater lakes. This eventually proved a success. The barges were loaded full with large blocks and towed down the Mississippi River as far as its mouth. Thence, they were towed by government steam vessels to the mouth of the Rio Grande, where they were turned over to the King Kennedy Steamboat Company. In turn, they were towed up the Rio Grande to Brownsville, Texas. During the first part of the month of March of the year 1867, the first shipment of ice reached us from the Northern Lakes. A firm headed by Mr. Sanborn, whose headquarters were in Minneapolis, were the Enterprisers. The writer, William A. Neal, at the time barely eight years of age, remembers well the scene when the light draft steamboat Antonio came to the landing. It towed two large ice barges that were immediately unloaded of the precious contents. The ice was stored in the ice house that had been erected next to the Moorhead building on Levy Street. Sold at ten cents a pound, it was disposed of like hotcakes. Ice at any price was the cry. It surely was high-priced ice, but it relieved the situation. The firm finally became a thing of the past they lost a considerable sum of money. The first ice made by machinery was manufactured in a plant on the Mexican side of the Rio Grande at Santa Cruz in 1866. Owned by the late John W. Hoyt, it was small, barely turning out 1,000 pounds. The Great Flood of 1882. It was during the September 1882 rise of the Rio Grande that the whole of Cameron County, and part of Hidalgo County, experienced the worst inundation that ever took place within the memory of some of our oldest inhabitants. The rain commenced to pour down from the first days of August, and did not stop until the middle of the month of November. All you could hear from the upriver towns was that the river was still rising. This naturally worked on people's nerves. To make things worse, on August 22nd, a severe hurricane paid us a visit. The storm at last blew itself out of existence, but as a climax, and to add to our miserable condition, yellow fever broke out, carrying away hundreds of our people to that undiscovered country from whose born none ever return. While every one of us was expecting his turn next, all one could hear from the upriver towns was that the river was still rising, showers upon showers of rain pouring incessantly on us got some of our good people into such a state that they were ready to meet death in order to end the mental suffering. During the time that the yellow fever was raging, you could hear through day and night the carpenter's hammer driving home the nails on a coffin that was being prepared to receive its victim. The systematic deadly tone of the hammer and the crises we were expecting were enough to set one crazy. Day after day, you could see the dead being carried in boats to the cemetery. The writer, William A. Neal, together with a couple of friends, 
were trying to convey a friend who had passed away to the cemetery when the hearse turned over, throwing the coffin into the rushing water and compelling us to swim after it. We surely had a hard job tussling against the current in order to land the remains in its final resting place. To give the reader an idea of the expanse of our flood, the water reached within a block of our city market and extended nearly to the South Ranch, 46 miles from Brownsville. The Rio Grande Railroad tracks were six inches underwater. Imagine what volume of water was being carried to the Gulf of Mexico. Naturally, the depth of the torrent of water was not of an equal standing, but all the stream that flowed over both Palo Alto and Jackass Prairies could be safely stated to average four feet. At the Arroyo Colorado Ferry, at Taylor's Crossing, in the schoolhouse that stood on the high embankment near Morgan Barclay's house, I saw the main room covered under two and one half feet of water. A good deal of livestock was lost during the storm by drowning, but no human lives were reported lost. Those that the yellow fever carried away were the only losses. The general rain reported throughout the flooded district was 32 inches. Naturally, this accumulated volume of water, meaning that coming from the state of Colorado, is what caused the terrible losses sustained in both Hidalgo and Cameron counties. Sea Island Cotton. It was during the latter part of the month of February 1886 that for experimental purposes, Sea Island Cotton was planted in the Rio Grande Valley. The firm of Bloomberg and Raphael of Brownsville made the test by planting 20 acres on their La Leona Ranch. The cotton plants grew splendidly, but the bulbs never opened of their own accord. They had to be forced open by the pick invented from bamboo cane by the pickers. When the ginning time arrived, the firm purchased a second-hand gin from some planters in Georgia. After considerable difficulty, the cotton was ginned, baled, and sent to Manchester, England, where it was sold, bringing 11 pence per pound, about 22 cents. But it was not rated first class because of the poor ginning. The following year, the same firm, together with some other farmers, planted some 500 acres. Among those who planted Sea Island cotton was a colored man by the name of John Adams, who claimed to know something about cotton. For the second experiment, the firm of Bloomberg and Raphael imported a Sea Island cotton gin from Manchester, England, but the development of the cotton turned out much like the first crop. The bulbs had to be ripped open in order to get the cotton. This really was a hard job since the cotton had to be poisoned on account of the weevil, and the least scratch on the hand would be infected by the poison. This caused many of the pickers to be disabled with a sore hand for weeks at a time. The crop of Sea Island cotton, raised on several upriver farms, brought a price of 14 pence in Manchester. Everybody interested in the shipment felt jolly and talked about the amount of acreage that they were going to plant. Pike's peak or burst seemed to be their aim. In the third venture, most of the farmers increased their acreages to about three times the quantity they had planted in the previous year and waited for the results. Nearly all of the large planters in this experimental year planted on their river bottom lands. The cotton came up, but did not stop growing. It kept on growing until some of the plants had reached 15 feet and were still growing. Finally, it grew so high that it required a good long ladder to reach the top of the plant. But after you got there, there was not a cotton ball in sight. This was the last effort to make money in the Rio Grande Valley. The cotton gin was sold to Colonel J.G. Tucker, who had a few acres of Sea Island cotton. In experimenting, he came near to being blown up because some unknown person must have slipped a few match heads into the cotton that was to be ginned. In the gin, the matches ignited and came near to burning not only the workmen, but the house also. Colonel Julius G. Tucker came down Elizabeth Street 
with his beard full of burned cotton, proclaiming to everybody that stopped him, I quit Sea Island Cotton Farming. This is all I have of my entire crop. That's funny. The Castor Bean Craze. During the early part of the year 1868, the city of Brownsville, Texas became ignited over an idea of everybody's becoming rich without a struggle. After the disbanding of the Army of Observation, sent to the Rio Grande under the command of Major General P. H. Sheridan, a good many of the camp followers that followed the army remained in Brownsville with the sincere hope of making a fortune easily. Among the many that cast their lot was a man by the name of Mr. Reynolds, who was a New Yorker by birth, reportedly having money. He was not to be classed as wealthy, but as a man of considerable means. Mr. Reynolds was a good mixer, and could hold his own when brought into general conversation, especially on agricultural lines. It happened that in reading his home newspaper, he came across a column which was devoted to the castor bean industry that had developed in some of the western territories, netting the promoters good returns. The news began to work in Mr. Reynolds' brain until he became fully convinced that there was a fortune in sight from castor beans in southern Texas. He immediately began to agitate the question, why shouldn't we do the same? The first thing that Mr. Reynolds did was to establish a bank, which he opened for business on the corner of Elizabeth and 12th Streets, the house now owned by the Simon Celaya heirs. There, he would stand at the front door with a lead pencil and pen holder perched on his ears, bowing to each individual passing by. His bank soon commenced to attract customers. The next thing he did was to put a claim of discovery on the salt lake that is situated in Hidalgo County, known as La Sal del Rey, the King Salt. This brought on a lawsuit with the state of Texas, in which Mr. Reynolds came out second best. Finally, he appealed his case to the Supreme Court of the United States. Although not positive, I am under the strong impression that the U.S. Supreme Court affirmed the decision of the Texas Supreme Court, which went against Reynolds. Towards the latter part of the year 1868, Mr. Reynolds' castor bean culture began to boil up in earnest. For hours at a time, he would talk to the customers of his bank about the great profits that could be derived from the castor bean. Millions of dollars were in sight in the castor bean enterprise. Finally, at the request of some of his new-made friends, he called a meeting to be held at the Market Hall in order to discuss the great possibilities of the castor bean industry. The meeting was called to be held on December 11, 1869. Mr. Reynolds distributed a number of handbills among the farmers and landowners requesting their presence. The meeting was well attended. A good many took issue with Mr. Reynolds, but he answered their questions with ease and grace. When the meeting ended, all without an exception decided to go into the castor bean culture. All saw big money. All dreamed of the millions that waited to be picked by the growers. And in the coming year, about the month of March 1869, all planted castor beans. Even at private dwellings, beans were planted. Washington Square in our city was all used in planting the beans. It was soon seen how prolifically the castor bean tree grew. The numerous clusters that were on each twig caused some of the branches to break with the weight. As the months rolled by, people wondered why the beans did not ripen. The year passed, and the next one came also with no beans ripened. Instead, the beans turned black and dropped to earth empty and free of any substance that indicated the material from which castor oil could be extracted. It was simply a dried-up fungus. The results of the first experience did not satisfy most of the farmers, so they concluded to send for an expert in the castor oil business to find out the real reason why the plant did not give beans that ripened. A planter by the name of Charles Woodburn came from Nebraska, arriving for a meeting at City Hall, or the Market Hall. 
There, he spoke to the crowd, and in brief terms gave them a full routine of the plant growth. Towards the last of his speech, he asked one of those present what the general temperature was during the four seasons of the year. He was informed that here it seldom freezes or even snows. This, he said, was the real cause of the failure of the beans to ripen. The plant requires a gradual winter in order to obtain results. The castor bean business soon became a thing of the past. Only a few trees remain in this section to remind us that they are still growing and are waiting for that gradual winter to come in order to fill their mission on Earth. In the midst of the experimental confusion, one fine Monday morning, the doors of the bank failed to open. But across the main entrance door was a placard reading, Bank closed. Will open next week. But what became of Mr. Reynolds? The depositors went to the courthouse and requested the county judge to have the vault of the bank opened. When this was done... The depositors found only old castor oil beans. Narrator's note. Oh my goodness, y'all. This was such a fun experience recording Century of Conflict. It isn't even five minutes ago that I just read out the last words of chapter 18. Wow. Chapter 18 was probably the most entertaining of the chapters. Um, just for the fact that there was the, the guy scamming everyone on with castor oil. It reminded me about the, the modern cryptocurrency hype. It's the same mentality. Hey, this is your get-rich-quick scheme, y'all. Invest in my bank. <laughs> but in this case, however, the dude left without a trace. They opened the vault. And they just found these old castor beans. <laughs> Dude ran away with the money. <laughs> wow, that's great. But seriously, it was so much fun. It was a labor of love reading out loud all 18 chapters of Century of Conflict. Um, I really tried my best to deliver it in the way that both William Neal and William Alfred Neal would have liked this to be delivered. If you were to ask them, if you were to go in a, in a time machine back in 1800s, early 1900s Brownsville, meet the Neals and say, hey, tell me the story of this, tell me the story of that. I read it in, in an attempt to give the same intonation that they would have given. <laughs> Um, I see the, the pictures of William Neal, William Alfred Neal, and I try to like put myself in that kind of headspace. <laughs> it really like harkened back to my days of acting when I was a, a teenager uh, doing high school, doing the musicals for uh, my high school and whatnot. It really makes me, it, it reminds me why I love Brownsville. This city of ours is built upon decades of wonderful stories, action, adventure, romance, drama. Wow. Every building downtown, every corner downtown has a story. Something happened there involving someone of note. And these stories should not be forgotten. That is why I decided to do this. Century of Conflict is a rare book to come across. I want to put it on YouTube, free of charge, for anyone to listen. Anyone interested in Brownsville history, South Texas history, RGV history. Yeah, it is one hell of a resource. Hopefully you found some value in it, and you found it as worthwhile listening to it as I did recording it. Thank you so much for having listened this far. You are amazing, whoever you are. Thank you for being appreciative of local history or wanting to appreciate local history. Whether or not you're from Brownsville or elsewhere in the valley or elsewhere in the world and are, you're interested in our little corner of the world, wherever you are, whoever you are, you're awesome. Take care, continue to be curious, and kick ass.